Ready? Good morning. We're back in business here, our second day. I'm Doreen Diadamo, Vice Chair of the State Water Board. Today is Wednesday, April 20th at 9.33, and I'd like to call this meeting to order. I'll start by introducing our board members and staff. To my right is board member Sean McGuire. To my left is board member Nicole Morgan. And uh, we have our executive director, Eileen Sobeck, and chief counsel, Michael Lawfer. And our clerk, Janine Townsend, and assisting her today is Courtney Tyler and Margie Argel. Now I'll go through our emergency evacuation procedures. Please look around and identify the two exits closest to you. In the event of a fire alarm, we are required to gather up our valuables and evacuate this room immediately. We are to evacuate to Cesar Chavez Park, which is across the street. Please obey all traffic signals and be careful when crossing the street. I would also like to let you know that this meeting is being webcast and recorded, so when it is your turn to speak, please say your name clearly into your phone or on your computer if you are remoting in or the microphone at the podium in the meeting room. We also have interpreting services, so they need to hear you speak slowly and clearly so they are able to translate. We will be conducting today's board meeting with both a physical meeting location and an option for the public to participate from a remote location. For people who only want to listen or watch the meeting, the board's customary webcast is available. We are receiving presentations and public comment through a Zoom meeting platform, as well as in the physical meeting location. If you intend to present or comment or think you may be interested in commenting, you should already be in the Zoom meeting room using the meeting ID provided on the board's website and the password you received from the clerk. Also, at the front of the meeting room by the clerk, there is a computer to sign in to make public comment. If you've not already received a password, you may email the clerk now at commentletters at waterboards.ca.gov and she will email you a link to sign up on the virtual speaker card list. Now we'll move on to our board uh, workshops, two workshops today, uh, starting with the Division of Financial Assistance, um, item 12. Uh, this, we are holding this workshop to receive input on our staff's proposal to utilize a $350 million allocation from the Budget Act of 2021 for the groundwater cleanup and recycled water cleanup and water recycling projects. And I'll just note that um, item three, which is the workshop, public workshop on the status of phase one for the Salton Sea Management Program, that will not begin before 2 p.m. All right, so with that, we will, oh, meeting minutes. Yes, I forgot the meeting minutes, just one moment. Uh, we were not able to take them up yesterday, so we will move to item, Second here. Item three, no, item, item one, yeah, item one, uh, the minutes. Do we have a motion? And uh, I'll, I'll reminder, reminder that this is for the adoption of uh, two rounds of minutes, March, 4, March 15th, 16th, 2022, and April 5th, 2022. Okay, if we can move the item separately um, and have an appropriate board member abstain, and it's fine for there to be a two uh, zero one vote to carry the item. Okay, not not prejudging how you might vote on the minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Chief <laughs> Counsel Hoffer. Uh, so I will move to adopt the uh, March 15th, 16th board meeting minutes. All second. And I'll just, we don't need a roll call vote, right? All in favor? Oh, because we have an abstention. We should have a roll call vote, okay. especially since we're providing the, the Zoom platform for people not in the room. Oh, okay. All right. Ms. Townsend. Board Member McGuire. Aye. Board Member Morgan. Aye. Vice Chair Diadama. Aye. Thank you. Okay. The motion carries. The March 15th, 16th board meetings are approved. Okay, now I will move to adopt the April 5th board meeting minutes. I'll second. Ms. Townsend, could you please call the roll? 
Board Member McGuire. Aye. Board Member Morgan. Aye. Vice Chair Diadama. Aye. Thank you. I can uh, also, I, sorry, I'm here late, but I can also vote on that. Aye. I on that for me too. Sorry, I'm late. Yeah, April 5th. Okay. All right, motion carries. Thank you. All right, thank you for your patience. Now we'll move back to item 12, the workshop on the uh, budget allocation for groundwater cleanup and water recycling projects. Good morning. Oh, okay, there's an on button. I got it now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Vice Chair Diandamo and members of the board, and welcome to all of our audience members, both here physically and joining us in cyberspace. I'm Alex Huang. I'm the Senior Engineering Geologist over the Groundwater Grants Program here in the Division of Financial Assistance. To my left, you have, um, you have Anthony Austin and Jean Fung from the Office of Chief Counsel. To my right, your left, we also have Julie Osborne and Craig Sanchez. Julie is from the Office of Chief Counsel and Craig is also from the Division of Financial Assistance. Um, and as a last minute change, we also have Kim Din and Mike Downey from the Division of Financial Assistance who will be joining us via Zoom using the magic of the internet. Craig and I will be tag teaming the presentation today. We'll also be, we'll be talking about the proposed plan to utilize the budget at Budget Act of 2021 allocation for groundwater cleanup and water recycling projects. Next slide, please. I'll try to avoid the cardinal sin of spending 10 minutes talking about what I'm going to talk about. We'll start by going over the relevant definitions and abbreviations we will be using throughout this workshop and dive straight into the groundwater cleanup and water recycling allocation. Craig and I will talk about the decision-making process that led to the proposed plan in its current form. Then I'll go into the actual plan and we'll wrap up with an overview of the public review process and move on to the Q&A section. Next slide, please. Um, like many government agencies, we couldn't resist the siren song of abbreviating all of our terminology, but never fear because this slide will untangle some of the letters in our alphabet soup. Audience members familiar with the State Water Board's work will recognize the term disadvantaged community, DAC, which are communities where the median household income is less than 80% of the statewide median household income. We also have severely disadvantaged communities where the median household income is less than 60% of the statewide median household income. If you see the term FY, it means fiscal year, as in state fiscal year, which runs from July 1st through June 30th of every calendar year. And finally, we have the three funding programs that are the subject of this workshop today. There's the Groundwater Grant Program, GWGP, the Site Cleanup Subaccount Program, SCAP, and the Water Recycling Funding Program, WRFP. The SCAP holds the distinction for having the only abbreviation that has enough vowels to be pronounceable. Next slide. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about the groundwater cleanup and water recycling allocation from the Budget Act of 2021. If you read the public notice, you'll notice that it said that it was $350 million, but it gets a little, more, a little bit more complicated than that, as you can see from the preponderance of footnotes on the slide. For starters, once you account for 5% in administrative costs, that leaves $330 million for grants. If anyone in the audience attended a past stakeholder meeting, you may remember the underlying portion being slightly different. I think it was uh, 332.5 million or thereabouts. That was a math mistake on our part. Furthermore, the 350 million is split over three fiscal years. Senate Bill 170 provided the first 150 million in fiscal year 21-22, the current fiscal year. An additional 100 million was budgeted is budgeted for fiscal years 22-23, and an additional 100 million is budgeted for fiscal years 23-24. These came later in a budget addendum, uh, addendum sorry, separately from SB 170. Because the 150 million from fiscal year 21-22 is coming separately 
from the other 100 million in the next two fiscal years, they have different encumbrance and disbursement dates. The, uh, the 150 million coming in fiscal years 21, 22 must be encumbered by June 30th, 2024 and must be dispersed, sent out the door by June 30th, 2026. But the following, two, uh, the following $100 million from each of the two fiscal years do not have encumbrance or disbursement dates yet. And if this isn't confusing enough, there's a kicker. The amount in the first column, fiscal years 21, 22, is actually $200 million. But 50 million is, is earmarked for the Pure Water San Diego project. And because we have a no say in where that money goes, we decided to just keep it simple and say $150 million. And that's the subject of the workshop today. Next slide, please. I mentioned a few stakeholder meetings earlier. Back in February, 2022, we held three virtual meetings with public stakeholders and representatives from state and federal regulatory agencies to essentially ask them, how should we spend this $350 million? And we considered their input in formulating the current plan. I'll hand it off to Craig now. Next slide, please. Well, Alex, good morning, everyone. My name is Craig Sanchez, and I'll be presenting on the site cleanup subacom program today, otherwise known as SCAP. Next slide, please. SCAP is promulgated by the Health and Safety Code to provide funds to fund projects approved by the State Water Board. Unlike other programs, SCAP has a continuous application progress process with no application deadlines. Eligible projects include projects to investigate the source of contamination to groundwater and surface water and projects to remediate groundwater or surface water contamination to reduce the risk to human health and the environment. Generally, there are two categories of groundwater remediation projects that SCAP is funding. Projects that clean up groundwater near drinking water, supply wells in small communities, and projects that clean up groundwater and associated vapor intrusion issues often found in SCAP projects within environmental justice communities. Next slide, please. SCAP project requirements include the site must be subject to a regulatory directive order or notification unless infeasible to issue such order. The, and the responsible party must lack sufficient financial resources to perform required work. In addition, public agencies who are not RPs may also apply for funding. SCAP funding factors include the degree to which human health and the environment are threatened, whether the site is located in a smaller financially disadvantaged community, the cost and potential environmental benefit of cleanup, and whether there are other potential sources of funding, and finally, any other information the board identifies as necessary for consideration. These factors provide the framework for the regional board prioritization of SCAP projects. Next slide, please. SCAP existing funding is 34 million in local assistance authority from UST, UST cleanup fees with a projected funding need of 300 groundwater cleanup projects totaling an estimated of $600 million. This equals a projected funding deficit of up to $400 million in projects awaiting funding. Recently, SCAP had a reorganization of the program, including the addition of a new technical unit to increase our ability to use more funding should it be made available. Next slide, please. As you are aware, we have more projects to fund. We have 350 projects awaiting funding. There's approximately 8,500 dry cleaners and many more industrial sites throughout the entire state. Over 1,500 of public water supply wells with MCL exceedances. PFAS, we all know, is, is a big issue. And of course, evolving regulatory uh, regulations for chlorinated solvent flumes. SCAP has a lot more work to do. Thank you for considering my presentation. Thank you, Craig. Moving on to the other funding, 
of other funding programs, part of this workshop. The groundwater grant program aims to do a lot of the same things that the SCAP does, but with a, with a larger, more regional focus. Um, the groundwater grant program aims to clean up and prevent the contamination of groundwater that serves or has served as a source of drinking water. Um, as an example of some of the projects that the groundwater grant program might fund, it might target contaminant plumes that, that stretch across municipal boundaries or the creation of a freshwater curtain to block the advance of seawater intrusion. This program can also provide co-funding for some drinking water treatment projects and some septic sewer projects, but only if the projects benefit severely disadvantaged communities. Next slide, please. And finally, we have the water recycling funding program, which promotes the beneficial use of treated municipal wastewater to augment freshwater supplies in California. Over the next three fiscal years, the anticipated demand for water recycling project is is estimated to be a staggering $1.8 billion. To put this number into perspective, $1.8 billion is more than twice the cost of building the Golden Gate Bridge in 1933 if you adjusted the original cost for inflation. That means over the next three fiscal years, there are enough water recycling projects to build two, gold, two Golden Gate Bridges worth of water recycling facilities and then some. Note that this estimate covers the same three fiscal years as the $350 million allocated, allocated from the Budget Act of 2021. Next slide, please. On that note, it's time to segue into the actual plan to utilize the allocation, which is meant for groundwater cleanup and water recycling projects. Here at the State Water Board, we have two groundwater cleanup programs, the Groundwater Grant Program and the SCAP, which are to the left of the dashed line. And we have a single water recycling funding program, which is to the right of the dash line. Next slide, please. First, we propose that any money going to any of these programs be, will be administered using the existing guidelines and requirements from each respective program. Next slide, please. Second, we propose to split the $330 million evenly between the SCAP and the water recycling funding program for reasons that Craig covered earlier during his portion of the presentation with, uh, with significant demand coming for groundwater cleanup. As you will recall from earlier, $330 million is the amount left over after 5% in administrative costs and 165 million is half of $330 million. Next slide, please. Finally, we propose that the Division of Financial Assistance Deputy Director be granted the authority to divert some allocation funds from the SCAP program to the Groundwater Grant Program for good cause. This would be limited to augmenting Groundwater Grant Program projects that serve disadvantaged communities and severely disadvantaged communities. And to be clear, this wouldn't be to fund new projects, but to fund cost increases that have affected existing groundwater grant program um, projects and grant recipients. Next slide, please. That's it for the plan, which is currently out for public review. We posted the notice earlier on April 8th, which kicked off the public comment period. Instructions on how to submit written comments are included in the public notice. The public comment period closes at 12 noon on May 9th, and afterwards we will begin responding to public comments and revising the proposed plan in response to public comments if necessary. This, pro this process will continue for about two weeks or so, then culminate in the board meeting on May 24th. During that board meeting, we will recommend adoption of the proposed plan to utilize the Budget Act of 2021 allocation. Next slide, please. For the, for the audience members in the room and in cyberspace, you can contact Kim Din for general inquiries or one of the people listed here for program specific questions. I'm Alex Wong with the Groundwater Grant Program. Craig Sanchez li leads the SCAP and Sunny leads the Water Recycling Funding Program. Next slide, please. And with that, we will open it up for questions and comments. Thank you for that presentation. Much appreciated. Um, any questions? Board Member Firestone. Um, yeah, thank you. I have just, um, well, one main clarifying question, which is, uh, 
in the proposal, we're suggesting that the amount allocated from the SCAP program be able to be utilized for cost increases for the groundwater grant program. Are there, is there a reason why we're looking to the SCAP program rather than other sources of funding for any cost increases for the groundwater grant program? Is it quicker, easier, or is there some reason why we're, we're not using other funding sources to address any augmentation for the groundwater grant program? You know, there's proposition funding and stuff like that. Uh, Janine, could you bring up slide 16, please? Um, I should probably clarify that um, in my spiel, I think I glossed over the part where we wouldn't actually be diverting funds from from SCAP over to the groundwater grant program, but from the 165 million. So I guess right. this graphic is more. Yeah, uh, but even uh, that, I'm just wondering if there's not other existing sources so that we can retain as much of the 165 million for SCAP, because I know it's hard to get SCAP money and there might be other sources of funding for um, the groundwater grant program, but Mr. Carcass. <laughs> Hi, thanks, Board Member Firestone. Uh, Joe Karkowski, Deputy Director, Division of Financial Assistance. Uh, so it really depends on what the project is, whether we would have uh, funding uh, available uh, for kind of a standard cleanup project, a remediation project. We may not have very many choices if it's to supplement, say, what is essentially treatment prior to you know, delivery into a drinking water system, yeah, we have a lot of different um, funding sources that, that we could use. So certainly that's something we'll, we'll look at. You know, as uh, Craig mentioned, uh, there's a lot of need in the SCAP program. So we'll preferentially, you know, try to support that program, depending on, of course, where, where the board um, and ends up. Uh, the other uh, option is, um, you know, Proposition 68 had some groundwater funding. Uh, the board had decided to use that primarily for O&M support. Uh, but it's, uh, and, you know, anyone from OCC can correct me if I'm wrong, but my recollection is there, it could be used for um, capital projects as, as well. And we, ha we will have a pending item on, on that considering uh, revision of those those guidelines but it's still those guidelines we're still proposing and looking at um, continuing using those funds for o m supportive treatment <clears throat> groundwater treatment did right. that uh, yeah cover no, that's it for you? really helpful so um and yeah I can't remember where we are there's so many great funding sources coming through and guidelines and um I can't remember where we are in the approval process for each of them. So it sounds like the, um, I guess, well, I, what I would say, because we're we're in the process here and haven't adopted anything, this is kind of early, is just I would, given how much demand um, and unique the SCAP program is, it's hard to get funding for those prop programs to the extent that there are other funding sources like Pro Proposition 68 or others where we can quickly address augmentations and costs for projects in the groundwater grant program. I don't want to, you know, I, I, I want to make sure we're not delaying things by restricting the funding source, but I would just, you know, express a, a strong preference to use to to not have to dip into this 165 million um, and allow as much of it as feasible to go to SCAP while still ensuring that the groundwater grant programs can um, address any cost increases for DACs and SDACs. Yeah, I, I, I'd say one of the things we can um, do as part of the, um, when we bring this back to the board for adoption is do a deeper dive on those uh, pending projects that are DAC or SDAC and, and be able to report back to you and the other board members, uh, you know, where, where those construction projects are in terms of, are they getting close to bid and, you know, which, which ones, uh, where might we have some flexibility to use other funding sources and where might this funding source be the only, um, option. 
Great. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then just two comments, really. Um, one is, you know, I, I know the Division of Financial Assistance has been um, reporting out around um, racial equity and just a review of where funds are going in terms of um, racial justice issues. And my sense is that the SCAP program is one that really addresses um, uh, racial equity issues in particular. And so I, I um, would love us to just be able to see or understand that context um, as we move to ad adoption. And I guess just in general is just understanding how um, these funding sources play out in terms of um, addressing racial equity issues as we're looking at these allocations. Um, I don't like I said, I, I, my sense is SCAP is a really important program for that. So I'm glad we're putting money there and, and prioritizing that. Um, and then the last comment I had is really something that um, Board Member McGuire, I was in a conversation with you that made me think of this um, or want to understand this more, which is, um, you know, as we're funding projects for water recycling to the extent that they are um, requiring changes in flows to for in-stream flows for rivers. Um, it would be, it does seem really important for us to make sure that we're looking, you know, looking to figure out how we can, I don't know that we are able to establish in-stream flows for those, but really just understand how kind of holistically and comprehensively how when we've got um, water recycling projects, especially when we've got multiple ones coming through, how that will impact um, in stream flows. And obviously water recycling projects are major priorities. I think we have brought, you know, important goals there. Um, so not to suggest that, that we would want to um, restrict water recycling, but I do think it's important to make sure, especially as we're funding projects, how understanding how that those affect and stream flows for those rivers where we're, we're moving flow away through the recycling projects. And I don't know, board member McGuire, this was really something you had um, made me think about. So I don't know if you have more to add. Oh yeah. Thank, uh, that's a good comment. I'll just add that. I mean, there is, there is some statutory requirements for that through our wastewater change petition, uh, water code section 1211. You're probably familiar with it. I, so I think the importance is to make sure that those processes are followed, right? And I think something that you do at DFA is look to see that other permit and other, you know, water rights related processes are followed and approved prior to the project moving forward and executing the funding agreement. So I think that's, you know, yeah, an important step that needs to happen. Yeah, and I'll just add because um, the, I know this was brought up a few meetings ago, but I know when you've got the LA River, places like that, where you've got multiple recycling projects planned for a single river, and individual plants are um, or projects are looking at their individual diversions. Um, that it's, you know, it's it would be helpful, and I don't think that's necessarily in Division of Financial Assistance, but um, it seems important for us at the board to try to make sure that there's a look at that um, kind of pipeline of. Um, projects that we're funding for water recycling kind of holistically on the river so that we can make sure we're um, not piecemealing it and ending up where there isn't going to be flows, for example, for a project that we've, we're also um, having the pipeline for investment. So I know that's a much more complicated issue, just bringing it up um, now since we're talking about this and kind of um, trying to raise the connection really. Those are those are really good points. And I would just ask when, that when this comes before us, if you just um, include that in the presentation, um, uh, maybe a report from, uh, or getting information from the Division of Water Rights to just include that in the presentation. It's important for us, to, I think, to be reminded and for the public to be reminded of um, in-stream flows and potential impacts not just on um, in-stream flows, but um, other water users, which there's a protest process that they can go through. Any other questions or comments? Board Member McGuire. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. And you know what an exciting time uh, to have this many different pots of funding, um, whether it's state or federal. And it's, you know, I say this often, it's a good problem to have. 
but it's a challenging problem. I mean, we're we're in a drought here. It's it is raining a bit this week, but you know, aside from that, it, it's a it's a pretty dire challenge that we're all facing when we look, you know, at the face of climate change and and think about all those challenges that are coming before us. And so whenever, you know, I see these opportunities, uh, it just makes, you know, I want to take a step back and just ask the big question, are we making smart investments and decisions with the funding that we have? And I, I do have confidence that if you look at each program, if you look at SCAP, if you look at the water recycling program, they all can stand on their own and have, you know, good reasoned uh, criteria in there for funding projects. But I just want to ask the question here. Um, you know, because I do see, you know, you you highlighted that there's, you know, $1.8 billion that you know of right now in terms of backlog for water recycling. I think that number is actually quite uh, maybe an order of magnitude or more higher than that in reality. And so uh, maybe over the next 10 years or so. And so I just, you know, wondering, you know, how, you know, because I'm I'm not as into the details in terms of the water recycling funding program, but with this $165 million, how will you be making those decisions uh, in terms of funding those projects, you know, water recycling projects and building water resilience and addressing the critical drought needs that we have right now? Hi, Joe Karkowski again. Uh, yeah, so you, uh, you and board member Firestone are asking much bigger picture questions that go beyond the you know, 160 some odd uh, million dollars that we're we're talking about. Um, so, and and there are a couple things to keep in mind. We generally fund water recycling projects with the clean water SRF, uh, sometimes with the drinking water SRF as as well. And there have been funds associated with uh, propositions that provide some amount of grant funding. But oftentimes it's mostly loans. So I think you're right, Board Member McGuire. The need is much larger. I mean, just this year we're funding hundreds of millions of dollars in uh, loans for water recycling uh, projects. So I do think it's a it's kind of a bigger picture question that goes well beyond this little pot. Of, this not I said little, <laughs> relatively small compared to the need. Um, but and but we will be bringing uh, this back through the um, the IUP process that we're going to go through in in the summer. And you know, we have that federal funding that that's coming our way, uh, and certainly some of that can be used to support water recycling projects. I think the decision uh, right now we we would just be funding consistent with the with the IUP, right? That's part of what staff said. We're not creating new guidelines. So I would say that's the board's opportunity to um, review uh, how those guidelines are written and decide whether, uh, especially for water recycling, there should be some changes made in terms of like per project grant amounts and and that sort of thing. Yeah, that really helps. Thank you. And I think, yeah, I, I really just did want to tee up that conversation as we're walking through all these different programs and, and we're talking about the needs, you know, for small, you know, disadvantaged communities and, you know, cost increases. We had an item yesterday where we're concerned about, you know, cost pressures all across the board. So there, there could be a lot of this going on. And so I want, I just want to make sure that we're, when we put all these pots together, that we're making the best, you know, inf most informed investments on our water resilience and our water infrastructure that we can right now. So thank you for uh, entertaining me here. I, I really appreciate this discussion because um, for me, and I'll just pile on, um, uh, I, I, I look at this and uh, look at the map of California, and it just strikes me that there are certain communities that are, or certain regions of the state uh, where uh, things things have just really taken off um, with water recycling in particular. And so um, there's there's an interest and um, sort of a culture uh, that's attempting to take advantage of these opportunities. And we absolutely should be uh, doling out dollars where it meets the criteria. But it is an opportunity, I think, um, for the IUP discussion later on to be looking at the big picture, not just on climate change, drought, uh, racial equity, but social, social justice as well, and uh, the map of the whole state of California and seeing you know, where the dollars are going and getting some sense of uh, equity, uh, maybe even looking at, which I suspect uh, already is, 
um, part of the analysis, but looking at uh, Cal Enviro screen and sort of overlaying the map as far as where the funds go and and getting a sense that, you know, are, are we um, hitting that mark, uh, generally speaking, with respect to equity? Um, board member Morgan, did you have any other questions? Just wanted to double check. Okay, so I had um, a couple of questions going to the SCAP. Um, in particular, um, dr the dry cleaning issue. We've spent a lot of time on uh, PFOS, um, and it, it, this is an area where I, I, I'd like an opportunity to get an update. I don't know that today's the appropriate time, but uh, getting a, a better sense of, um, I think there was um, 8,500 dry cleaners uh, that you listed there. Um, it's pretty much all over the state, and I know that um, uh, PERC is being uh, phased out. Maybe just getting at the appropriate time an update um, on that, um, you know, the, the legacy contamination and how long since it's been phased out, um, it, it would just be good to get an update. And then it also strikes me that um, when I looked at that, um, just wondering about uh, technical assistance. So uh, what funding is available in SCAP, whether it's uh, this pot of funding or otherwise on technical assistance for communities that uh, may have a need for cleanup, but um, for whatever reason, just haven't really focused on it and have the tools to focus on it. So maybe I can jump in for a moment. Um, well, good morning, Mr. Bishop. Good morning. <laughs> yes. I was trying to jump in earlier, but I'm having connection issues. Um, so unlike um, our, our um, drinking water, our um, wastewater grants programs where we are um, out soliciting folks to, um, to, uh, to uh, communities, System. These are really in properties that are that are open. They don't have a responsible party to to uh, address them, and so it's a little bit different. Um, it's more about outreach than technical assistance. The regional boards are actually the ones that are running the contracts, not looking for a community. Property cleaned up. We're looking for the regional board to come in and say, "We have this site. It's contaminated. And there's no responsible party to address it." So it's a little bit different. We want to make sure we have the outreach to the communities so that they know um, about the program. But it's not. We're not really looking for them to apply for it. They could, but it's primarily run out. Of Okay, I think we got maybe <laughs> the general gist. Thank you for jumping in. Um, I, I guess I would just ask when this comes before us um, for adoption, maybe include some information on uh, outreach and the role of regional boards. Okay, uh, unless there are any further questions, we will move on to uh, public comment. And first we have um, Ivy Britton from the Association of California Water Agencies. <laughs> Good morning, Vice Chair Diadama, State Water Board members, Ivy Britton with the Association of California Water Agencies. Just wanted to express our support for staff's proposed plan to utilize those allocated 2021 state budget funds, um, specifically the proposal to direct 50% of those funds to the water recycling funding program. Um, and as I think others may mention, we also always encourage additional appropriation um, in next year's budget for the WRFP. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Britton. Next is Leslie Dobalian with San Diego County Water Authority. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm Leslie Dobalian, Principal Water Resources Specialist with the San Diego County Water Authority. Uh, the Water Authority is a wholesale water supply agency in San Diego. One moment. Um, could you could you speak up? Um, get closer to your mic or speak up? Um, absolutely. Maybe start over. We're having a hard time hearing you. How is that? You know, I have a new headset and it's, um, so I had my fingers crossed, but is that better? 
Ms. Doblin, can you try one thing? Um, in the lower left corner of your Zoom screen, uh, where there's the microphone, there's a little carrot up arrow right next to it. I just want to make sure you've selected the right microphone. There, so between the, the camera and the microphone, there's a little up arrow. And if you click on that up arrow. How's that? That's better. Okay, better. Thank, thank you, you so much. Gosh, um, technology. <laughs> it's a new headset is what I was saying. But anyway, good morning again. I'm Leslie DeBalian, Principal Water Resources Specialist with the San Diego County Water Authority. Authority. Um, we are a wholesale water supply agency in San Diego County with 24 retail member agencies serving 3.3 million residents. And I'm also here to speak in support of staff's proposal to utilize 330 million um, through an equal split between groundwater cleanup and water recycling. Uh, as you know, our region has made significant investments in developing drought resilient local water supplies. And the Water Authority has supported the development of our member agency recycling projects for decades. Uh, from, for some perspective, in 2020, approximately 6% of the San Diego region's water supplies came from water recycling, but by 2045, we're projecting this will increase to approximately 160,000 acre feet, totaling 25% of the region's total supply. And of course, these investments require careful planning and can be costly. Um, so, uh, as and as we heard today, the water board's projecting 1.8 billion water recycling projects in California over the next three years. So we're also therefore supportive of the state board requesting a larger appropriation in the upcoming budget budget for uh, water recycling investments. And I'd just like to conclude by expressing our appreciation for the work of the board and your staff in supporting all of these critical water issues. Thank you. Thank you for your input. Next is Danielle Coates with Eastern Municipal Water District. Uh, good morning, Vice Chair Diadamo and distinguished members of the board. I'm Danielle Coates with Eastern Municipal Water District. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comments today. Uh, Eastern appreciates the State Board's continued efforts to direct funding to address groundwater contamination and recycled water projects. External funding has been crucial for EMWD in addressing our groundwater contamination in our region and further provide a long-term cost-effective cleanup solution for our ratepayers, uh, of which over a third are uh, disadvantaged or severely disadvantaged. I would like to specifically touch on our Paris North program, which we have been advancing uh, to support cleanup of contaminated groundwater from non-point sources and further prevent the spread of contamination in our Paris North Basin. Eastern received an original grant in 2019. However, due to the volatility of construction supply costs and supply chain issues, uh, we've experienced some construction cost increases. So in the context of today's conversation, Eastern acknowledges and appreciates the comments that were shared by board member Firestone on addressing those projects that experience cost increases. And we would like to further urge the continued consideration of support for existing projects with funding in addition to the new projects as additional funding for some of these existing projects will strengthen local water supply reliability and further address groundwater contamination challenges. And we'd like to further thank you and uh, the state board staff for your continued efforts. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And last, we have Charles LaSalle with Water Reuse. Ah, live. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you to the board. Uh, so, oh, sorry. Um, hopefully, you heard the beginning. I'm happy to be here. It's exciting to be back and in person. It's been a little while. Um, I'm Charlie Lasalle with Water Reuse California. Um, I'm here today to support the staff recommendation of the 50-50 split for funding. Um, Recycle Water Reuse California supports this recommendation as we are in a severe drought um, and the staff and the staff has clearly shown that there is a large recycled water need in the short term of $1.8 billion. We've done surveys of our members that show that that need could be as great as $7 billion in a time frame closer to 10 years so that there is a huge need for recycled water funding. 
we asked for significantly more funding than this in the budget. Um, obviously that didn't come through last year. We are asking that the state water board join us in asking for a large increase in recycled water funding in the May revise. Um, the governor's recent executive order called for a funding proposal that increased um, recycled water funding and as well as other areas to mitigate uh, impacts of the drought. Um, we are hoping that in the future, the funding for recycled water is clearly delineated between recycled water and groundwater cleanup. While the groundwater cleanup projects are very worthy and great projects, it would make it a lot easier for us. We don't want to be competing for funding with the groundwater pro cleanup projects. Thank you. Thank you. All right, just checking to see if we've had any last minute, just one more. And could you, who is it? Yes, on the list, her name is Melanie Moore and Ron Duckett. Good morning. Good morning, staff. I'm Ron Duncan, the general manager of Soquel Creek Water District. This is my colleague, Melanie Malshumacher. We appreciate this opportunity. Soquel Creek Water District is located in Santa Cruz County. Um, but first, I just want to say I've kind of grown up professionally with the state board and the regional boards. I began with UST cleanup projects, and hopefully I've le lessened that list of dry cleaners up there uh, by resolving a few of those issues for you. Uh, Pure Water Soquel is our main project. It's a recycling project to create a, a barrier against further seawater intrusion. Uh, we have a once in a lifetime opportunity to stop it at the border before it increases a little further. Through the SkyTim data from the Danish folks, they've shown it's right at our, right at our uh, uh, coastline there. And our hydrologist said if we didn't take dramatic actions, it'd be two years before it decimated our main well field, two years. Our board in 2014 took those actions and we've been in stage three curtailment since then. So since that time, we've come before the board a few years ago, and you've been generous with us, but right after that, the pandemic hit, and everybody's world got turned upside down, certainly ours, but we've been going very strong. Since that time, we've put in the three recharge wells. We've installed about four miles of the nine-mile pipeline for this replenishment project, and in December, we did the groundbreaking for the main purification facility. Matter of fact, Tara Escoval came and uh, was a keynote speaker at that event. And two of the things that he said that resonated with me was that he saw it as the kind of keystone project for our community because the project decides not only to solve our SoCal Creek Water District's problems, but if other local agencies want to capitalize on it, the, the in-ground infrastructure will also do that. I, I just commend our board for that because it's not pennies to do that. It's millions of dollars to put that in with the gamble that other agencies may, may come aboard, uh, which I think they will with time. Uh, he also said that we're, we're kind of a, a model for the smaller, medium-sized agencies that can break through and do this. Of course, we nobody can do it without many partners, right? So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to, to Melanie to, to continue on and give you our ask. Thank you. Thank you again for this opportunity. I think Ron and I are here today to speak on behalf of our agencies and others within the Prop 1 groundwater program that are requesting allocations to also be considered, not just for SCAP or water recycling, or kind of like a Goldilocks. Um, for the Pure Water SoCal project or a recycled water project, but we're not funded under that. We're funded under the Pure Water Groundwater Program. We have groundwater contamination, but we're not quite a SCAP project. So we recognize that um, Alex mentioned today that money is going to be allocated from that $330 million into projects that have good cause. And our project, we feel, has good cause. We have um, water accessibility issues. Along the coastline, we don't have access to state or imported water. We're alone in this in terms of trying to really solve our projects along the coast. We're one of 21 groundwater basins that are critically overdrafted. We have that seawater contamination that we're trying to prevent our drinking water. We have water affordability issues. Our ratepayers right now are burdening the cost with some investments from state and federal agencies, but still, our water use is extremely low. We use 50 gallons per person per day about. 
and that's still not enough. That seawater intrusion is still knocking on our door. Our water rates are, are pretty high. Our tier one water rates are over $7 a unit, and then tier two is over almost $38 a unit. That is extremely high for ratepayers in our region. And so we ask that there be special considerations for projects such as ours. We have asked for a budget amendment request in April of 2021. We've been working very hard with staff on that, and we hope that funding through this program can come to projects like us who are in progress, who are expedited, who are trying to meet the SIGMA requirements. And we are on the pathway and we are very close and we would really just appreciate that continued support. Yeah, thank you, Melanie. I'll just close with, um, I was in a conversation the other day, we were interviewing somebody and Melanie said, it was describing to the person that we, and when she says we, it's not just her, I, our staff and our board. I mean, we have the, the complete array of stakeholders from the chamber to the environmental community and people in between. But at its core, you were describing how, you know, this is, this is how we're going to save our environment, a once in a lifetime opportunity, the way we see it and the, and our community. And we're going 24 seven. I mean, we're up at 6 AM. We're meeting late. The, it, and the, the reason to tell you that is because of the importance that we see and the value that we uh, realize from you. And so as one person said, this is not a perfect project, but she said it's a darn good project. She didn't use the word darn, but you get the picture. And that's what it is. And we're just so appreciative of your help and, and all the good work that you do and your staffs. So thank you. Well, thank you. Um, it's great to see you again. And thank you for the update. Um, I do have some questions of staff and uh, want, want to better understand um, you know, this project is, it seems, in the gray area, or um, is it better suited for a, a different pot altogether? And uh, Mr. Karkowski, please feel free to uh, chime in as well. Mr. Austin, were you about to? Oh, I thought you were. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, um, Mr. The Pure Water SoCal project is funded, currently funded by the Groundwater Grant Program. Um, right now, I believe that we are, the original grant was for $50 million from the state, from the groundwater grant program and $50 million match from the agency, from, um, uh, from SoCal Water Creek, uh, SoCal Creek Water Agency. Um, the agency put in an additional funding request for about 26 about million dollars. Um, which would also include $26 million in match from the agency. Um, right now, because the groundwater grant program is starting to wind down, we're we're kind of scraping the bottom, bottom of the barrel for our, our third and final funding round. Um, and, and with our proposed plan, the SB 170 funding, the allocation for, from the Budget Act of 2021 is being split evenly between water recycling and, um, and SCAP there wouldn't be any more coming to the groundwater grant program. So right now, we're not sure if we, uh, based on where things are going, we're not sure if we can provide any more additional funding to, to SoCal and to other, um, other grant recipients who have asked us for additional funding. All right, thank you. And Mr. Kokasi. Yeah, uh, back to you with some more specific information can provide it to the other board members. There's a lot, there are a lot of different funding pots mm -hmm. kind of in play here. You know, I know one of the things that uh, for Prop 1, as we've funded many projects through Prop 1, but there are set asides, you know, for um, disadvantaged communities, that's one of the areas where it's kind of a struggle to allocate uh, those resources. Uh, I'll be, um, talking to the SoCal folks afterwards. We're working on a funding package with them right, right now to help meet some of the, the additional need. Uh, current, with the current proposal though, uh, you know, they, they are not serving a disadvantaged community. So the current proposal would, would not allow for any of this particular funding allocation to go to their project. But I, th I, th think because there are a lot of nuances in history and all all that, it'd probably be better to, you know, write something up for, for you all prior to the board's decision so you have a better understanding of this particular project, where we are currently and what the what the need is. 
All right. Sounds good. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Thank you. Chair, we have additional two more speakers. All right. Well, I'm sorry. I'm looking on my list here. Just a second. Uh, Bob Gore is in our audience right now. Ah, okay. Mr. Gore. And one's on the platform. Okay. Bob Gore. Bob Gore from the Gualco Group. I appreciate your forbearance. On behalf of uh, the city of Fresno, we'd urge that um, to borrow a word from Mr. Karkowski, we, we'd urge uh, fle flexibility and to borrow another word, nuance. Um, thanks, thanks, Joe. Uh, in defining recycling, purple pipes projects um, may not do immediate drinking water per se, but they do provide offset that does increase drinking water immediately. Also, in defining DACs, at one point a while back, uh, the DAC definition included neighborhoods, communities, as opposed as parts of urban areas. And um, Fresno, as you know, is, is um, com composed of a large aggregation of disadvantaged communities. Um, also, in defining disadvantaged communities, there may be a way to aggregate um, funders. For example, on behalf of the Kings River Conservation District, uh, another client, um, the, they're about 1.1 million acres and they include more than 100 um, DACs. So there may be a possibility to address multiple uh, communities with a single grant. Just food for thought. And again, thank you for your patience. Thank you. I don't know if uh, what I have is just not updating. So Ms. Townsend, could you announce the next speaker? Antonio Alfaro and I'm going to give him message to, oh, there we go. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, accepting my late um, request for, for speaking. Antonio Alfaro with the Santa Clara Valley Water District. I'm just calling to express our support for the Water Board's proposal to utilize the 330 million from the 2021 budget equally for recycled water and groundwater projects. Uh, as indicated by water reuse, there is a large need for recycled water projects uh, throughout the state. Uh, Valley Water is one of those with projects that are coming uh, down the pike and we anticipate uh, a, a large expenditure for uh, such projects. Um, Valley Water also supports Water Reuse's request that the State Water Board uh, support a large increase in funding for recycled water projects in the upcoming state budget. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. All right. Um, if, any other comments by board members? Mr. Juan, any any further comments? Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you for the presentation and everyone for part their participation and the good discussion. And just want to remind everyone that written comments are due on May 9th. And we look forward to seeing you with the final package. Thank you. All right. Um, at this point, we will recess um, at and return at two o'clock for our workshop on the Salton Sea. <laughs> I don't okay. know that every month. Exactly, yes. <laughs> no, I get it. <laughs>
We work with oh, Trisha Carter. She's one of your staff, right? I work with So Health Creek Water District. So nice to meet you. Yeah. Welcome to the team. Oh, I thought she was going to be. Well, I didn't know. I thought she was going to be virtual or maybe try to come. But yeah, no, we. Um, we were actually yeah, scheduled yeah, to have her come visit, right. and, and nice then, oh, it was super bad weather. But you should come too. Um, I don't, you probably yeah, haven't had much time to get too familiar with the project, but absolutely, we'd love to have you come join us.
Talking. Go ahead. OK, testing now. Keep dying, right? Testing one, two, three. Sing. Sing. <laughs> you don't want that. <laughs> okay, testing one, two, three, and uh, this is not a karaoke bar. <laughs> keep, keep at it. Is it delay? Oh yeah, we're restreaming. So. Oh. Okay. Keep going. I pledge allegiance. <laughs> Keep going. Yeah, so this is a lot of
And like right there with one. Yes. Which is on right now. Test one, two, three, podium mic, one, two, three. Oh, see, you see a glitch in the movement? Yeah. So I think it's. Zoom issue too. Like, I remember well, like, their, their network. That's what I mean. It could be, yeah. I mean, it could be your connection with their net, between the network. So, I mean. Yeah, I said, you know, I'm pretty certain it's not that because once we had MC3 on Zoom, there was no issue. So when we had a full speaker, um, so we did on see we were up there. We very close to we lost the scroll, but somebody was speaking.
How you feel present upon my heart. And will you finish to do what you start?
Yeah. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take it off the stuff. Five minutes. Now. There is some. I know what's going on. Oh, so it's not any Um, no, I don't know what's going on with the microphone. I oh. can figure out because I can see it. Let's see. It's being picked up pretty clearly. You can see up there that you know, it's being picked up. How do you see? What do you see? You see the closed caption at the top? Yeah. So that means there's a microphone live in here. No. Why? It's not saying what we're talking about, though. Well, it is. It's just doing a bad job. Oh, yeah, it does. It's right there. So find the, find the live mic. I just saw it. You did? I saw it. Oh, no. up there. Is everything okay? Yeah, one of these guys. Erlinda, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I, I can hear you guys perfectly. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, I was able to get in with no problems, but my partner, uh, Janet um, Hernandez, she still hasn't been able to. Uh, she's on the waiting room, I believe. I have Francisca Hernandez. Is that it, her? Janet Hernandez, yes. Okay. Yeah, she go by Francesca as well? I'm sorry. Go by Francesca. Uh, Janine no. didn't have her microphone on. This is Michael Waffer. So Janine's going to turn hers on. We, we were checking because there is a Francesca Hernandez in the in the queue. So I didn't know if 
and Janine was asking whether she might uh, have uh, somebody else using her computer, like a daughter, or if she goes by Francesca. Yes, I just asked her if she goes by Francesca. Okay. okay. <laughs> we'll get her. Thank you so much. I'm just a... Yeah. Orlando, did you still need something? Um, no, let me go ahead and mute right now. Thank you so much. Okay. okay. Yeah, I have my... Hello, this is Jeanette. I will be the Spanish interpreter. Can you hear me okay? Um, checking the audio. Yes, Francesca, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I couldn't change my name, but uh, Francesca is my middle name. Is I'm the same. Do you okay. want me to change? Uh, it's okay. Um, it's still my name. Okay. Okay. be a computer doing it. So we're not getting it right now, correct? No. Testing. Okay, you're gonna turn it off. Test, test, test.
So I have an individual that's um, on the Zoom platform under Eco Media Compass, but I have three individuals that are signed up to speak under that same business. Could someone please let me know which one is signed up on our Zoom call at this time right now? She's not muted. She's not muted. Yes. Which is why that's happening, oh, right? Yeah. Are you unmuted? There we go. Yeah, that'll do it. That'll do it. Somehow we must not have changed. You're still picking up. Hello, my name is Kerry Morrison. I am one of the volunteers that is with the Ecomedia Compass. I think we just happen to have a few um, outspoken people about the salt and sea that, that tend to work together here. So we're not necessarily each speaking for the Ecomedia Compass, and there's no way for me to rename this account. My name is Kerry Morrison. Thank Carrie, you. Kerry, I'll go ahead. I'll go ahead and rename you, Kerry, under the one that's on the platform right now. Okay, thank you. And for folks following along on your screen, you would have seen that uh, we're delaying the start for a few minutes to resolve a technical issue with the web webcast. So we'll probably begin in about seven and a half minutes. For our translators, if uh, you could uh, go ahead and provide some live translation for a minute so we can make sure that the webcast, the Spanish language webcast is properly picking everything up. And even if you're not providing live translation, if you could give them at least um, some Spanish language to see if the webcast is properly picking it up outside of the Zoom platform. Uh, can you guys hear me right now? Okay. <coughs> Estamos transmitiendo en vivo um, hoy, abril 20 del 2022. 
Estamos tomándonos un descanso en este momento. Estamos esperando la transmisión en vivo. Gracias por su paciencia. And again, if we could, for our uh, to make sure our feeds are coming in correctly, if the uh, interpreters could translate one more time, and we want to make sure the room is just getting fed an English fed feed. And our interpreter friends, if you can help us by also now interpreting from Spanish into English, just so we can make sure the English feed is coming into the hearing room. That's my fault. So again, one more time, if the interpreters, we did hear some Spanish coming in for those on the, the Spanish feed. If you could uh, do English translation as if there was a native Spanish speaker uh, who was testifying before the board so we can make sure that English feed is coming into the room. Okay. We're going to have to check one other thing because it appears that the video conference isn't quite picking up the English feed. So hold on a second.
for our translators, if you could uh, translate in both English and Spanish, um, just so that we can again try to figure out which feed is coming into the room. One, for one more time for our interpreting interpretation services. If we could have you do a run in both uh, English and Spanish, um, providing audio feeds on both the English and Spanish translation side of Zoom. Hey, John, can you give us a quick uh, mic check? So we're hearing Spanish on the Spanish feed. Yeah. Hey, Paula, uh, it's Michael. If you could go ahead and unmute briefly and give me a quick uh, microphone check. You don't need to bring your camera live. We just want to make sure we're getting a feed in the room. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, awfully quiet, but can hear oh, you. Really, really um, it shouldn't be that quiet. Let me try it again. Any better? No, still quiet. Um, okay. All right. Um, I don't know what to do here because no, that's all right. Don't worry. We we know we've got feed into the room for most commenters, so that'll be fine. Okay. Thanks.
for our translators. Um, hold on one second. Rolanda, um, could you do me a favor? Uh, one thing, I'm noticing that in the participant feed, you are not assigned uh, English. Does that sound right? Let me see. Yeah, they assign, it seems like they assign me as a host, co-host. Okay, um, what I was trying to figure out, and maybe this is actually the problem, uh, when we switched the room over to provide English feed, mm -hmm. um, we didn't hear any English translation, and I'm wondering if it's because um, you were not assigned as English so that we didn't have a dedicated English feed, perhaps? Um, it, it could be. Okay. Do you want me to? Um, uh, actually, log? I think it would be fine if you stay on this, but this is where you'll be providing the English translation when we have a native uh, Spanish speaker providing comments. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So don't go ahead and flip over to English, then I think we probably will be fine. And so we should be able to hear it in the room. And that might explain what the issue was earlier. Okay. So I think we're ready to begin the meeting then. Okay. All right, thank you, Mr. Loeffler. Good afternoon and welcome to this workshop to receive an update on the status of phase one of the Salton Sea Management Program. My name is Doreen Diadamo. I am vice chair of the State Water Board and with me today are fellow board members to my right, board member Sean McGuire and to his right, board member Laurel Firestone and to my left, board member Nicole Morgan. This workshop is being held in a hybrid format here in person at the Cal EPA building in Sacramento and online. This workshop is also being recorded and will be made available online for those who are not able to watch it with us today. Before we get started, I'd like to provide a few words about the evacuation procedures for those attending in person at the Cal EPA building in Sacramento. Please look around now and identify the exits closest to you. In the event of a fire alarm, we are required to evacuate this room immediately. Please take your valuables with you and proceed out the doors and exit the building. Our evacuation assembly site is at Cesar Chavez Park Plaza, located to the southwest of the building at 910 I Street. We have interpretive service available to provide any comments provided in Spanish into English. For those interested in watching the workshop online but not planning to comment, there are both English and Spanish webcast videos being offered at video.calepa.ca.gov. If you are participating in the workshop, plan to comment, and have received access to the Zoom meeting, please ensure you select either the English or Spanish language channel at the bottom of the Zoom window. Also, to accommodate the interpreters, there will be two 10-minute breaks occurring, separate from a 30-minute break prior to the public comment portion of the workshop. However, I may move around the breaks as needed to accommodate the flow of the workshop. Please note we have, full agenda, we have a full agenda of speakers today, so we will be restarting promptly after each break concludes. I'd also like to remind everyone that we have a, a fine limit time frame, and we are working with the assistant uh, clerk to the board, Margie Argel, to have a one minute uh, beep occur um, four minutes in. And the other thing that I'd like to note is that um, we may have a slight uh, time delay in order to allow us uh, to receive when there is an interpretation um, uh, when there is a Spanish speaker, we may have a brief delay so that um, we can receive translation services uh, here in the boardroom. This workshop is being held in accordance with the public notice dated April 4th, 2022. As a workshop, the board will not take any formal action and there will be no sworn testimony or cross-examination of participants. However, the board members may ask clarifying questions of the speakers. 
After receiving updates and comments at this workshop, the board may provide direction to staff regarding future tasks or actions. The purpose of today's workshop is for the board to receive written and oral comments on the status of the Salton Sea Management Program, including a report from the California Natural Resources Agency on their progress implementing the program during 2021. The due date for submittal of written comments was 12 noon on April 14th. The workshop will include several presentations and speakers. The workshop will begin with an opening statement by Wade Crowfoot, Secretary for the Natural, California Natural Resources Agency. Then we will provide a few moments for any elected or tribal officials to comment who may be in attendance today. Following those comments, we will hear presentations from State Water Board staff, the California Natural Resources Agency, and from six panels. Following the panels, we will provide the opportunity for comments from the public and other interested parties. We may pause between or during panels or individual presentations to allow elected officials to make comments if they were not available at the beginning. If any elected official or their staff are present in person or online on our Zoom platform, please let the clerk know that you are present. And for those who will be providing oral comments, please state your name and the organization you represent, if any, prior to providing your comments. Public comments will generally occur based on the order of virtual comment cards received. In order to ensure that all participants have an opportunity to participate, oral presentations from any interested persons may be subject to time limits. If you are attending in person here in Sacramento and intend to speak today, please fill out a blue speaker card and give it to the clerk. Also, at the front of the room, you can fill out the speaker card online or there is a QR code that you can scan with your phone and it will bring up the speaker card for you to fill out on your phone. Speaker cards are offered in both English and Spanish. If you are not sure whether you wish to speak, fill out a card and mark it if necessary. If you are attending online, instructions for completing a virtual speaker card were provided by the workshop notice and should have been submitted prior to the start of the workshop. If you were not aware of these instructions, you can still participate by emailing comment letters at waterboards.ca.gov. I'll repeat that, comment letters at waterboards.ca.gov. You may do that now to request a complete, request to complete a virtual speaker card and receive a Zoom link and password. You will not be able to speak in this workshop until you receive the Zoom link and password. We are broadcasting this workshop on the internet and recording both audio and video. So for those presenting in person, please be sure that you speak into the microphone during your presentation. Please try to speak clearly and slowly to help ensure effective interpretation of your comments. At this time, I would like to say a few words in honor of the late Bruce Wilcox. And just want to note that uh, Chair Esquivel, who wasn't able to be here today, um, uh, provided um, his uh, personal gratitude of Mr. Wilcox. Mr. Wilcox served as the first Assistant Secretary of Salton Sea Policy with the California Natural Resources Agency. He brought to that role his extensive knowledge of the sea and his drive for, a collaborative, for collaborative solutions to propel forward progress to address the sea. He worked tirelessly to help create and springboard the Salton Sea Management Program. We hereby recognize Bruce and are forever grateful for his collaborative spirit and his energy and all that he did for this project. He will be missed. And at this time, I'd like to for us to just have a brief moment of silence in his memory. Thank you. Uh, with that, let's move forward into the workshop, starting with a statement by Wade Crowfoot, 
Secretary for the California Natural Resources Agency. Good afternoon, Secretary. Good to see you. Great to see you. Thanks so much, board members, for giving me the opportunity to help frame some of the discussion we'll uh, have today here in this workshop. Big thanks for invoking the meeting in the memory of Bruce Wilcox, uh, incredible colleague and leader. Much of the work that were described today really started under his watch, and we were proud to uh, have an introductory honor in our annual report that we'll be discussing uh, to Bruce. So thanks so much for that. Thanks also to your staff member, Stephanie Holstage, who is really our primary point of contact with the Water Board on everything that we're doing at the Salton Sea. Uh, we really do appreciate the collaboration. For those that don't know, the Natural Resources Agency that I lead is the agency in the state that's responsible for stewarding a lot of our nature, our, our lands and waters. And in that capacity, we have responsibility for implementing the Salton Sea Management Plan or program, I should say. Our colleagues at the Water Board really have an important role in terms of maintaining accountability, holding our agency accountable for reaching certain targets within that program. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to come before you and have our team come before you every year to give you an update. It goes without saying that the, the work that I'll be talking about today is only possible based on a pretty incredible team that we have in the Salton Sea Management Program, including a lot of critical new hires. Uh, we have team members that are part of our agency from the Department of Water Resources, from the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And it's those folks that really built uh, this report and all the work that it describes. Also just huge thanks to the partnerships down at the sea that we're engaged in. At the end of the day, the progress that we make is a, a collective endeavor. And it's not possible from one state or federal or local agency, it's working together. So certainly the Salton Sea Authority, Imperial County, Riverside County, Imperial Valley Pollution Control District, the Torres, Martino, Torres Martinez Tribal Government, our federal partners, the Bureau of Reclamation, the Army Corps, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and of course the Imperial Irrigation District. I think you'll hear from a lot of leaders from these organizations, and I just want to thank them because, again, any progress we've made is the result of their work and our work together with them. So 2021 was a year of progress at the Salton Sea, and we were able to show movement toward our targets within the Salton Sea Management Program in very important ways. I'll be the first to say, though, that we need to continue to do more. Um, so while we made progress, much more work is ahead. But I did want to thumbnail or provide a high-level overview of some of this progress, because I think it's important to note. We were able to break ground and are making fast progress on the largest uh, restoration project uh, at the sea in history, and that is the Species Conservation Habitat Project. Uh, and that is a 4,000 acre project at the mouth of the New River that's both uh, going to control uh, dust suppression from the playa and provide really important environmental habitat. We've also been advancing other community oriented projects, including one at the Desert Shores community and working in partnership with Riverside County at the North Lake Demonstration Project. We were collectively, thanks to the legislature, the governor, able to secure an additional commitment of $220 million for projects like these over the last year. And now, all told, about 6,000 acres of projects uh, work is underway, with another 8,000 acres of additional work, uh, really the next tranche of projects planned for implementation by 2024. As part of a commitment to better engage impacted communities around the sea, we have been uh, essentially reinvigorating some key uh, engagement uh, opportunities. We have a, an engagement committee that has existed in the past and been reinvigorated to ensure we're getting input on the way that we're engaging communities and interested stakeholders. We've reestablished the long range planning committee, which I'll talk about in just a little bit. And we're working with local residents and communities to identify important improvements, amenities around the sea um, that can complement the work that's actually happening within the management program that we're, uh, we're leading. With an eye towards the future, we have impaneled an independent set of experts to review proposals for the potential importation of water into the Salton Sea to really determine the technical uh, engineering and financial feasibility of those proposals. 
And that's really important because while we're working on all these projects for the 10 year plan, we're also focused on providing the water board by the end of this year, a long range salt and sea plan for what happens in the future decades. And a lot of that obviously depends on uh, the amount of water that will continue to flow into the sea. And that long range planning committee that I just mentioned is really important for providing input to that long range plan that we're gonna develop and then ultimately submit to the water board. As I said, significant work ahead. I no doubt you should talk about the acreage targets that were set several years ago that we're still working to catch up um, uh, on. And while we are making progress, uh, much more work is ahead. I'm really excited that we have new members uh, that work with me here in Sacramento. Um, one, to ensure that we are centering equity and environmental justice in our work at the Salton Sea. We were glad to welcome our first ever Deputy Secretary for Equity and Environmental Justice, Moises Moreno Rivera. And uh, Moises or Moy actually comes from Mecca with a good familiarity of challenges and opportunities at the Salton Sea. We're also uh, focused on engaging uh, with our tribal partners and strengthening partnerships with tribes, both in the Salton Sea and across the state. And in that work, I work closely with our first ever Assistant Secretary for Tribal Affairs, Geneva E.B. Thompson. Uh, and it was actually just last month that Chairman Tortes and the Torres Martinez, uh, Desert Cahuilla uh, Indian, uh, hosted a, a tribal intergovernmental round table uh, with multiple na uh, tribal nations and communities to actually provide input to the work that we're doing at the sea and for us to learn from them, uh, given their stewardship of these lands since time immemorial. Um, we are continuing to work on how we do this work, deliver projects in ways that are understandable and well communicated to local communities uh, and that provide meaningful opportunities for folks that are impacted uh, by the Salton Sea and its changes to actually provide input to us. Uh, and so that continues to be a priority for us. Uh, lastly, I'll say that there's a lot of information that will be discussed here today. And for those that are watching, if you want uh, to take a deeper dive into any of this information, please do check out our annual report, which is available in both Spanish and English. That's connected obviously to the website for this workshop and is also available uh, on our agency website. Um, so once again, board members, thanks so much for the opportunity to share at a very high level our progress, and then also the recognition that there are ways that we continue to improve and there is a lot of work ahead. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Secretary Crowfoot, and thank you for your ongoing leadership on the Salton Sea. Uh, the first time I went to the Salton Sea, um, it was a, a tour that uh, you prepared and hosted. And so um, I can't uh, think about it without thinking of you and your leadership and your agencies. Uh, steadfast uh, support. Um, it has been challenging at times, but it's exciting to see uh, things start to change and the significant progress that has been made. So we look forward to a productive dialogue and just want to check with my fellow uh, board members and see if anyone has any comments or anything they'd like to say. All right. Thank you, Secretary. All right, next we will offer the opportunity for any elected or tribal officials that would like to provide comment. Did we receive any? I do not see any on the list. Um, my case would like to all right, thank you. Um, maybe just uh, re let, let, if someone comes in, we'll go ahead and put them to the front of the list um, if that's what if that's their desire. All right, uh, next, moving into the workshop presentations, our first presentation will be from uh, State Water Board staff, uh, Stephanie Holtzedge, Senior Environmental Scientist. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Stephanie Holtzedge. I'm a Senior Environmental Scientist with the State Water Board. Turn your microphone on, please. Her, her on. It's oh, on. Okay, maybe just now? get a little closer. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, thank Sorry you about that. Um, yeah, so I'm Stephanie Holstage. I'm a senior environmental scientist with the State Water Board, and I'm tasked with implementing the board's oversight role um, of the Salton Sea Management Program. Next slide, please. 
Um, just a quick overview of what I'll be covering in this um, presentation. So first I'll go over some conditions at the Salton Sea, background of board actions, the stipulated order, the Salton Sea Management Program, and then written comments. Next slide, please. Ms. Holstead, I'll just ask you again, get it. I, I think we're able to hear you, but just want to make sure that the, on the okay. broadcast that others can. Better? Thank oh, you. There we go. Sorry. Thank you. Oh, that's better. Um, yeah, so firstly, I will um, briefly go over some current conditions at the C. Next slide. Um, here's a table that shows some current information related to surface water elevation for the C as of March 2022. Um, as you can see here, um, between the current water elevation in comparison to the elevation in 2003, there's been a drop of about 9.9 .9 feet. Next slide, please. Additionally, the estimated amount of exposed playa is about 14,900 acres or 23 square miles. On the right is a chart by USGS that provides a visual demonstrating um, the consistent decline in water surface elevation in the sea from 2003 to present. Next slide, please. Um, moving on to a brief background of board actions. Next slide. Um, so first I will go over the quantification settlement agreement or um, often referred to as the QSA. The QSA is a collection of agreements intended to settle disputes over Colorado River water use within California. The QSA allowed for the long-term water transfer of conserved water from Imperial Irrigation District, or IID, to urban use. Also, the QSA prompted the state to undertake the restoration and mitigation efforts at the Salton Sea. Next slide. Um, in, in anticipation of the QSA, IID filed a petition for a long-term water transfer, which was approved by the State Water Board in October 2002. The long-term transfer is for the transfer of conserved ag water from IID to San Diego County Water Authority, Coachella Valley um, Water District, and Mo Metropolitan Water District of Southern California for a 45-year transfer with an option for an additional 30-year renewal period. The long-term transfer was revised shortly after it was approved to require IID to supply 15 years of mitigation water to the salt and sea in order to maintain the salinity level while a regional solution was developed to address the public health and environmental concerns. In November 2014, IID filed a petition with the State Water Board seeking modification of the long-term transfer order since the mitigation uh, water was coming to an end and there was no plan in place to address um, um, the salt and sea. Next slide. Um, so following this petition by IID, um, the Salt and Sea Task Force was then created and included the governor's office and multiple state agencies. As part of the task force, the Water Board monitored and assessed progress being implemented for the Salt and Sea and held multiple workshops between 2015 and 2017. Next slide, please. Um, and in March 2017, um, IID filed a motion with the State Water Board, which prompted a draft stipulated order to be developed for consideration by the State Water Board. As a, re as a result of this, um, the board adopted an order, which is referred to as a stipulated order, um, which amended the long-term water transfer order to include specific annual acreage milestones in order to address public health and environmental concerns. These milestones coincided with the acreage targets um, within phase one of the SSMP. Next slide. So moving on to the stipulated order. Next slide, please. Um, condition 24 of the stipulated order includes annual acreage milestones for both habitat and dust suppression projects. This table here shows um, each annual milestone from 2018 through 2028. As highlighted in orange, the milestone for 2021 was 3,500 acres um, with a cumulative total of 7,000 acres. 
The total cumulative um, of all the annual milestones will be 29,800 acres by the end of 2028. Next slide. Condition 25 of the stipulated order, no less than 50% of the acreage um, described in, the, in condition 24 shall provide habitat benefits for fish and wildlife um, species that depend on the salt and sea ecosystem. Next slide. Um, so the stipulated order also added condition 28 of the, to the water transfer order. This requires that the State Water Board hold a, pu a public workshop to receive written and oral comments on the status of the salt and sea mitigation and restoration efforts by the state and a progress report by the state on their implementation of the SSMP. The State Water Board, as part of their oversight role, was selected to hold the annual workshop, um, which is why we're here today, to provide transparency and provide a public forum for government agencies, community members, and other stakeholders um, to provide input on the progress of the state's efforts to mitigate and restore um, the receding shoreline of the salt and sea. <laughs> The order states that the workshop and annual progress report must be completed by March 31st of each year. However, um, in 2020, the annual report or the annual workshop was delayed until August due to the pandemic. In 2021 and now again in 2022, the workshop is being delayed until April to allow sufficient time for review of the CNRA report by the public and state water board staff. Next slide. The annual report needs to cover these six topics, which include the completed projects and milestones achieved, amount of acreage of completed projects, upcoming projects, the status of financial resources and permits, any anticipated departures from the annual milestone targets, and progress towards development of the phase of the long-term plan. Next slide, please. So moving on to the Salt and Sea Management Program Annual Report. Next slide. Um, CNRI submitted their annual report to the State Water Board on February 24th, 2022, ahead of the annual end of March deadline set forth in the order. CNRA also released the report to the public on February 25th and made the report available in both English and Spanish. The annual report at a minimum must include information related to those um, six items that I mentioned previously. The annual report does cover these topics, and in addition, um, CNRA has provided additional information related to project delivery, planning, partnerships, community engagement, and next steps in phase one of the SSMP. Next slide. This is the fourth annual report since issuance of the stipulated order, and the table here shows the annual milestones goal, acreages completed, and when the report was submitted for the last four years. You can see here that for 2021, 522 acres of habitat and um, dust suppression projects were completed at the sea. I won't go into further detail on the annual report since CNRA will do that um, in detail in their presentation following mine. Um, next slide, please. So moving on to written comments. Um, as part of the workshop, written comments were solicited and were due by April 14th. There were a total of eight comment letters that were submitted for today's workshop, including one form later uh, form letter that was sent by approximately 1,372 individuals. The written comments received will be listed on the State Water Board Salt and Sea webpage following this workshop, and these comment letters are public and are available upon request. Um, so here's an overview of the workshop today. So following my presentation, there will be a presentation by California Natural Resources Agency um, to give their update on the salt and sea management program. And then after that, there will be six panels. The first one being the Colorado River Basin Regional Water Quality Control Board, followed by air quality authorities, local entities, federal entities, wildlife and community NGOs, and then the last panel will be a community member panel. Following that, we'll have a break and then we will move into public comments. Next slide, please. 
Here's my contact information. Um, if anyone is interested or would like to reach out to me. Also, the State Water Board does have a uh, Salt and Sea webpage and the link is provided there. There's also an email subscription um, for the Salt and Sea if you're interested in um, receiving email updates and that can be subscribed to on the webpage. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Holstead. Any questions? All right. Uh, the next presentation is from the California Natural Resources Agency uh, provided by Arturo Delgado, the Assistant Secretary for Salt and Sea Policy at the Resources Agency. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon, Vice Chair Diadamo and, and board members. Uh, there it is. Give me a sec here to... Sorry for that. So uh, my name is Arturo Delgado, and I serve as the Assistant Secretary for Salt Sea Policy at the California Natural Resources Agency. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's Salt Sea Workshop. I'm excited to welcome new members of our leadership team who are joining me today to provide an update on behalf of the California Natural Resources Agency, the California Department of Water Resources, and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, collectively known as the Salt Sea Management Program, also known as the SSMP team. Joining me today, we have uh, Tanya Marshall, who serves as the Salt Sea Program Manager at the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, Tanya was previously the supervisory senior environmental scientist for the Department of Fish and Wildlife within the Salt and Sea Management Program. In December, she was promoted to the Salt and Sea Program Manager position where she leads coordination and oversees all areas of the CDFW Salt and Sea Program. She's based in the Coachella Valley out of our CDFW Bermuda Dunes office. In addition, we also have Mario Llanos, who serves as our Deputy Assistant Secretary at the California Natural Resources Agency. Mario joined the team last September and is based out of Imperial County. Uh, he provides leadership and interfaces with stakeholders and local leaders to advance important work at the Salton Sea. And we also have with us today, uh, James Newcomb. Uh, James is, is, serves as the Assistant Deputy Director at the Department of Water Resources. Um, James began serving in this position and leading the Salton Sea team at the Department of Water Resources last September. Uh, James works with leadership across the state government and oversees all areas of the, of the DWR Salton Sea program. And he is based out of Sacramento. Uh, next slide, please. So in today's presentation, uh, we will review elements of our annual report highlighting progress in 2021. Uh, we will also provide a look ahead. Um, to start, I will highlight program priorities and provide an overview of key progress at the sea. Uh, Tanya will then provide a project update, followed by Mario, who will highlight important work um, and progress made around strengthening partnerships and engagement. And then James will provide an update on our planning activities and next steps. Uh, next slide, please. So at the highest level, our program remains focused on and committed to the following key priorities. Uh, the first one here is continuing to advance implementation of the Salt and Sea Management Program's phase one 10 year plan, which aims to improve conditions around the sea by constructing approximately 30,000 acres of projects to suppress dust from exposed lake bed and create habitat for fish and wildlife. Strengthening partnerships with tribal governments, local leaders and communities to deliver projects and to ins institutionalize community engagement within and across SSMP projects and planning efforts. Our, our third key priority is establishing a long-term pathway for the Salton Sea beyond the phase one 10 year plan which includes developing a long range plan for submittal to the state water board by the end of this year. And then our fourth uh, key priority is continuing to build the SSMP team to further enhance our organizational and operational capacity. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so this slide highlights key progress, progress our team has made in collaboration with a broad range of partners. 
Uh, this work includes completing over 1,200 acres of temporary dust control in 2020 and 2021, advancing nearly 6,000 6, acres of major project work that is now underway, making forward progress on an additional 8,000 acres of new projects that are now planned through 2024, and then also securing commitments from state leaders for an additional $220 million in funding to pay for our next set of projects. Important progress was also made to advance programmatic permitting that will enable future work to happen more quickly. Outreach and engagement with local communities and partners was strengthened so that local input can better shape our work. And as we plan for the future, our team also established an independent review panel to evaluate the feasibility of water importation, which will inform the long range plan for the Salton Sea. With the addition of six new team members during 2021, and the further planned addition of new staff in 2022, the program is building stronger institutional capacity to meet the growing demands of completing a wide range of projects now on the drawing board and the associated outreach and engagement, engagement for those projects. This concludes this portion of our presentation and I will now turn it over to my colleague, Tonga Marshall. Thank you. Thank you, Artura. Wonderful Wednesday, everyone. Um, as Aturo stated, I am Tanya Marshall and I am the Salton Sea Program Manager for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Within this presentation, I will be giving some project updates of the Salton Sea Management Program projects, otherwise known as SSMP projects. Next slide, please. Before we proceed with project updates, let's briefly discuss a critical component to the timely completion and success of our SSMP projects, which is land access. Land access planning is a critical component of our work. As you can see on this map, the state is not a significant landowner, and we must rely on voluntary landowner cooperation to obtain access agreements to implement projects. This lack of state-owned lands and the checkerboard land ownership create some challenges as we must enter into one or more land access agreements for each site before project design can be finalized and implementation can begin. Varied land ownership also impacts project timelines and increases cost as each owner has differing land access procedures. In addition, each project site may span multiple parcels under different ownership. So multiple land use agreements may be required for a single project. The timing of these and future land access agreements will dictate the planning and implementation schedule for the rest of this year and beyond, and will also affect the SSMP team's ability to deliver on annual acreage targets for habitat and dust suppression projects. Of course, we will continue to prioritize land access until site control has been reached on the acreage amount needed to fully implement all phase one 10 year plan projects. Next slide, please. In 2020, our team completed approximately 755 acres of temporary dust suppression projects as an interim proactive measure to treat areas of exposed lake bed prior to the beginning of construction of the Species Conservation Habitat Project also known as the SCH project. In 2021, Kiewit Corporation implemented additional interim dust control measures to stabilize approximately 500 acres of exposed lake bed within the SCH footprint. Also in 2021, intersection dishes on east and west sides of the new river were constructed to collect and redirect ag agricultural runoff, enabling desert pupfish migration and creating 22 acres of habitat. Next slide, please. There are many SSMP projects planned for around the sea. Unfortunately for this presentation, we don't have time to address each one. However, let's discuss where these projects are with the environmental planning process. The SCH project, which is at the south end of the sea, was developed through a comprehensive environmental planning process which was completed in 2013. Beginning in late 2019, projects related to the dust suppression and vegetation enhancement were informed by outreach and engagement with landowners, agencies, 
organizations, and members of the public through a series of community meetings to shape the development of the Dust Suppression Action Plan, which is commonly referred to as DSAP. This plan was finalized and released in July 2020. At this point, we want to take this opportunity to thank the Torres Martinez tribe for hosting one of the DSAP community meetings. The SSMP team appreciates their support. It should be noted that the SSMP 10-year plan project description includes these DSAP projects as well as other project components to be considered around the sea. Also, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Corps, which is leading the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA in Environmental Assessment, which is known as an EA, for the 10-year plan released a revised pro project description for comment in 2021, and the draft EA document is currently being finalized and is scheduled to be released for public review and input later this year. Next slide, please. As you probably heard quite a bit about, the SCH project is currently in construction and it will create habitat and suppress dust on approximately 4,100 acres of exposed lake bed. You will hear quite a bit about this project as we're excited to see the first large scale project come to life. We awarded a contract to Kiwit Corporation in September, 2020 and construction began in January, 2021 and is expected to be completed by the end of 2023. Next slide, please. Construction is ongoing and visible signs of, prog visible signs of progress are present. As you can see on the left-hand side photo, the causeway, which is over a mile long and extends into the Salton Sea, has already been constructed. And it is amazing. <laughs> this is where we plan to connect with the Selene pump station. There are many other construction aspects that we can see from the air, like the new river diversion that was constructed to allow for the construction of the intake structures for the SEH project on the right-hand side of the screen. Next slide, please. As mentioned before, SEH is the SSMP's first large-scale project to reduce exposed lake bed and create environmental habitat at the sea. This project will create a new a network of ponds and wetlands to provide important fish and have bird habitat, as well as to reduce dust. This, the, the slide on the right side of your screen is the beginning construction of a nesting island located at the East Habitat Pond. As you can see, it is very large. The speck in the upper part of the picture is actually the construction video, a vehicle, excuse me, performing the work. Um, can we skip the next slide, please? Can we skip that slide? Thank you. If we have time at the end of the SSMP presentation, we might be able to see a four minute video of SEH, but we're gonna skip it at this time. The SSMP team is working with the US Bureau of Reclamation, USBR, to plan and implement approximately 1,700 acres of vegetation enhancement projects at three sites around the Salton Sea. These vegetation enhancement projects are planned to restore native vegetation at their natural occurrence rate and create habitat benefits by establishing the vegetation. These projects will also provide dust suppression. The purpose of these projects is to restore exposed lake bed sites through establishment of native vegetation, which is new plants, and enhancement of existing plants across the USBR parcels. A stable vegetation community is expected to enhance habitat value at these sites and reduce wind-blown dust emissions. Next slide, please. Winds blowing over exposed lake bed are responsible for dust emission and are also a result in burial of small plants, thus preventing their establishment. These graphics show how the placement of bales, bales reduces wind speed and dust motion on the exposed lake bed, thus creating conditions for vegetation establishment and growth. Initially, straw bales are placed on site to create conditions to support plant growth by reducing wind speeds to protect the young plants while also reducing dust emissions. Straw bales were selected because it achieves our desi design goal 
while also allowing the state to source and the natural material from the region, um, have less substantial site disturbance, and allows the option to break down the bales and use as mulch on the site. After the bales are placed, then the site is, will be prepared for the seeding and planting of native halophytic species. We began harvesting seeds around the seeds around the Salton Sea last year to improve the likelihood of plant survival. Working with botanists, we have grown plants that have been tested to tolerate the salinity that is present that is present in the region. This work is ongoing, and it depends on the plant species and the ideal time to harvest the seeds for the, that species of plant. To grow and sustain the plants, we are working on multiple water supply options and allow for, to allow for adoptive management. Next slide, please. Around this time last year, our team began harvesting seeds from native species around the Salton Sea. And working with botanists, the seeds were grown and tested to tolerate the salinity that is present in the region. Additional seed was collected and stored for future use. As you can see from the sides, slides, seeding and planting began last month, March. We are excited to report that the seeds are germinating rapidly and successfully. This work is ongoing and is planned to continue at all vegetation enhancement project locations. Next slide, please. In January, 2021, the SSMP Air Quality Monitoring Program was established beginning with the placement of monitors and inst instruments on the SCH site to monitor the performance of the temporary dust suppression projects. In December, 2021, the project expanded to the north end of the sea to the North Shore and Coachella exposed lake bed sites. These sites were selected based on feedback and comments received by community members. In 2022, monitoring will expand to our vegetation enhancement projects. Next slide, please. The SSMP team is also collaborating with other partners to advance a broad range of projects, such as the North Lake Demonstration Project, Desert Shores, and Audubon Bombay Beach Wetland Restoration Projects. We did not have enough time to discuss each of these wonderful projects in detail, but the information on them is in the annual report in chapter two. And all three of these projects will be included for analysis as part of the SSMP 10-year plan NEPA document. Next slide, please. There are also other major upcoming projects that we cannot go into uh, individually today, but we wanted to let you know that they are out there and to get an idea of where they are located. Next slide, please. On the north side of the sea, we have the North Lake Project. The North Lake Project is a large habitat project proposed for the northern shore of the sea. Within a larger 4,200 acre horseshoe shaped planting area that is shown in red on the slide, we will need to define the exact areas for a 1,000 to 1,500 acre project, determine the types of aquatic habitat to be created and determine water sources. However, the proposed project is covered by the NEPA EA being developed for the 10-year phase one plan. Next slide, please. On the south end of the sea, near the SCH project, which is shown on the map as a purple outline, there are three projects proposed with the new, with the new river expansion being the largest project at approximately 3,500 acres. Next slide, please. SSMP projects are not the only projects being proposed, planned and constructed in the Salton Sea ecosystem. Additional major restoration work continues to be performed by partner organizations while also benefiting the Salton Sea environment. Some key projects are noted on this slide. This concludes my portion of the presentation. Next, you'll hear about SSMP partners and community engagements from my colleague, Mario Llanos. Mario? Thank you, Tanya. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Mario Llanos, Deputy Assistant Secretary for the California National 
Natural Resources Agency. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak on partnerships and community engagement, which is a crucial, which is crucial to the salt and sea management programs activities. Learning from and listening to our partners is key in developing projects within our 10 year plan and the long range plan. In 2021, the salt and sea management program made great strides in strengthening partnerships and taking community engagement to the next level. Next slide, please. Partnerships and stakeholders, tribal governments, and local, state, and federal agencies are crucial to help fulfill the goals of the SSMP. Timely and meaningful engagement with Salton Sea listed, I'm sorry, timely and meaningful engagement with the Salton Sea is important to development of projects around the sea. The SSMP is dedicated to public engagement and has increased opportunities to solicit stakeholder and community input for everything we do. Um, I won't go through each of the names on the list, but in one way or another, each of these groups and others engage with our program. These organizations have representation on our various committees, such as the Long Range Plan Committee, the Science Committee, and Engagement Committee. Many or all of these organizations have attended and provided feedback at our various meetings. Some of these organizations are, part, are, part, are partners on ongoing SSMP projects, and have completed or have their own projects uh, underway. We're striving to collaborate and learn from these projects to identify new projects around the sea. Next slide, please. Here we just wanted to highlight some of our major uh, engagement activities in 2021. Uh, first off is the Community Engagement Committee was very active in 2021. It consists of representatives from community-based organizations, stakeholder groups, local leaders, governmental agencies, and tribal governments. This committee helps guide the Salt and Sea Management Program's engagement efforts and helps shape our planning activities. Last year, this committee developed a committee charter and engagement plan, which is used by the SSMP team as a guide when we are hosting engagement opportunities. Community engagement committee meetings are held approximately every two months. Next, the Salt and Sea uh, team hosted two public meetings to kick off the Long Range Plan development in August and September of 2021. The Long Range Plan Committee meetings are also open to the public, including the first set of meetings which were held in December 2021. Currently, the Long Range Plan Committee meet, meets about every two months. Another significant activity occurred in tw March 2021 when the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers released the Phase 1 10-year plan project description for public comment. Next, the independent review panel was formed and hosted a virtual workshop in October 2021. In November 2021, the panel met with the community at locations in Imperial Riverside counties near the Salton Sea. The panel will have several report outs throughout 2022 before ultimately submitting their final report on water importation concepts to the state early this coming fall. Finally, in 2021, I'm sorry, finally in December 2021, the SSMP team hosted its first major tour of the SCH project in Imperial County. Tribal governments, regional elected officials, and a wide range of salt and sea stakeholders joined the California Natural Resources Agency, Secretary Wade Crowfoot, and SSMP team to view progress at the state's first large scale project of the program. Next slide, please. As you can see here, we have a robust schedule with many opportunities for community outreach and engagement. This schedule is continually updated. In fact, it's a little different here in this presentation than the one in our annual report because it's a, it's a living document and it gets, it gets uh, changed um, slightly, but it's, it doesn't deviate too much. The SSMP team has been working with local leaders and community members to build a long-term respectful approach to engage with Salton Sea community members and other interested stakeholders to inform and solicit meaningful input regarding health, air quality, environmental and social aspects of our SSMP projects for in integration into the phase one 10 year plan and the long range plan for the Salton Sea. I briefly discussed the uh, community engagement committee and the long range plan committee, which are shown on this schedule. On the first line of the schedule, you'll notice the SSMP update community meetings or workshops, which began meeting this year to give updates on our program. They're usually held in the evening hours to ensure community is available to participate. So far this year, we've held two meetings which provided updates on our program 
uh, NEPA informational session and a deeper dive into our annual report in preparation for this meeting. I also wanted to share that recently this science committee was reconvened um, this year and held, actually last year, and have held their first meeting in mid-February. Their estimated schedule is represented on the schedule. Currently, the science committee is working on providing comments and feedback on the monitoring implementation plan, also known as the MIP. The monitoring implementation plan is being developed and will guide measurement of important resources to Salton Sea. In 2021, the MIP was further developed through working groups with input from agencies and stakeholders with expertise and monitoring experience in hydrology, air quality, water quality, biology, and socioeconomics. The MIP will provide a monitoring framework and, pri and priorities for environmental indicators at the Salton Sea. Finally, the anticipated release of the 10-year plan uh, draft environmental assessment is represented on this, on this uh, schedule. This will tee off two to three meetings to provide further information and solicit input, which will be led by the Army Corps of Engineers and supported by the SSMP. Next slide, please. Finally, I'd like to discuss community amenities around the Salton Sea. There's a lot of information out there, and there have been recent discussions at our meetings around community amenities. The state has contracted with Better World Group to lead an effort to produce a community amenities strategy document. Better World Group has been listening and cataloging ideas thus far, and will continue to lead this effort in the coming months. This document will be developed collaboratively, collaboratively with direct input and involvement from community members, community-based organizations, and Salton Sea partners. The intent is to identify community needs that can possibly be incorporated into SSMP projects near-term and long-term and related efforts when possible. Additionally, this effort will aim to identify possible funding sources identified for community amenities outside of the SSMP. This concept paper will identify community amenities like those listed on this slide. Some may fall into, 10 year, into the 10-year plan and some may be identified and rolled into the long, long range plan. While many amenities fall, may fall outside of the SSMP scope or funding, this strategy document will identify potential sources of funding from other local, state, and federal sources, as well as potential philanthropic donors. Aside from identifying physical amenities like those listed on the slide, the document will bring to light many co-benefits by way of identifying improvements to public health, workforce development or potential job opportunities, and climate benefits to the region. Next slide, please. And this concludes my presentation, and I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, uh, James Newcomb, who will talk about planning. Thank you. Good afternoon, board members and workshop attendees. So my name is James Newcomb, and I serve as Assistant Deputy Director for the Department of Water Resources. I was fortunate to join the Salt and Sea Management Program in September. And I'm happy uh, to be here today to share our current planning activities and next steps. For those of you tracking with the annual plan, this covers chapters five and six. And uh, if the slideshow can advance to the next slide. Okay, so we'll start with the status of planning. Vamos a empezar and con el estatus no, plan. I apologize, but I'm, I'm getting a, uh, One moment. Yeah, if you can hold on for a second. Um, so for some reason on the interpretation feed, I'm not sure if any of the interpreters have switched uh, the channel they're providing on, but we're picking up uh, the Spanish translation on the main channel at the moment. So James, why don't you try speaking again and let's see. Sure, so we'll start with status of planning. Diciendo, vamos plan. a empezar con el estado. Okay. One well, moment. So Erlanda, um, mm -hmm. I think that you are providing the translation momentarily, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, I think you need to switch it over so that you're transmitting it out on the Spanish feed. Um, I have it on the Spanish feed. However, um, I think that I was admitted as a um, as a co-host as opposed to as an interpreter. So that could be the cause of that. 
so you should be able to assign. Hold on one second. Okay. Hold on one second, Orlando. So we should we should be able to give you both co-host and interpreter. So let me figure mm -hmm. out. Okay. Stay tuned, we're having some technical difficulties. So, Erlenda, you should be able to switch now. You're identified as an interpreter, and you should be able to switch that you're in the, providing the Spanish interpretation. And at this point, uh, James, you should be able to resume. Great. Thank you. Mr. Newcomb, I'm going to just check with the clerk on a, a matter. I know there's an, an individual that has a train to catch, so... Uh, do we have enough time to finish Mr. Newcomb or should we um, have the commenter come up now? I just want to. It will take me approximately eight minutes to get through my material. I'm happy to to wait. I, I have time, so I'm happy to to wait and have a commenter go forward if 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 that timing doesn't work. Sir, could you um, identify yourself and affiliation, if any? Uh, hello. Thanks, James. Uh, yeah, my name is Keshav. Um, so yeah, uh, just to talk, uh, my concern about the lithium mining going on with the Salton Sea there. And so, yeah, my name is Keshav Badula. And uh, yeah, more into like the environmental science part of it and more holistic understanding of 
the especially the water energy nexus and the interconnectedness of that. This will be more for the California Energy Commission, I think. Uh, I've already submitted comments to them, but you know, at, uh, water and energy are very important, critical. So, um, with the increased awareness, uh, it's important. Um, so, uh, hope you at least uh, after um, the oil dependent economy, fossil fuel dependent way of life has physically disconnected us from like our sense of where we are, you know, we're so dependent on reliant on basically car culture like that. Um, and then the internet, like the information technology in a way has through the mind is, is a way through the minds that we've uh, sort of evolved in our consciousness, um, but still have maybe that physical disconnect with the fossil fuel economy. So then there's this hyped, it's hyped energy transition towards renewables. And of course, lithium being one of the things, if you look at the, the holistic impact of all the different um, elements to uh, su to support the renewable energy transmission uh, transition, especially solar panels, then it just doesn't work for me. I used to also think, right, it's obvious, like the source, the sun, the wind, water, everything. It's like it's renewable. It's natural sources. But if you really think about it, it's just a source. If you look at the whole life cycle, then it it's not good for life, for like water, life, and uh, holistically so for me like uh, i thought it was good at the beginning but then uh i watched two really well presented documentaries planet of the humans and bright green lives which is also a great book really good references and things that came out in the last couple of years and uh so it really gives you a better understanding of this is not really the right way uh to go especially at a governmental planning level um at a high level too so like even like with the united nations and supporting like ways of life that are more like indigenous, local, like more relocalized ways of living, not dependent on the car culture type of thing. Um, and so, yeah, it's like, it's a, you know, the Al Gore's inconvenient truth. This is like a very inconvenient truth because we're so familiar with this way of life, so dependent on oil economies and things like that. So, but, uh, and also the other thing is like, in a way, the way I see it is like a, like an over nurtured plant, um, you know, then it's like, it's not going to be able to survive if you take away that, you know, something that's a finite resource and even renewable energies. So it's kind of like a weekend, like we become spoiled with those energies. Um, and so, so in a way, the challenge, the way I see it is like, how do you, uh, like a spoil from even like a family, you know, if you have spoiled children or something like that, so used to these energies, it's like, that's, that's kind of the challenge. Um, uh, and, um, uh, mm. uh, and yeah, so again, I mean, again, California Energy Commission, but like also, and there's a drought and everything too, but you know, the water energy nexus, the interconnectedness. And so, yeah, as we evolve in consciousness, we know better than hopefully like towards like more relocalizing economies, but it's a tough challenge. And, um, and uh, yeah, good luck. Uh, I'll do my best too. Thank you. Thank you for appearing before us today. Thank you for your comments. All right, um, Mr. Newcomb, back to you on your presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And, and just to reorient the audience, so I'm covering really the status of the SSMP planning activities, and we're starting with the uh, NEPA process that's already been referenced uh, for the 10-year plan. Um, and I just want to say that um, because I'm going to be covering multiple planning processes, this 10-year plan is intended to offset impacts that are beginning to happen now. And I'll say that most of the work that's happening under the 10-year plan requires some sort of federal approval. And, and uh, we decided that it would be um, in our best interest and everybody's best interest if we would group together like projects under one environmental review process. And so that's currently what's happening. So there's an environmental assessment that will cover all of the federal approvals uh, needed for the 10-year plan, which includes the 30,000 acres of, of habitat and dust suppression projects that previously mentioned by Tanya. And I won't belabor uh, all of the projects that are in there, but I will say that if uh, you're a member of the public and uh, or an agency for that matter, and you wanna be involved in the review and comment of these projects, then just know that in the coming weeks, uh, perhaps mid-May, um, the draft environmental assessment for all the projects under the 10-year plan will be released for public review. And upon release, the Corps is planning to hold two to three meetings 
And then I also wanted to say that the core plans to have a final document in the fall of 2022. So I'm going to ask to go to the next slide and, and transition to, um, you know, off of the this process, which is really geared at dealing with impacts now into looking out beyond those immediate impacts and talking about the long range plan, which is aimed at alleviating impacts associated with the anticipated long term recession of the sea. The, the long range plan will evaluate a broad range of updated and entirely new concepts that rely on both in base and water sources. And eventually it will also incorporate an evaluation of projects that include water importation. And I'll touch on, on when that will occur in a subsequent slide. The objectives within the plan are carried forward from Fish and Game Code, and of course the State Water Resource Control Board stipulated order. Uh, we are shooting to create large amounts of resilient aquatic habitat aiming to improve air quality and aiming to improve water quality. And while those are our core obligations, we also know that we must incorporate several other aspects into our planning to deliver a plan that is actionable. And these important areas include topics like preservation of tribal heritage, economic opportunities, and recreational features. And I will build on how we evaluate our ability to meet those objectives and to incorporate these other important aspects into our plan in the next slide, please. So our evaluation criteria are sort of the heart of the long range plan and, and, and that is why I wanted to choose to focus on evaluation criteria with respect to the plan today. We will have several criteria to evaluate all aspects of concepts within the plan. Our, our criteria categories are adapted from federal criteria used in development of large water infrastructure projects. They span four categories and, and I'll provide an example and define each of them briefly. So, Effectiveness really measures how well a concept performs an individual objective. So thinking back to the last slide and using air quality as an example, uh, we're likely to have multiple metrics for measuring air quality improvements, but one of them will be exposed playa. And so using that as an example, a concept that had the least remaining exposed playa would be the one that was most effective in terms of meeting our air quality objective. So, and again, that's the effectiveness criteria and there will be uh, several uh, other types of criteria aimed at looking at water quality and habitat that fall under this category. Moving on to acceptability. Acceptability incorporates measures that, that I mentioned previously. This is where items like economy will be explored. And for the concept of economy, we know that job creation is important. And so we're likely to have at least one metric that focuses is on job creation. And so exploring the different types of concepts and strategies that, that we are looking to evaluate, a concept that allowed for the most stable long-term jobs would be one that scored highest for this particular measure of acceptability. Uh, the next bullet there is completeness. And that is simply a check to ensure that all of the core obligation, sorry, core objectives that previously mentioned are sufficiently addressed. So again, habitat, air quality, and water quality. This metric allows us to identify shortcomings of any particular concepts and then to identify opportunities or elements of other projects that would then make that, that particular concept more complete. And then the last bullet there is efficiency. Efficiency is one of the more complex categories but includes elements like cost, risk, and as already mentioned a couple times, water supply needs. I'll use cost as a metric for an example. So projects that deliver the highest benefits relative to cost would be ones that score the best for that efficiency metric. So in addition to evaluation criteria, we have other material available for review related to the long range plan, um, including also our first suite of concepts that we're, that we're currently building out. Please visit the saltandsea.ca.gov website to, to review any of those materials. They're housed in the quick links section for now on the webpage, but in the near future, we're going to add a tab dedicated to the long range plan. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this timeline really is just to provide a sense for where we are now. Uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, the long range plan will be very broad in that it will consider concepts that rely on in-basin water sources, and it will eventually uh, also fold in concepts that involve water importation. That, that uh, work that's being done on the water importation is, is happening by way of an independent feasibility study. Right now, we're at the point in our schedule where, where we have a draft set of evaluation criteria and a partial suite of concepts for evaluation. We are working to finalize uh, all of our concepts this May, 
which includes suggestions from the public and members on the long range planning committee. And then we will begin our evaluation on those in basin concepts later next month. And concurrently, uh, the, the item in blue there, the, there's an independent review panel that is investigating the feasibility of water importation projects. That investigation is happening independently by, uh, request, by large public support. And so we will receive a report documenting the findings of, of that review in September. And at that point, we will incorporate those findings into our evaluation. And then in December, we will deliver the long range plan to the State Water Resources Control Board. I also, while we're on this slide, I wanted to mention beyond delivery of the long range plan will be a subsequent, uh, more formal environmental documentation process and more in depth alternatives analysis. Uh, next slide, please. So really, we just wanted to, to share this slide to uh, let everybody know that the SSMP is in the process of expanding our team in an effort to catch up to our obligation and our commitments, and also identify that most of these new positions are located in the Salton Sea region. Uh, for context, four out of the last six recent hi hires are located within the Salton Sea region. Next slide. And over the past year, we, we've filled some critical positions um, with Miguel Hernandez, Dr. Nasir Idrisi, Mario Llanos, Tanya Marshall, myself, and John Polenko. There are short blurbs about us in, in the annual plan if you're interested, but I'll just say that we have very professional backgrounds in the areas of administration, outreach, science, and program management that are complementing each other very well. And on a personal note, I just wanted to say I'm very proud to be part of this uh, growing team. And so this is my, my last slide here. Uh, uh, next slide, please. So with our expanded staffing, the, the program is building towards meeting our growing demands. Um, that includes completing our current suite of projects and also planning future projects to catch up to our commitments and then ultimately maintaining those projects. Um, in 2022, we will increase partnering with local and federal groups and, and as well as our engagement with the public. And we will continue to construct and hopefully complete some of the projects that are currently underway discussed earlier. As we complete planning for new habitat and dust suppression projects, uh, we will uh, be working towards our goal of catching up to our 2024 requirement. And then building on the, the NEPA documentation for the 10 year plan I, I discussed earlier, we're going to build a comprehensive schedule that takes us all the way out to 2028. So, and then finally, we'll be submitting our long range plan, which will set the vision, vision for beyond 2028 and allow us to begin a subsequent environmental documentation phase. So that concludes my section. And at this point, I would like to advance to the next slide and then turn it back over to Arturo Delgado to close the SSMP presentation. Okay, thank you, James, Mario and Tanya for providing today's uh, program updates. Uh, so in closing, even though much progress has been made, significant work still remains to further suppress dust and restore habitat on exposed lake bed and catch up with the established targets. Our program success to date and moving forward would not, would not and cannot be possible without meaningful partnerships and collaboration. This is at the heart of the SS SSMP's ability to meet acreage targets and advance work towards sustainable, a, a sustainable salt and sea ecosystem. It is essential moving forward that we progress and finalize critical land access agreements crucial for, the, for project completion. We look forward to continuing this collaborative work with local, state, tribal, and federal partners to expand the acreage of completed projects in the year ahead. Thank you, and this concludes our presentation, and we'd be happy to address any questions from the board. Thank you, Mr. Delgado and the entire team. Thank you for the comprehensive and informative presentation. Do we have any questions? Yes, board member Firestone. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for the, um, the great presentation and also just the incredible team and progress. Um, you know, it's uh, pretty amazing to see how much uh, the team has grown, that we've the real commitment in the um, area around the sea itself and to 
community engagement and really meaningfully engaging and and um, working with local communities on both the um, the ten year plan and the and development of the long range plan. So just want to recognize the work that's been done. Um, I think you know I've been on the board three years and it's really remarkable um, to see how far this work has come just in that time. So appreciate the the leadership and the work of the team. And also, you know, recognizing that um, the report was uh, uh, published um, early or, uh, you know, earlier than the deadline. It, it was in both English and Spanish and there was stakeholder meetings before this and just really want to recognize all the work that went into that and how important that is and appreciative we are. Um, I had a couple questions and this was, you know, the presentation was really informative. Hopefully we can make sure it's posted because I think there was some really good summaries of information that wasn't as clear um, in the, at least to me, in the annual report, they're just different formats. So, um, uh, so some of these questions are really just kind of digging in more so that I can follow um, the I, on slide 26, um, there was some discussion or an overview of the community amenities work. And I um, wanted to make sure I was, wanted to follow up on that. Um, so it sounds like there's going, there's work on a community amenity strategy document. Is that, that's a work in progress. And can you just help understand or help me understand how that fits into um, the SSMP and the um, long range plan? This wasn't clear on that. Yeah. So where, so thank yeah, thank you very much for that, uh, board member Firestone. I'm gonna ask uh, my colleague, Mario Giannis to address that question. Mario? Uh, yeah. You... Okay, thank you. Yeah, so the the, the work's all underway already and you know, there's been multiple meetings where this topic has come up and, and uh, you know, Better World Group, our contractor who's doing this work is already working on this um, as it relates to the long range plan. Over the coming months, um, they do plan to go out into communities and engage um, through various methods and to go where communities are meeting and gathering to get information about community amenities that will inform the, the short term or the 10 year plan and the long range plan. And, and those will be, I guess, you know, I guess uh, amenities that are, that could be identified for the 10 year plan. You know, there's some already listed in the environmental assessment, the draft environmental assessment that you'll see, but we're also looking to get more feedback on, on those and develop those a little further on anything that could be incorporated into that 10 year plan uh, environmental assessment document that, that's going to be coming out soon um, for feedback. And so as much detail as you can provide on that around community amenities would be helpful. Um, and then uh, larger community amenities or, or maybe some that don't really fit into the 10 year plan because they're more ambitious or expand beyond the sea, but kind of have a relation to the sea would, um, you know, somehow be incorporated into the long range plan. And that would, um, you know, that would happen through, you know, a series of, of um, well, Better World Group informing that plan and, and merging that concept, that the concept paper or the strategies document to that, to that, um, um, long range plan committee and somehow incorporating it into the final report, but also there'll be ample time as that long range plan gets developed to continue to develop these strategies. Um, I mean, the, the community amenities around the long range plan for the seat. So um, I hope that answered your question. I was so kind both. of all over the place. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So, so really for both and just the formal document I just missed is that, um, is there, the strategies document, is there a timeline for that? Um, and it sounds like there's a lot of work going on to inform this topic, well, to develop that and inform both the, the environmental assessment and SSNMP, but also the long range plan. So it, just the timeline for the document, I just wasn't clear on 
when that was? There, there's still quite a bit of work to do, and we're anticipating that uh, possibly fall of uh, this year or later, um, hopefully by the end of the year, to have, have that document. Great. Great. Okay. Um, let's see. One of the, uh, you know, well, I guess um, two topics that I, I I know you all hit on in the report and also on some of the comment letters. Um, one key one, obviously, is um, land access. <laughs> and so I'm wondering, uh, you know, I think uh, probably a theme for this whole um, workshop in some ways, because there's so much, really all of the work and the progress hinges on that um, in a really fundamental way. So just um, wondering if there's uh, lessons learned or key milestones you think um, we are, are worth highlighting um, now to make sure that we are able to stay on track. Um, and, and I think just looking for um, maybe some regular updates or check-ins to make sure that we're making the, the pace and progress on the land access that we need to, to be able to, to meet all of those really ambitious goals that, that you all have set forth. Uh, so thank you for that question, um, Board Member Firestone. I think, I mean, honestly, I think that's probably one of the most important um, issues that uh, we're contending with at this point in time. The success of our program is highly reliant on our ability to uh, timely secure land access and, and get uh, control of uh, patients to actually implement projects. Um, as uh, my colleague Tonga Marshall mentioned, if we have very little the state owns very little land at the Salton Sea. In fact, 80% of the land mass out there at the Salton Sea is owned by either the federal government or IID. Um, so it's important that we uh, work in a cooperative, collaborative manner with, with those two major landowners. Uh, last year, you know, this last year we did make progress uh, and we continue to make progress with our partners and the major landowners. Uh, we've developed um, <clears throat> Template land access agreements. Uh, uh, we did secure land access from the Bureau of Reclamation, and I think that serves as a path forward on how we can continue to work with them to, to secure additional land access for, for future projects. Uh, at the same time, we, we continue to work with uh, our partners at IID to secure land access. Uh, we're currently working with them to secure an additional 400 acres of land access for uh, to expand our veg enhancement project. I think we're, we're getting close to uh, actually having that easement in place uh, over the coming, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic over the coming weeks. Uh, I think we, we've also had high level discussions with uh, leadership at IIT around uh, developing, using the template for not only the SCH uh, easement, but also for this veg enhancement easement that we're working on now uh, as a template to serve as a kind of for a master agreement moving forward. So I guess I'm cautiously optimistic that we can be able to move forward on that. Um, I'm going to stop there and maybe turn it over to my colleague, James Newcomb, to see if he has any additional thoughts around your question. James? Yeah, thank you, Arturo. I think that was really comprehensive. And the only thing that I would like to add is that um, as we're expanding our, our team, uh, we will be uh, looking to have somebody in charge of a contract that will take a look at our previous real estate strategies and any potential new strategies uh, moving forward, um, building on things like programmatic or programmatic or master type agreements and hoping that we can get um, you know, even more traction uh, in the coming year on, on how we approach land access agreements. Great. Um, another topic I, I am interested in and I saw in some of the comment letters was really questions around water budgets. And I know, you know, there's um, obviously needs around uh, water right permits that, that will have to be working with you all on for at least temporary water for projects, I think in some cases. Um, but there's a lot of uh, work going on in projects that, um, whether it's for vegetation or habitat, and it, I, I'm just wondering if you could speak to the water needs um, for those projects a bit, and this could be something for future if you, if it 
doesn't work to to give information now. But I think um, better understanding water needs and um, budgets, sources, demands um, for the the projects, both in terms of immediate needs, but also um, I'm thinking particularly long term. Obviously, there's less and less water. <laughs> it's the 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 um, the problem here, and so just understanding what um, what sort of water access is going to be needed to ensure those projects are sustainable. Yeah, so maybe I'll take a quick stab at that, and then uh, I can ask my colleagues uh, to weigh in with any additional input. Uh, I think the water budget question, water supply question, is a, a very again that's another really significant, important factor that we need to consider in our planning efforts. Uh, just to be candid here, I mean, I. I frankly expected to have to be a little bit further along with developing um, our 10 year plan NEPA document, uh, really relying on that document to really help inform uh, the rest of our projects to build up the 30,000 acres. And without having that document, I mean, this is why it's absolutely essential and critical that we get uh, good public feedback on the type of projects, the location of the projects that they want to see as part of this 10 year plan. Uh, and so they're going to have an opportunity to weigh in on that uh, once we release the draft, once the core releases the draft environmental assessment. It's really difficult to actually put together a water budget without knowing exactly what the type of projects are going to be, you know, whether it's uh, how much. I know we I know we need to do 15,000 acres of aquatic open uh, habitat, for example, but then, you know, in addition to that, how many acres of wetlands are we going to construct? Fresh wetlands, for example, how many acres of, of edge enhancement? So until we get clarity on that, it's really hard and difficult and challenging to come up with uh, an exact water budget. So I think for me, the key is to finish up our environmental assessment, and I think by the tail end of this year, we'll be better positioned to start informing a more accurate water, water budget for the ten-year plan at a minimum. Concurrently, I know that James and team are working on uh, revisiting. Um, projected future inflows into the sea to help shape and inform our long range plan. So maybe I'll just stop there and maybe ask James to kind of add any additional thoughts uh, on top of mine. Yeah, thank you, Arturo. So uh, water supply availability is a, is a primary concern, uh, you know, within the long range plan. We're evaluating that risk really under our efficiency categories. Um, and so uh, there's there's no prescribed at this point um, method that we have for evaluating that efficiency, but we will have a, a broad range of, of concepts all involving different water supply needs. Um, we are incorporating aspects of, of climate change and we plan to have our um, water supply reliability uh, reviewed by uh, uh, experts and also uh, members of the Long Range Plan Committee. And I think one of the things that we'll, we'll uh, maybe um, shed some light that hasn't been done previously is that I think water supply tends to be looked at uh, statically and we're going to be looking at kind of interseason, uh, you know, variability, sorry, annual variability uh, looking forward with the impacts of climate change and identifying, you know, how often we're seeing the uh, necessary conditions in all of our restoration areas based on that future outlook. So um, there's still a lot of work to be done there uh, as, we, as we move forward in, into developing those evaluation criteria and as we get our uh, water forecast period. Back. But um, that's currently where we're at. Great, thank you. That's really helpful. Um, and that just, I guess, is related to my last question. Um, and maybe this is just a clarification. One of the issues that was brought up in one of the comment letters I just wanted to better understand is um, the, the post-2024 project um, kind of pipeline and plans. Can you just speak more to how how that um, sort of the timing and process for how those projects in the second half of the tenure <laughs> um, of the SSMP after 2025 um, will be, or 2024, um, how that will be developed so that we're, you know, on track for 
the the rest of the years. As I, I know the focus is let's get on track 2024 as it should be and is a lot of work, but just if you can help me understand how what what are we doing to get in place the um the pipeline for after that and staying on track. Yeah, I, I think I can take a, a quick stab at that. Um yeah, we did address that in our annual report. So I, for starters, I wanted to make sure that we identified kind of our set of projects on how we get caught up by 2024. So we've done that. That's in the annual report. In addition to that, we've also stated in our annual report that, uh, and this, again, is tied to the completion of, of our environmental assessment. Um, I fully expect that we'll, be, uh, we'll have that document completed by the end of this year. Once we have that completed, then be able to more accurately uh, identify the exact projects that are going to be implemented after 2024. And so I fully expect to build out that schedule through 2028. Uh, moreover, on top of that, uh, once we get caught up, and I, I totally understand it, it is a very ambitious schedule to, to be to get caught up by 2024, but we're going to do our due diligence to, caught, to get caught up. I, I don't think we have an option not to. Um, and again, this is really tied to uh, getting timely land access uh, for us to be able to have success in getting there. Um, but after we complete our environmental assessment, we'll put together um, the rest of our projects through 2028. Um, and the idea there is that once we um, get caught up by 2024, we'll stay on track and be able to deliver the, the remaining acreage by the end of 2028. Great, thanks so much, really helpful. Thank you. Board Member Wire. Yes, I want to thank you all for the, the really good comprehensive presentation and all the progress that's been made over the past three years. Uh, like Board Member Firestone, I've also been on the board for three years, so really have seen a transformational uh, and really exponential increase in the amount of the clarity of the, the annual report, the information that's being conveyed, the strength of your team, and the progress that's being made out in the field, which is really where it matters most. And so thank you for all that. And I, I want to be mindful, you know, I, I could ask you a lot of questions, but I want to be mindful of, uh, we have a number of panels today and a lot of commenters. So I'm going to just ask you one question and it will probably sound familiar uh, to other questions I have asked in prior uh, um, meetings, but this goes down to uh, kind of the rea my reaction to Secretary Crowfoot's initial comments about the state water board's role here in this process. And it's really one of accountability. And so when we look at, uh, when I think about accountability, it's, you know, how are we tracking uh, progress that's being made to achieving the ultimate goals of the SSMP, which I think Mr. Delgado, as you said, was, um, and sorry if I get the acreage wrong, but close to 30,000 acres, uh, of which, you know, 50% of that roughly is for aquatic habitat and 50% is for uh, vegetation dust suppression projects. So, you know, when I look at the annual report, I mean, I think there's a lot of great information in here. I'm really excited to see all the projects you have underway, but I, I still am having a hard time sort of parsing through that and really understanding what portion of the projects that are even planned over the next couple of years really are habitat versus dust suppression. Uh, how many are um, of those projects are just are kind of interim dust suppression projects versus long-term. And I, I realize you have a lot underway with the EA and all those long-term efforts will have some bearing on that, but I'm hoping you can, you can shed some light on that and maybe um, a commitment to in the future, you know, maybe next year's report really uh, spell it out a little bit more clearly. So I can, when I read it, I have a better understanding of what types of projects are being constructed and how much progress we're making for each of those submetrics. Yeah, thank you so much for the question, Board Member McGuire. Yeah, and I, I remember us having this conversation last year, and I think I did commit that we would try to spell out in a, a little bit more clarity around how many acres of aquatic versus veg enhancement. And again, I hate to kind of uh, rely on this this particular response, but I think it's 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 really true. Um, this is really tied to really getting clarity around exactly what's going to make up. Uh, the remainder of our 30,000 acres that's going to be informed uh, through this uh, NEPA EA process that we intend to complete this year. Uh, I think by the end of this year, we'll have a lot more clarity around exactly, you know, how many acres of aquatic habitat we're going to have, how many acres of those projects that fall under the dust suppression category we're going to have. And I think I'll be, I'll be better positioned to be able to describe uh, 
describe that in more detail next year. Uh, I think the projects that we presented today, uh, if you think about the projects that are currently underway, we have the SCH, that's an aquatic habitat, it's 4,100 acres. Our veg enhancement project, albeit a habitat project for desert habitat, is it would not qualify under the, the way that the stipulated water order is written as uh, habitat, so it would fall under dust suppression, that's 1,700 acres. And then we've identified another 8,000 acres that are currently planned. Uh, through 2024, I think roughly, it, just off the top of my head right now, I think roughly uh, of those 8,000 acres, I'm going to say about 75% of that is aquatic habitat projects. So that's, those are just kind of rough numbers. Okay, well, that's, that's really helpful. And, and maybe maybe what, I look forward to the, 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 re, the updated report next year. And I'll just I'll point out, I'm looking specifically at table two uh, in your report. And uh, it has it's called the SSMP project summary table. And so that's the one that I'm I'm trying to get a little bit use that table. I rely on that pretty heavily for tracking the metrics in terms of what's been completed and what's planned. So you might think about expanding that in the future just to provide that additional detail. But thank you. That's really helpful. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate the, the feedback. All right. Good questions. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, so um, the next part of the workshop includes a series of panels comprised of various agencies and organizations involved with the Salton Sea. And we're um, just gonna take panel, uh, the first panel, um, and then after that, we will take a 10 minute break just for planning purposes. And then we'll come back and do the remaining panels. And I believe um, before going to public comment, then we'll have um, a 30 minute break. So the first panel will be the Colorado Regional Water Board with their presentation provided by Paula Rasmussen, Executive Officer to the Colorado River Basin Regional Board. Good afternoon, members of the board and members of the public. Good I'm afternoon, Ms. Rasmussen. We're having some difficulty hearing you. Can you hear me any better now? Yes, that's better. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'm Paula Rasmussen, and I'm the Executive Officer of the Colorado River Basin Regional Water Board. I'd like to thank you for including the Regional Board in this workshop. Next slide, please. This presentation will provide a status update on Regional Board activities, progress since the last workshop, and discuss activities that are planned for the next year. These will focus on the triennial review, coordination with the California Natural Resources Agency, the New River Improvement Project, and the Irrigated Lands Program. Next slide, please. The Water Quality Control Plan, referred to as the Basin Plan, is the central regulatory document for ensuring water quality in the Colorado River Basin region. The plan describes and defines the Regional Water Board's activities. It contains beneficial uses, water quality objectives to pr protect the beneficial uses, implementation agreements, monitoring plans, and other policies in effect. As a living document, it is subject to changes as needed to reflect the status of water bodies or revised objectives. Next slide, please. To meet federal and state requirements, the Regional Water Board must review the Basin Plan every three years in what's called the Triennial Review. The Triennial Review develops a ranked list of projects that would result in potential changes to the Basin Plan. The latest Triennial Review list includes projects to be developed between 2021 and 2023. The ranking criteria were identified based on public input and board priorities. For the 2020 Triennial Review, two major ranking criteria for the projects included whether the project addresses impairments affecting the Salton Sea and whether it addresses water quality issues in environmental justice communities. Because the fate of the Salton Sea is a key environmental justice issue, the majority of the top rank, ranking projects are within the Salton Sea watershed. Next slide, please. 
Most of the Salton Sea projects on the 2020 triennial review list are total maximum daily loads, or TMDLs. These are water pollution control plans that must be developed to address water quality impairments, which are identified on the 303D list of impaired waters. The Salton Sea watershed TMDLs are shown here, and many of these are in development by the regional board. Next slide, please. There are two other projects prioritized in the Triana Review, which involve basin plan amendments to review or establish beneficial uses as shown here. Beneficial uses describe how each water body is used. Examples of beneficial uses include municipal and domestic supply or wildlife habitat. Next slide, please. This regional water board is coordinating closely with the CNRA as it implements the Salton Sea Management Program. Many of the projects proposed in the SSMP 10-year plan will involve dredge or fill activities that require a water quality certification or dredge or fill permit and enrollment in the stormwater construction general permit. Regional board staff meet and confer frequently with natural resources agency staff on these activities. Next slide, please. Aquatic habitat restoration projects will require water board permits, including water quality certification and stormwater construction general permits. The species conservation habitat restoration project that began construction in January 2021 required an amendment to the existing Clean Water Act Section 401 water quality certification that was issued in 2013. A water quality certification amendment in order for the Species Conservation Habitat Project was issued by this regional board in December 2020. Dust suppression and restoration projects will also require regional water board permits, including dredge or fill permits and enrollment in the construction stormwater general permit. Regional water board staff meet bi-weekly with CNRA staff for project updates and to ensure permitting, monitoring, and project implementation is moving forward. Next slide, please. The Regional Water Board is coordinated with CNRA on water quality monitoring needs and implementation. Staff were involved during the development of the monitoring and implementation plan, advising on monitoring and data needs for water quality assessment. Data will be needed to assess beneficial use attainment as aquatic habitat restoration projects are completed in order to develop water quality standards. In addition, the Regional Water Board will need data specific to the water pollution control plans that have been prioritized in the 2020 Triennial Review. Staff from both agencies are engaging to discuss plans for water quality monitoring. And the Regional War Board participates in the Salton Sea Management Program Long Range Plan Committee, which is established by CNRA. Next slide, please. The New River Improvement Project implements phase one of the New River Strategic Plan, which was developed by the California-Mexico Border Relations Council. The strategic plan looked at the entirety of the New River with a phased approach for recommended programs and projects to address water quality issues. The New River Improvement Project focuses on the Calexico Reach. Next slide, please. This regional water board oversaw the design contract for phase one, which includes a trash screen, a bypass encasement for the flows of the New River, and a pump back system as shown on this map. This project will di divert New River water flows underground to bypass the city of Calexico. The city of Calexico, as the lead agency for the project, is currently working with permitting agencies to move the New River Improvement Project forward. Regional Water Board permitting includes 401 water quality certification, construction dewatering waste discharge requirements, 
the general stormwater construction permit and a modification to the NPDES permit for the city of Calexico's wastewater treatment plant to change the, lo the location of the discharge. The 401 water quality certification was issued in January of 2022. Permit applications for construction, dewatering, waste discharge requirements, and the general stormwater construction permit will be submitted by the city as needed. And a permit application has been received for the modification to the NPDES permit and additional information is pending from the city. The revision to the NPDES permit is expected to be completed during fiscal year 22-23. And the city of Calexico is starting the bid process for this project and anticipates that construction will start this summer. Next slide, please. Within this regional water board's jurisdiction, there are two irrigated lands that are within the Salton Sea watershed, Coachella Valley and Imperial Valley. These irrigated lands had conditional waivers of waste discharge requirements in place to control the waste discharges from agricultural lands. And the regional water board replaced the conditional waivers with general orders that incorporate the precedential requirements of the Eastern San Joaquin order. A general order for the Coachella Valley was adopted by this regional board in the fall of 2020. And a general order for the Imperial Valley was adopted in December of 2021. Next slide, please. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Rasmussen. Any questions? Board Member Firestone. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, I, you know, I'm I'm the liaison with Region Seven. Um, I really um, appreciate how much work the small team down there does, um, and how closely you're coordinating with CNRA on these projects. Um, it's pretty incredible, um, as well as with. Um, on the the other the the new river project, I think just shows a real commitment from the board to to these priorities um, and making sure that we're um, all moving forward collectively as quickly as possible. So really appreciate that, um, and just want to recognize that. Um, I had a couple questions. Um, one is so let's see, going back to slide six, um, you talked about uh, basin plan amendment being needed um, and, and prioritized within the triennial review um, for uh, a beneficial use designation for salt and sea constructed aquatic habitat. So is that is that for the aquatic habitats that um, are likely to be part of these projects or is that for for something else and maybe can you just give a sense of I, I know it's a big deal to do a basin plan amendment so just understanding if that needs to be in place um for these projects and um and what that looks like this, these uh, amendments will be for the projects that are going to be constructed and it's going to work together as the as the uh project are constructed then we'll be able to gather data to look at the quality of water in those habitats and use that data to determine, you know, the beneficial uses and the um, the requirements that we need to put in our basin plan. So it, it really works together with the work that CNRA is doing right now. Okay, great. So that's um, so it sounds like the timelines are synced up, and and adoption in twenty twenty four would. Be would enable the schedule of um, projects that CNRA has planned. Correct. Okay. Um, another question is: I, um, you know, some of the the community commenters um, in different, well, in, in part for this hearing, um, uh, flagged nutrients and harmful algal blooms. Um, and I saw on slide five that um, there's 
a number of TMDLs uh, in the docket under the triennial review that include nutrients. I'm just wondering if you can say a little bit more about, um, about the regional board's um, work, how these TMDLs might help to address um, or at least get get the ball rolling to um, to address nutrients and harmful algal blooms and, and what you see that looking like. Wow, thank you. What we're looking at with the, these TMDLs specifically, and you could look at say, for example, um, the New River ammonia nutrients is to start addressing the constituents that are in the tributaries to the Salton Sea and look at improving and addressing the water quality. Uh, so the nutrients that would be addressed under the New River um, TMDL would ad address the nutrients and the toxicity and identify impacts in, in the New River, but because it's tributary to the Salton Sea, ultimately would be protective of the Salton Sea. So we're starting in the tributaries. And the harmful algal blooms, you know, also should be impacted by these TMDLs because of the nutrient flows from those tributaries. Great, and I, I you know, I, I know there's a, a lot of public process around TMDL development. So I think there'll be a, a lot of opportunity for engagement around those um, for folks that are that are impacted and concerned. Um, so last question is, uh, I, See, I'm going to make sure I'm using the right term here, um, or maybe I won't. I'll just <laughs> use the wrong term. Um, the monitoring implementation plan, that was um, the term I was looking for. So uh, I know there's been some challenges because um, there's no one agency that is uh, doing or coordinating all the different monitoring, water quality monitoring um, throughout the Salton Sea area. And there's um, different kind of focuses and limitations on um, efforts around water quality monitoring. So I'm wondering if um, you, let me, I wonder if the, um, if you feel like the monitoring implementation plan or long range plan um, and that coordination, I, there's, you know, also obviously a lot of other agencies on the federal side that are doing water quality monitoring that I think are part of that coordination with that group. Just wondering if you feel like that's something that can help to um, consolidate and coordinate the water quality monitoring that is going on so that it's easier to, to follow and ensure that there's um, kind of long-term tracking uh, and sort of more comprehensive coordination and understanding of wa water quality monitoring. Um, it, it, do you think that that lies there? Um, what, how do you see the opportunity for that? It will certainly help. Um, the, I'm, I don't know if it's going to pull in all of the monitoring and all of the entities, but where we can look at monitoring overall in terms of some of the needs that we have for the monitoring and the needs of CNRA in terms of their, their water quality monitoring, it's, it's going to help. Whether or not it's going to be the comprehensive uh, one-stop shopping, say, for monitoring, I'm not sure. So that's something that maybe we can take a closer look at as we go forward with that. Great. Great. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you, Ms. Rasmussen. Useful information. All right. Now we're going to take a 10-minute break. And I just want to mention that uh, we are running a bit behind schedule. And so I'd like to request that our remaining panelists be mindful of their speaking time to help ensure that everyone gets a chance to speak today, especially since the public comments come at the end. And we do have quite a few um, individuals that have signed up for public comment. So just be thinking of ways that you could um, maybe shorten your presentations a bit, especially if some of this information has already been covered or you know, just in reference to something that's already been covered. Thank you so much and we will return at 425.
Okay, we are back. Now we'll move on to um, air quality. This next panel consists of staff from two local air districts that cover the Salton Sea. Andrea Polidori, Director of Monitoring and Analysis with the South Coast Air Quality Management District and Matt Desert, Air Pollution Control Officer with the Imperial County Air Pollution Control District. And again, just a reminder to um, move through your presentation as quickly as possible. I'm really concerned that we're um, going to be shorting community members. And so I think the only way we can avoid from doing that is to move along quickly at this point. Absolutely, yes. And uh, um, thank you for inviting me today. Again, my name is Andrea Polidori, Director of Monitoring and Analysis South Coast AQMD. And uh, I will give you a quick presentation on our uh, air monitoring activities in the uh, Iscoachala Valley as part of the 
uh, of uh, the AB 617 uh, program. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, the East Coachella Valley Community Steering Committee um, has identified six air quality priorities to be addressed through the development and implementation of a community emission reduction plan or SERP and a related community air monitoring plan or CAMP. So these air quality priorities are, um, I mean, of course, the salt on sea, uh, open burning and illegal dumping, pesticides, diesel mobile sources, fugitive road dust and off-roading, uh, and green and the green leaf desert view uh, power plant. Next, please. So uh, on this slide, I have summarized the three main uh, emission reduction goals that identified by the community steering committee to address issues that are related to the Salton Sea specifically. So these these goals are. Uh, improved monitoring and notification uh, through uh, basically supplementing exi existing air monitoring activity by adding new air monitoring equipment for the measurements of particulate matter and H2S. Uh, the goal two uh, and goal three are about reducing emission by, by pursuing collaboration uh, to improve the emission inventory, support dust suppression project, but also personal funding opportunities for home weatherization and air filtration systems in residential homes and schools. Next, please. Uh, the main emission reduction actions that are needed to accomplish those three goals um, are the following. Uh, establishing baseline air monitoring to better characterize the composition of fugitive dust emissions and to distinguish uh, between uh, the contribution of dust from uh, uh, the desert areas and from the playa. Uh, also, pursue collaboration with local universities, such as University of uh, California Riverside, uh, to support uh, the study of uh, soil and chemical microbiome composition in the salt and sea, uh, and also with our agency to support the implementation of dust suppression projects. Um, also, um, another type of action and activities is to basically provide expertise for the implementation of the Salton Sea Management Program and provide expertise to land use agencies for new development projects such as um, near the Salton Seas. Next, please. Uh, this is, uh, um, I mean, essentially, it's a uh, highlight of uh, um, our of the implementation of our air monitoring plan. And, uh, um, you know, we began uh, air monitoring in East Coachella Valley about a year and a half ago. And, uh, uh, you know, we are very active on these fronts. And, uh, you know, within the community, we, are, we already have, uh, uh, you know, discussions with, we have established a monitoring working team to have conversation of a more technical nature with people that, uh, members of the community and of the steering committee that are particularly interested in monitoring. Uh, we are uh, basically collaborating with the ARB, DPR, OHIA, uh, to develop a strategy for pesticide monitoring throughout the entire community. Uh, we added several monitoring locations for uh, particulate matter, both PN2.5 and PN10, but especially H2S, which is extremely relevant uh, to better understand activities uh, near the Salton Sea and the impact of Salton Sea emissions. Um, we also developed what is called the sensor network um, and I'll show you, you know, later on, uh, uh, like in the next slides, you know, kind of the extent of this network. But in essence, we are using low-cost sensors for measuring PM 2.5, PM 10, ozone, and NOx throughout the entire community. Um, and we are also doing, uh, um, you know, composition study to better understand, um, you know, the, the main component of uh, uh, the dust near the Salton Sea. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, this is again, you know, was supposed to be a quick overview and, uh, you know, I'm ending the presentation with a map uh, that shows the uh, added air monitoring locations uh, in East Coachella Valley. You know, we used to have only the Indio and the Mecca site, but at this point we have enhanced the Indio and the Mecca sites with additional monitoring and we have developed a sensor network and we are also in the process of adding more instrumentation. So this is just a table for your reference kind of highlighting the type of instruments and measurements that we are conducting in ECV. And uh, I, I promised I would keep it, uh, you know, short and straight to the point. And this concludes my presentation. And uh, at any point in time, I would be more than happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. We appreciate that. Thank you so much.
Next, Mr. Desert. Yes, uh -huh. good afternoon. And thank you for the opportunity to pre present. Is the slide up? My name is Matt. My name is Matt Desert. I'm the air pollution control officer for Imperial County. Next slide, please. Following now is a series of slides that have been recycled quite a bit, and they're not meant to challenge anybody's number on the acres of exposed land. They're meant to enhance the awareness of what a large project this is and what an expansive number of acres of playa are going to be re released in the near future. Mm -hmm. The state's presentation today was wonderful with the progress that's going forward and the idea that catching up by 2024. The Air District Natural Resources for their, their efforts. Next slide, please. Again, these slides follow the southern portion of the Salton Sea, the portion that's going to have the most exposed playa is going to be Imperial County. We need more projects on the ground. Heard the details about land leasing right away. Permit requirements. We understand it takes time. But the problem is we need to keep projects on the pipeline. And the next, the next big project would be the New River Enhancement, nearly 4,000 acres. There it is. Strongly encourages that project to move forward and following in the footsteps of the SCH project success. Next slide, please. Again, these numbers aren't meant to challenge anyone's uh, presentation thus far. They're just meant to show the large exacerbating numbers of playa acres that are going to be exposed. <laughs> Next slide. Now we're looking at some of our rule for enforcement daunting task the size of the Salton Sea and we're a small air pollution control district, but we're doing our best. Next slide. So the purpose of the regulation 800 is to, to reduce the amount of fine particulate matter PM10 entrained in the ambient air. I don't need to read the rest of the slide to you for time's sake, but these are the core of our rules and the core of our responsibilities. And again, it's a daunting task. Next slide, please. Specific to our rules is rule 804. The purpose of this regulation is to reduce the amount of fine particulate matter entrained in ambient air as a result of emissions generated from open areas. And the Salton Sea is considered an open area. That is, it's considered man-made. We, we hope to do this by requiring actions to prevent, reduce, or mitigate PM10 emissions. And again, we're looking at parcels of property three acres of size or larger. Next slide. Best available control measures. These are hard standards to come up with and to live with, but that's the best we have to work with. One, we apply and maintain water or dust suppressants to all vegetated areas. Two, establish 50% vegetation coverage on all previously disturbed areas. Three, pave, apply and maintain gravel or apply and maintain chemical stabilization suppressants. Four, implement alternative vacuum 
for exposed playa at the Salton Sea if, if approved by both the APCD and the EPA. Alternative vacuum may be technical evaluation demonstrating that the proposed alternative vacuum achieves a stabilized surface of 20% opacity. So we want to be creative. We want to work with everybody and, and get solutions at the Salton Sea because it is so large. And it is so large in the Imperial County portion of the, of the Salton Sea. Next slide. We have the JPA that we look to for assistance and direction. We visit members of the IID, the San Diego Water Authority, and the, Co the Coachella Water District. That's the QSA Joint Powers of Your Authority. Next slide. And then we also look to the natural resources in California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And we appreciate and applaud the success that's going on this year with the SCH project, Tule Lake, Clubhouse, and some other ones that haven't been named. Next slide. Here's some dust emissions off of a playa at the Salton Sea. And living down and being around the Salton Sea, it's just so expansive. I, it just words can't describe how large this issue is. Next slide. More PM emissions from an open area. Next slide. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Um, I, any questions? So uh, I'll just say, as a as a former member of the Air Resources Board, um, I um, I think you intended to raise the alarm, Mr. Um, Desert, but also to indicate uh, your collaboration um, with the Resources Agency and the other uh, partners. Um, I would just ask, Mr. Delgado, that um, in next year's report. We look at this issue a little more closely in terms of the alignment of um, of your uh, basin plan and um, and the uh, short range and long term plan, just so we could get a better sense of um, the ability to meet these requirements that you have um, in your PM10 plan, and specifically the concerns that I have also are related to. Uh, the regulated community and your district's ability to um, enforce your rules where you have, you know, three acre parcels where, you know, you're, you're regulating them, but then there, there's this overwhelming presence coming from the Salton Sea. So just want to make sure that you have the tools uh, that you need to be able to continue to um, enforce across the board and to get some assistance with messaging. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, now we'll move on to uh, local entities. Uh, Tina Shields with um, Water Manager Imperial Irrigation District, Esperanza Colio Warren, Deputy County Executive Officer from Imperial County, and Patrick O'Dowd, Executive Director for the Salton Sea Authority. Ms. Shields. Do we have Ms. Shields on the platform? Hi, this is Tina Shields. Can you hear me? Okay, there we go. Yes. Hi, um, you already mentioned my name already. I'm Tina Shields and I currently serve as one of two managers of the Imperial Irrigation District's Water Department. I've worked at IID for nearly 30 years in a wide variety of water supply and conservation programs related to the Colorado River, including the QSA water transfer since their inception. So I'm here today to speak on IID's mitigation program, our air quality projects, but I would be remiss not to first thank the board for continuing to hold these annual workshops to check on progress. And of course, to the State Natural Resource Agency and DWR for not only their efforts to date, but the pace and the progress that we've seen in the last couple of years is 
uh, quite remarkable from where we were five or 10 years ago. Next slide, please. So IID has a salt and sea air quality mitigation program that was developed in coordination with the County Air Pollution Control District. It is a proactive, comprehensive, science-based, adaptive management style program that detects, locates, assesses, and identifies options to mitigate dust emissions from the exposed playa. My presentation will focus on providing an update as to the status of the exposed playa acreage, the area's emissions, the dust control implementation progress our agency has made, and planning for future projects. Next slide. With regard to the currently exposed playa, each year IID's team of experts assess the end of year aerial imagery to determine the playa exposure. They compare it to the previous year's um, documentation. At the end of 2021, it was determined that there was just under 28,000 acres of additional playa that had been exposed since the 2003 baseline period when the QSA agreements were executed. This represents an increase of about 2,100 acres over the last year, but of the approximate 28,000 acres of total playa exposure, it's about 10,000 acres less than we had project, uh, projected in our earlier modeling exercises. Uh, this really isn't surprising given the wide variety of basin inputs, and it's still within the range of the model error, but I think in circumstances such as this where the state's had a late start and we're trying to catch up on acreage milestones, it certainly gives us a little bit of a, a breather to, to maybe catch up and, and hit those targets in the future. Of the playa acreage, about 25% of it, or 7,200 acres, is heavily vegetated naturally as a result of flow patterns as the shoreline has receded and the drains naturally flow out and connect themselves. We've seen a lot of this naturally occurring vegetation and while helpful, it oftentimes gets in the way of these projects that we're trying to implement and efforts to reroute the water. And I think you saw that in some of the graphics the state showed you with regard to their species conservation habitat project. Uh, next slide, please. With regard to the current playa emissions, uh, we have a very technical, rigorous process to create an annual emissions estimate not just for the salt and sea area itself, but also the surrounding desert, which is a huge source of emissions for the basin as a whole. Our team has developed an extensive data collection and monitoring network that includes six air quality monitoring stations, meteorological towers, and 360 degree, degree cameras to measure and model wind and dust emissions. This team also conducts site visits and field work to look at these emissions, both from the desert and the playa, and has created models to show both where the dust is coming from and where it's going to. Using all of these data inputs, over 12,000 alone summarized on this slide, it allows us to make exciting decisions and prioritize the areas where the dust control project should go in order to have the greatest effectiveness. Next slide, please. We've been fortunate so far that playa emissions have not grown at the same rate as the exposed playa. However, we're starting to see indications of an upward trend over the last five years. You kind of have to exclude the 1920 data set because the emissions were unusually low that year. This graphic indicates the low to high PM10 emissions based on the colors ranging from green to yellow to red, with the orange to red areas being the higher emission areas. As you can see from the consolidated data, the desert emissions continue to be a very large dust source in our region, overwhelming the playa emissions by two orders of magnitude. With regard to the most recent annual estimate in uh, 2021, the playa contributions were less than 450 tons of particulate matter, while the desert emissions contributed over 30,000 tons, which is more than 60 times the playa contribution. I think the concerns from local residents looking ahead, though, is as that shoreline exposes and the acreage increases, you just see a greater annual potential every year for um, the area to continue to add to the basin emissions estimate. Next slide, please. This graphic shows in red and orange the areas with the highest emissions potential centered around and adjacent to the sea. You will note that they are located primarily on the southern end of the Salton Sea where the shoreline is more shallow. 
and the more challenging areas on the western side, which are adjacent to the encroaching desert soils where the water supply options are more limited. So it makes it very challenging to try to address these uh, emissions potential. Uh, one of the interesting things is if you look at the data, and this table attempts to summarize um, that and really focus our efforts, is that only 30% of the exposed playa acreage contributes nearly 90% of the total emissions. This allows the implementation efforts to focus on a smaller targeted area, but one that will maximize the air quality project benefits. To say it another way, project siting decisions alone can have an increased public health benefit, even if the acreage milestones are met. Next slide. This is a super busy but effective graphic that illustrates the implementation progress all of the agencies have made in collaboration with another um, and really tries to hone in on what IID in particular has accomplished. We have approximately 2,000 acres of IID implemented projects with another 700 plus acres of state projects, which are currently mitigating about 62% of the playa emissions. Our implementation team has identified another 1,250 acres of watch areas. These are lands that, while not currently emissive, have the potential to become emissive in the future as the site conditions change. Lastly, in our three-step process, there are another 1,000 acres in the design and permitting uh, queue. We have the goal of implementing those projects in the next year or so with another 3,700 acres of exposed playa identified for projects that are more than one year out. Next slide, please. With regard to those near-term projects that are set to occur within the next year, we have uh, three locations that comprise uh, close to 1,000 acres of emission control projects that will be implemented using surface roughing techniques initially. Uh, you see on this map here, the Poe Road site on the southwest side of the sea, the Bombay Beach on the eastern side, and the Mundo site further to the southeast. These projects are currently in the uh, fully designed uh, queue and they're being solicited or waiting for bids to be awarded to IAD contractors to implement. So we expect most of these to be completed in the next um, probably two to three months. Next slide, please. Looking ahead, we've identified another 3,700 acres for future emissions control projects or various stages of project implementation. Uh, including the clubhouse and the San Felipe areas. And you'll see a lot of these areas tend to overlap with areas the state is looking at. Um, in many cases, we will have hopefully complementary projects and they're gonna abut up next to one another. Um, and a lot of this is piloting to see what works in certain areas and what new techniques we can identify to address the potential challenges in those areas. Uh, in particular on the Western side of the Salton Sea, as I mentioned earlier, water becomes a critical element that's missing because those drain flows don't push up far enough along the western side. So you have to look at dust control projects that don't involve water. Could you go ahead and move to the next slide, please? But there are, there are alternatives to water supply sources and that is groundwater that while somewhat failing in the area would still be a sufficient quality to establish plants and uh, get those root zones down deep enough to tap into them. Uh, more recently, earlier this year, we had a grant funded by reclamation where we installed a test well at the clubhouse site. You see some pictures of that here. It's been pretty successful and our preliminary data indicates that the groundwater is sufficient elevation and water quality that we could uh, replace that test well with a production well and use that to establish vegetation. And so that is keen into our project design and allowing us to move forward with looking at this alternative water supply for this specific area. Next slide. And also in that San Felipe area and on the Eastern side, there's some test well locations that we're working on with reclamation. And I think the state has a few of those as well. With regard to planning future activities, um, this is super critical when we talked about the pipeline of how we ensure that we have sufficient project, projects moving forward. Um, in 2021, IED began collecting data on lands that will be exposed in the future. Um, this information will be used to guide those planning activities and proactive implementations of emissions control projects. We have ongoing collaborative efforts, not only with the state, but with Reclamation, Audubon, the Pacific Institute, and CDFW, supporting the design and construction of water efficient emissions control projects. 
And what we're looking at here in a San Felipe wash project is some sort of a demonstration project that attempts to transition the area from the water that has naturally drained there into a more efficient spreading of that water. So while there is inadvertent emergent habitat already occurring, we'd like to use that same water supply source over a much larger acreage. So we have a lot more effectiveness for that uh, limited supply of water. So we're gonna be working to advance this project as one of the longer term habitat, uh, excuse me, not habitat, depth control projects. Um, there also is some potential for habitat for shorebirds, but it's not gonna be as much of a wet habitat as a dry habitat. Next slide, please. As my presentation concludes, I do want to end by reconnecting these bouncy mitigation efforts to the QSA water transfers for which this board was responsible for permitting in part, and also the Colorado River flows that largely support the Salton Sea indirectly in the form of ag return flows. Since 2003, IID's conservation programs have generated close to 7 million acre feet of water. This conservation provides Southern California water supply resiliency. It supports Lake Mead and Colorado River Basin water supply reliability concerns. And this conservation is the result of increased ag water use efficiencies that are critical to national food security initiatives and more closer to home helps fill our grocery stores and kitchen tables with livestock and grain products, fresh food and safe produce. In a perfect world, this massive ag to urban transfer program would not have been necessary. But absent the QSA and the many partnerships we now see emerging at the Salton Sea, and in particular those by the state of California as a direct result of their legislative QSA restoration commitments and their contractual mitigation obligations, the sea would be experiencing different challenges and have far fewer friends and funding. IID has continued to be an advocate for the Salton Sea. We've spent a lot of time, not just with your board bringing uh, the petition forward in order to renew the state's efforts at the Salton Sea, but also working with our federal partners and folks in the Colorado River Basin to make sure they understand this connection to the sea. I feel like every meeting I go to, I have to stand up at least once and shout out Salton Sea and they can all cringe appropriately, but they really do now understand that as the water supplies trickle down through our valley, they continue onto the Salton Sea. Next slide, please. And I'm gonna end on this, not sort of as the doom and gloom slide that it appears to be, but there is a Colorado River connection to the Salton Sea. And the heightened federal and basin-wide interest in the sea, while valuable, is grounded on the larger, more troubling water supply challenges that we're now seeing. After more than two decades of record-breaking droughts on the Colorado River, exacerbated by climate change, warming basin-wide temperatures, and all of the other California drought and water supply challenges, the Colorado River is similarly experiencing historic low inflow conditions. It's a massive reservoir system that has over 50 million acre feet of storage, but it's 75% empty now. And as California's water supply reliability is linked to the Salton Sea, the sea's inflows are ultimately linked back to the Colorado River. The state's grappling with its restoration responsibilities. IID is working to implement as many projects as it can in as timely a fashion as it can. But this all too familiar drought condition that's plaguing the rest of California is now really hitting the Colorado River. Lake Meads and Lake Powell are approaching critical elevations. And if the hydrology doesn't begin to improve and we actually get snow that results in inflow, the potential consequences of this drought will eventually trickle down to the Salton Sea. IID is the largest single contractor on the Colorado River. So there will be significant challenges ahead of us. And we are working with reclamation our fellow Colorado River Basin states and other tribal and stakeholder interests to address these water supply challenges and to link those challenges to the Salton Sea to enhance the partnerships with the federal government and other entities that can provide benefits or knowledge or assistance in implementing these projects or facilitating the implementation of these projects. So we appreciate this board's concern and interest and we appreciate you holding this uh, progress report and look forward to hopefully being there in person next year. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Ms. Warren. Good afternoon, uh, members of the board and the public in general. Uh, my name is Esperanza Colio. I'm the deputy CEO for the County of Imperial, but I have experience with different projects, especially water and sewer plants. 
And my presentation today includes, um, it's only uh, for the uh, Desert Shores Restoration Project. Uh, as you may be aware, uh, we had this project under the uh, Salton Sea Authority, who received funding from the Bureau of Reclamation. But before we proceed with the uh, presentation, um, well, I want to talk about a little bit about the community. If you can go through the next slide, please. So the community of Desert Shore is one of the communities right at the, in the north end of the Salton Sea area from the county of Imperial. Actually, it's the last community in Imperial County on the north. This community has approximately 600 people, according to the new census. But I truly believe that the community is missing a lot of the people that responded to the census. I was actually in charge of the census in Imperial County. And I can tell you that a lot of people didn't uh, submit the, the survey. So we believe that it's more than a thousand people living in the Desert Shores community. The Desert Shores community is only one of the communities of the three communities along the 13 mile radius of the Southern Sea area on the West Shores. It's also now the West Shore because we're not counting uh, Bombay Beach, which is on the East Shores. Um, there is a total, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, 6,000 300 people located in that area. But the reality is more than those properties. We have done cleanups, um, neighborhood cleanups, and we understand the community very well. But it's, very, it's very spread out. It has more population than you can imagine. Next slide, please. Uh, the project is all, known as the Channels Project, but the community itself, that because I have talked to the community, they call it the fingers, because there is five, five little channels, so they call it the fingers channel. This um, shores were, which at one time they were filled with water, um, suministered by the Southern Sea. It was actually uh, affected and impacted by the quantification settlement agreement, which is, was done 20 years ago. Uh, among other factors, the channels are almost dry, very, very tiny little water on the ground. And so the project is, now it's, it's, it's dry. So the area that was connected to the Salton Sea area that was receiving water from the Salton Sea area is the, it continues to be there, but it's no water at all being some suministered to the, uh, the channels. Next slide, please. Uh, so the project is divided in two sections, phase number one, uh, two phases, sorry. Phase number one it includes the construction of a berm which is uh, right there in the picture that you can see it right in the, in the lower corner, is to close that berm to prevent the water that is in the channels to, be, to get out of the channels. And it's, um, and it's um, gonna be sim, uh, similar, it will be filled with water with two potential water pumps, one in the north end and one at the south end. And I will show you right now the pictures in which we have located the potential water pumps. Um, they will, the waters will provide the water, but also it will provide a continuous movement of the water. So it, it uh, provides uh, an environment for the wildlife. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the locations of the potential water pumps. One is at the north end, as you can see on this area. And I don't know if you see my cursor, but it's in the north area, um, right in the corner. And the other one is in the south area. Next slide, please. And you're gonna see it from the picture. So we, what we did, we put it together in this, in this uh, two pictures, two maps. And it shows you the amount of people that is living around those channels. We counted 254 parcels in total um, of residents living in that community. Some of them are not actually living there. However, very interesting, we check on our property taxes and none of them are being delinquent, which means they're having hopes that this area be restored so they can continue living in that area once the water pumps are built and, and the whole project is completed. Today, um, they are currently working on the um, site control of these two locations to ensure that we have uh, the water pumps located in those areas. Uh, next slide, please. So the project phase number two will be the continuously uh, the continuous um, um, maintenance of the of the project uh, that will provide a, a, a place for the wildlife to live. 
Next slide, please, and this is my last slide. So the project update is the following. We currently doing a hydrologic, hydrological, get, I'm sorry, it's a combination of hydro, hydro and a geologic report that would identify the quality of the water as well as the, um, um, as the uh, type of soil that we have in, the, in, the, in, in that area. Uh, in 2021, the Imperial County as a lead agency for CEQA document, the CEQA clearance document, uh, prepared the, initiated the initial study for the environmental, um, um, the CEQA documents. And in 2022, beginning this year, uh, the county also contracted with Geo Geologic Associates, which is the firm that is gonna be providing with the, um, the study, the groundwater and the hydrogeologic um, report. And the, based on the report's results, the CICA will be able to find, be finalized. Now, with that said, I wanna mention something very important. What there's funding available through the Salton Authority, Salton Sea Authority, $1.25 million from the Bureau of Reclamation. Based on my experience working with Palo Verde and other communities that has municipal water, water pumps three years ago were $500,000. So if thinking about this small community providing two water pumps, I don't think honestly, based on, on my experience that $1.2 million will be able to be sufficient to complete the project. And the reason behind is the following, as we do in projects in Imperial County for other communities as well, we have noticed a huge increase in cost and construction costs. And, um, and it's also the short of supply, the material supply that has been impacted the projects as well, increasing the project sometimes to a 50%. So I just wanna be upfront with everybody of one of the concerns that I addressed when I saw the uh, amount of funding that was available. I'm very new to this project. I just I was able to get it uh, about a month ago. And so I have small information about it, but based on my experience, I noticed that's one of the concerns that I will have. The completion of the hydrological report is expected by June 2022, and hopefully by that time we can complete the CEQA documents. And that's the end of my report. Thank you. Mr. Dowd, O'Dowd. O apostrophe D, O W D. Vice Chair Diamato, board members, work group attendees. My name is Patrick O'Dowd, and I'm the executive director for the Salton Sea Authority. Thank you for the opportunity to provide a few brief comments participating with this panel of local entities. Of course, there are a host of other local entities that are active at and around the sea. Some you've already heard, others you'll hear from later, but the authority through its 10 locally elected board members represents every person in the Imperial and Coachella Valleys in matters of land use, public safety, energy, water, and a host of other issues of local concern. Collectively, since its formation in 1993, the authority and its member agencies have been diligently pursuing solutions to long known challenges at and around the sea. And to be sure, the work of the authority could not ad advance without the collaborative support of our state and federal partners, working alongside countless stakeholders representing social, environmental, and other interest and concern. It's been a long time. Next year, the authority will recognize 30 years since its formation. It also marks the 20th anniversary of the quantification settlement agreement. But finally, things are beginning to happen. Not as soon as anyone would like, and not as fast as anyone would desire. But the revitalization of the sea and region is beginning to happen. The state has in fact been diligently pursuing its obligations under the 10-year plan, and is actively formulating a long range strategy for the sea and region. We applaud the state and its recent efforts. Concurrently, the authority has been advocating for support in Sacramento and in DC, both to assist the state in fulfilling its obligations under the transfer agreement and to facilitate a transition of the sea and region from what it once was to what it sustainably can be. Again, working in coordination with our extensive local stakeholder groups, the authority has advocated for the state administration and, and the legislature to make 
the necessary financial commitments to fund work at the sea. And in recent years, that strong, loud local voice has begun to bear fruit from the 80 million in Prop 1 funding, over 2 million from Prop 68, and the most recent commitment of 220 million in general fund resources pledged or secured, the state has demonstrated material good faith in meeting its lingering QSA responsibilities. And in our nation's capital, the authority has long asserted that the federal partnership is essential to ultimately solving the challenges of the region and positioning it for future success. And Congress has increasingly responded to our efforts, convening the first federal hearing to, the, to address the crisis at the sea, and most recently, calling upon the Biden administration to develop a federal funding plan to increase federal investments at the sea. Moreover, through the authority's efforts with our congressional delegation, sea-specific federal legislation has been enacted by Congress to dedicate significant resources to both help the state meet its obligations and, more importantly, help the federal government meet its own obligations to our region as a major federal landowner and tribal trustee. Those federal funding tools include several new and modified USDA programs, like the Watershed Act, through which the state now has access to a 50-50 federal match for significant parts of its 10-year plan. Working with our delegation, the authority also spearheaded the legislative efforts to secure a U.S. Army Corps of Engineers feasibility study in the 2020 Water Resources Development Act. Our, our distinguished chair, Esquivel, my, uh, this was written for him to be here, so I have to tweak it a little bit. Uh, my understanding is he was uh, engaged in the infancy of this effort to leverage significant core funding when he worked for the junior senator from California. I am happy to report that finally, after all these many years, this objective will likely be realized. This three-year, $3 million core study is funded 50-50 between the federal government and the local sponsors and is key to accessing 65% federal funding for long-range salt and sea plan. And working with Congress and the Corps this year, we secured the full federal funding required to undertake this study. Ms. Shields' pre presentation was very instructive. Indeed, the more we work we do at and around the sea, the more we learn. In this instance, one thing we learned is that fully half of the playa emissions come from about 10% of the exposed area. And only 25% of the exposed area accounts for over 80% of those emissions. As we reach the halfway mark of the 10-year plan implementation, it might be useful to reassess the state's performance metrics to make sure that the best public outcomes are being achieved. Without reducing the pace of execution, consideration should be given to whether the state's annual acreage requirements are achieving their desired results. Rather than pursuing a dash to meet acreage targets, the data might suggest a different site selection process directing the work to areas perhaps a bit less convenient or more difficult to access, yet more vital in achieving the overall goals. Ultimately, addressing the problem at its source is essential in providing surety to the people of the region that they are safe. And regarding the long range plan, the state is working mightily to meet its year end deadline, but the core feasibility study will require three years to complete, working in large part from the state's efforts to date as a baseline. It is worth considering if the core process and the state's long-term, long-range planning efforts should be merged and deadlines re-evaluated to reflect a more orderly, consolidated process. Ms. Colio Warren provided highlights of a small project in the community of Desert Shores, funded through a $1.25 million grant to the Salton Sea Authority from the Bureau of Reclamation. This community-centric investment will begin the process of restoring life to a community long impacted by changes at the sea. Similarly, the authority in collaboration with the County of Riverside is developing the North Lake Pilot Demonstration Project, a 154 acre lake in the community of North Shore. In addition to providing habitat and mitigating exposed playa in an affected urban adjacent area, and not unlike the smaller investment in Desert Shores, this $19.25 million Prop 68 funded project will begin the process of transformation of these long neglected communities. 
Indeed, for far too long, the shoreline communities, including Salton City, Bombay Beach, Salton Sea Beach, and others most affected by the decline of the sea have been largely ignored. Time and again, they have been promised action, yet no visible progress was ever made. Even when the state announced the groundbreaking of a $200 million SCH project in late 2020, few in the local communities understood how that project, far removed from their communities, would impact their lives for the better. Seeing tangible work advance within these communities has begun to change that narrative. And if we can arrest the declines and continue to invest in the future of those communities while being able to demonstrate convincingly that, that, that their health issue is not at risk, we will truly have played a vital role in transitioning the sea and region from what it once was to what it sustainably can be. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Dowd. Any questions? Board Member Firestone. Uh, first of all, thank you. Well, to all of the panelists, I think um, amazing leadership on behalf of the communities and, and agencies there. So thanks for all that you do um, and for making time to present today. Um, so I had a question um, for IID um, and I'm wondering uh, if you can just speak to the the issue, obviously, of, of land access. And um, I know that's been something that's a priority for both the state and IAD and, and the whole region. Um, it sounded like there, um, there was discussion around a master agreement. There has been some progress made on, on you know, with particular agreements. I'm wondering if you can speak to um, your uh, optimism <laughs> or lack thereof um, of, of the ability to, to reach agreements either through a master agreement or otherwise for the, um, the, the scale of land access that's envisioned and outlined here. So I'm confident we're going to come to something um, soon. Obviously, this is largely in the hands of our various lawyers of the agencies uh, working out some language that we all can agree on. Um, but we reached resolution on quite a few issues in the SCH. I think some of the more recent agreements went away from some of that language and we're trying to tear it back to previously agreed upon language as much as possible. Um, we did just receive back some comments from the state, I think last Friday. So I think we need a couple of weeks to digest them and get to the end, but we're down to, I think, less than a handful of issues, and it's just really trying to work out the specific wording largely related to sort of post-implementation responsibilities and uh, liabilities and whatnot. So I'm sure we'll get there because it's in everyone's best interest for us to move forward, um, and certainly there's a need to get uh, those projects to complement the projects we're working on. Many of these are just sort of divvying up the land that's out there and moving forward on it. So I think we're going to get there relatively shortly. Great. Thank you. Thanks for all of the work on that and, and the shared urgency. Um, uh, and one other question, I, I think this is for Imperial County, um, although maybe the Salton Sea Authority, I think, I don't know who can answer this. This is just my curiosity, and it, but I think is relevant to other projects. Um, but in the the Desert Shores project, um, and, you know, again, it reminds me of really all of the projects here. Um, you know, there's the initial investment and there's then there's the operations and maintenance, and especially for mm -hmm. pumping, that can be pretty significant. So I'm just interested to hear more about how, Who's, who's taking on the ongoing operations and maintenance for that project as an example and, and how that would get paid for? So that's a um, pretty important morning. question. I can, I can, oh, sorry. Let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me address it because it really, it really goes beyond the Desert Shores project. Right. You know, it, 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 it even, you know, SCH has the same questions. You know, how are these projects going to be maintained? And there's a lot of different concepts, a lot of different ideas. Uh, but no solutions right now. The North Lake pilot demonstration project is a demonstration project. And one of the things I think we're pressed to answer as a part of that is who's going to own it, who's going to operate it, who's going to pay for it, how does it, how does it sustain itself? Because the projects that we want to build, we want to be there 50 and 100 years from now. And the only way we can do that is to build them in a sustainable way. 
Uh, that's true of just not, not just the funding, but the water sources, as you rightly pointed out earlier. There's a variety of things that, that, we're, uh, that the state, through the leadership of Secretary Crowfoot and Assistant Secretary Delgado, is you know, running hard and fast against the wind to, to solve some really big problems. Uh, but we're making great progress. It's hard to see on a, on a project the scope and scale of the Salton, Salton Sea, but progress is being made, and those questions will get resolved, and it'll probably be uh, some mosaic of solutions. You know, the projects that produce community benefit uh, may have some revenue sources associated with them that might contribute to the carrying cost of the project. Other projects uh, will have to be probably general fund addressed over time, which is going to be a challenge. But it's it's nobody's hiding from it, especially Riverside County, who's very concerned about it as as the implementer of the North Lake Pilot Demonstration Project for exactly the reasons. And sorry, um, Ms. Colio, did you want to say anything? Just add on for the Desert Shores project in particular. Yes, that was really because, helpful. Thank you. Because I was trying to short my presentation, I didn't want to go over. But technically, we have done some research about the number of properties around the community and the properties around the channels. Around the channels, there's 250 parcels. And, and the whole community is 960 parcels in total. Now, a parcel can also include a mobile home park, which right now we have about 35 families. That gives you the idea of how many residents are being impacted by this project. The idea is to create a special district or to use an existing special district. Once that we have completed the CEQA documentation and the hydrologic, hydrologic report, <laughs> will help us to determine to continue with the project and the preliminary engineering report will let us know what will be the cost of maintenance and operations so that we can create this special districts or use one existing special districts to, to uh, provide for the fees of the long-term maintenance of the projects. Thanks everyone. Okay, next we're uh, moving on to the federal entities panel. And I have a request of the remaining uh, panels. Uh, each have uh, 20 minutes assigned, and I'm gonna just request that you try and cut them down to 15 minutes, because at this rate, we won't get to public comment until about seven o'clock. So um, just do what you can uh, to cut it back a bit. And then I think that'll help to provide uh, more of an opportunity for the community members later. Okay, so federal entities, uh, J.C. Gould, Regional Director from the Bureau of Le Reclamation, Mike no. Kochowski, no, I'll just read them through so that you can just seamlessly go one right after the next, um, Science Coordinator from U.S. Geological Society, and Kyle no. Dahl, Section Chief from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Mr. Gould. It's Jacqueline Gould, and I am. Oh, I apologize. You. And I am the regional director for the Bureau of Reclamation, Lower Colorado Basin. And I wanted to thank you, to our board members, for the opportunity to present today and share with you some of the work that Reclamation has been involved in for the last six years since the signing of the Memorandum of Understanding between the Department of the Interior and the California Natural Resources Board. I wanted to also thank you for recognizing Bruce Wilcox's legacy and commitment to working at the sea. I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to work with him over the last six years that I've been working on the sea. Uh, the Department of Interior values the willingness of the state to continue working with us in support of the projects to lessen impacts from the declining sea levels on fish, birds, vegetation, and the emissive dust. Thank you so much to Secretary Crowfoot and Assistant Secretary Delgado for your leadership at the sea and your continued interest in the developing collaborative relationships with the Department of the Interior and the Bureau of Reclamation. We recognize the state's lead role and our value and value our ability to support the Salton Sea Management Program, as well as the needs of other stakeholders, such as the Imperial, uh, Imperial Irrigation District, the Torres Martinez Tribe, we have worked closely with California Natural Resources Agency, California Department of Water Resources, California Department of Fish and Wildlife to build relationships and work processes that will help us quickly implement projects 
that address emissive dust and habitat loss at the sea. Reclamation has been working with the California Department of Water Resources to implement dust suppression projects on federal lands. The first project began implementation in December of 2021. And over the years, the department has provided funding to not only support projects at the sea, but to develop research and science-based applications to assist in management and policy decisions. The administration acknowledges that there are health and environmental impacts associated with the declining water levels at the sea that expose, that, that expose playa and result in emissive dust. The department is committed to addressing the environmental justice impacts at the Salton Sea, including working with poor communities and the the department continues to work closely with the state and other stakeholders to prioritize and fund projects that improve air and water quality, restore habitat, provide actionable science, and provide local economic opportunities. For example, since the Salton Sea 2016 Memorandum of Understanding between the department and the California Natural Resources Agency was signed, the Bureau of Reclamation, just one of the department's bureaus, has provided approximately 16.5 million for projects that align with the Salton Sea Management Program. Reclamation is supporting projects on approximately 1,740 acres to assist the state in meeting their targets, as well as working with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and other federal partners on programmatic environmental compliance and land use, land use authorizations for the future. In addition, we have prioritized completing compliance and land access agreements in the lower Colorado River Basin so that projects at the sea can be quickly implemented. I think you heard a little bit about that earlier in the meeting today. Reclamation's budget for the last two years includes more than $5 million to implement several activities at the sea. This funding level indicates the emphasis that the department is placing on salt and sea activities You've heard about some of these recent projects, but they include addressing the impacts of drought and potential dust emissions on over 2,000 acres, providing technical assistance to the Torres Martinez tribe on wetland development, restoring aquatic habitat and dust control at the Desert Shores community. We study groundwater availability for future projects. We're determining a common monitoring program for selenium to, to, uh, for selenium, selenium impacts. Improving the scientific communication, such as supporting and participating in recent Salt and Sea Summit, recognizing that science is needed to inform future management decisions. And also we assess future, we're assessing future recreational monitoring access needs at the sea. In 2022, Reclamation received an additional $1 million in drought funding to support dust mitigation partnership with the California Department of Water Resources. Reclamation is also working collaboratively with Imperial Irrigation Districts on projects related to, the, to their salt and sea air quality mitigation program and include areas around Bombay Beach, San Felipe Wash, Poe Road, and the Clubhouse. Now you heard about some of those from Tina Shields today. Reclamation is supporting ZIID's goals of reducing emissions on 5,300 5, acres of highly emissive lands by funding projects on approximately 300 acres and constructing infrastructure to support future projects. Infrastructure improvements include drilling groundwater wells, placing pipe needed to support those future projects. Recognizing the state's lead role for sea management, the department will continue to work with the state and other agencies, tribes, the Salt and Sea Authority, of course, local governments and other stakeholders that play an essential role in successful management activities and outcomes at the sea. Please know that the department bureaus will continue to work together to align funding, improve coordination, create and sustain partnerships that advance projects that meet objectives for restoration and management of the sea. And those are my closing comments today. Thank you for allowing the Bureau of Reclamation to speak to your board and provide that information. Thank you. Thank you. Go, go ahead, Mr. Tchaikovsky. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Diadamo and members of the board. I'd like to echo Jackie Gould's memoriam to the work Bruce Wilcox did 
to organize the state's effort in the Silicon Sea and to work constructively with federal agencies and others. So he, he will be missed. USGS is the primary science provider for the US Department of the Interior. As such, our mission is entirely scientific. We don't manage or set policy regarding natural resources. We cooperate with many parties who rely on our work to ensure that our research produces the data and knowledge needed by managers and policymakers to make informed decisions. I'll give an extremely high level flyby of the work that the USGS is doing at the Salton Sea. Next slide, please. First, in the area of geophysics and natural hazards, we have a great deal of work that's ongoing in the Salton Trough. The Salton Trough is a tectonically active area that's part of the San Andreas Fault System and has a long history of earthquakes and, and even volcanic activity. Our work includes continuing long-term studies of Southern California earthquake hazards, including threats in the Salton Trough. Also, studies of induced seismicity or the potential for induced seismicity around geothermal fields. We're also considering expanding lacustrine paleoseismology work in the Salton Sea area to better unpack the history of the lake and its earthquakes. Uh, we believe teasing out that history may help assess the hazards presented by that region going forward. In the area of geological resource assessment and mapping, we have considerable ongoing mapping efforts in support of resource assessments, including working in partnership with the Department of Energy's Geothermal Technologies Office to collect and analyze data on hidden geothermal systems in the Imperial Valley and around the Salton Sea, working in partnership with BLM and the Natural Resources Conservation Service to conduct high altitude LIDAR surveys of the area to provide very precise elevational maps of the region. Ongoing lithium resources work in the Salton Sea area and elsewhere in the Great Basin to improve assessments of the availability of that important commodity element. And working on research related to whether lithium and geothermal energy can be efficiently co-produced. In the area of groundwater resource assessment and modeling, we are working in partnership with the board and others broadly to provide groundwater assessments and tools to inform management of those resources. We've recently begun work in the Salton Sea area in partnership with the Bureau of Reclamation to better understand groundwater and surface water resources that are available in certain areas around the lake. In the area of selenium dynamics and ecological effects assessments, we're conducting research to better understand the abundance and dynamics of the element selenium in surface water entering freshwater marshes and restoration areas at the south end of the Salton Sea. The objective is to understand the effects that selenium may have on efforts to manage and in some cases create habitat that will be used by migratory waterfowl and other native species that rely on the lake and its bordering areas. Next slide. And that was very quick. Um, we are happy to help members of the board or the public who have questions about salt and sea related science activities, products and data resources. You can contact us for a referral to the offices or scientists who are best suited to answer the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Kyle Dahl. He's not on the platform. Sure. All right. So then we'll move on. I'm sorry, any questions? All right, then we'll move on to uh, panel number five, wildlife and community organizations. And the panelists are, and just go ahead um, right after the, um, the prior panelists uh, concludes, just uh, go ahead and uh, do your presentation. Um, Dan Orr, Senior Spatial Analyst on behalf of Audubon, California. Michael Cohen, Senior Researcher from the Pacific Institute. Uh, Jen, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, Janira Figueroa, Community Engagement Team with Committee Civico de Valle, Sahara Juan Hunzano, Director of Programs with Alanzia Coachella Valley, and Mariela Loreta, Policy Advocate with the Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability. There's also a David Lowe. Uh, Sahara is not on the platform. All right. Uh, David, Mr. David Lowe, or Dr. David Lowe. All right, and Dr. Lowe instead of uh, Sahara. All right, thank you. 
So we're starting with Dan Orr. And Mr. Orr is not on the platform yet, but he will. I'm right here. Oh, ah. sorry. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. Great. Thanks for uh, giving us the opportunity to talk. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Audubon, California has been conducting um, waterbird surveys all across the Salton Sea at 14 different sites since November of 2016. Um, over that period, we've seen a number of changes. Um, next slide, please. Um, let's just, next slide, just to, yeah, thanks. Um, what we see is really in the total number of birds that we see, that hasn't really changed over the, the number of years that we have been surveying, but there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we think about is uh, the types of birds that we see there. And so uh, what we think is happening is some of these birds that are feeding lower on the food chain, um, birds that are eating invertebrates, things like that, uh, are, are stable or increasing in numbers, while birds that are eating higher on the food chain, things that rely on fish, for instance, are disappearing. Um, and that's because we see changes in salinity uh, as well as you know, more exposed playa and loss of um, um, breeding habitat, nesting sites, things like that. Uh, next, next slide, please. You can see in this figure, we're really just showing um, different, different levels of diversity. When you look at species diversity in the blue, you really see that uh, we saw a decline in the, you know, when we first started, it really leveled off. And, and what we see when we look at diversity at the level of order, the taxonomic order, we're really thinking about at, at order level, uh, more functional groups. And so we do see changes in diversity uh, when we look at that level. And that really indicates that we're potentially seeing changes uh, in, in the functional diversity at the Salton Sea. Next slide, please. That's really supported when we look at specific species. And so this is an example where we see uh, birds that are feeding on invertebrate type species, um, that's their food source at the sea. Uh, we see those species as stable or increasing. Um, next slide, please. But when we look at the fish eaters, uh, we see big declines. And so the American white pelican, for instance, we're seeing like 60% declines, double crested cormorants around 30%. Um, and so those are big numbers. And that's really just since we started doing this in 2016. Um, when we see a more complicated story when we talk about the eared grebe, um, it originally started declining and then it, the numbers came back up. So that's kind of a success story. We think that's due to the water boatman and an aquatic invertebrate that showed up in large numbers. Um, there's lots of uh, anecdotal evidence of them eating those, um, being seen eating those. Next slide, please. Uh, that's supported by, uh, observation by observations by Oasis Bird Observatory, who have seen like huge numbers of eared grebes in the central portion of the sea. And our data also indicate that those birds in particular, that species is using the sea differently. They're, they're selecting different sites. And so this was an observation from 2020. So that's, that's an example of them kind of coming back in large numbers. Next slide, please. Um, kind of this, this idea of the fish eaters disappearing is really also corroborated by the, the Department of uh, Fish and Wildlife, California Department of Fish and Wildlife data. They've done aerial surveys at the sea Going back to 2008, you can see here on this graph provided by the department, um, and we see you know huge decreases leading up to when we started surveying in the fall of 2016. And so we're documenting some really big declines even after that. But you know you can see in this graph that there was already huge declines, and so the Salton Sea has already seen really big changes in the bird community um, leading up to when we started doing surveys. Uh, next slide, please. One of the things that we noticed uh, when we do, were doing these surveys is that uh, we started seeing birds that were congregating around these emerging wetlands. And you've heard a couple of people refer to those already today. Uh, and, and those are really just you know, irrigation canals and, and perennial or ephemeral washes that are used to drain into the sea and now kind of trickle out onto the playa and uh, create um, new wetlands there. So we mapped all those wetlands and assessed the distribution of those. And we were hoping that you know, the state can really use these to uh, you know, create habitat because they're already on the ground. They're creating habitat. They are controlling dust, um, and so this is uh, you know a way for the state to um, take advantage of that and potentially um, do lower cost or lower effort uh, 
processes to kind of stabilize those and, and make them persist into the future, similar to what the Bombay Beach uh, Wetlands Project is doing. Um, so I think we also kind of ask that, which is consistent with what the board has already kind of talked about, that the future reports include species, uh, include specific and, and overall uh, habitats, uh, overall habitat and biodiversity goals, that the SSMP provide a water budget and account for future needs and availability. And we also ask that the SSMP include multiple benefit projects that encompass all elements of public health, uh, recreation, and environmental opportunities. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so I'll jump in. My name is Michael Cohen. I'm with the Pacific Institute. I've been working on this many years and helped com or contributed to the development of the stipulated order. Uh, members of the board, we appreciate your holding this uh, annual workshop. It's helped. It's very useful to focus attention on, on the Salton Sea and the state's efforts. Um, Vice Chair Diadamo, it's nice to see you. I think you're the only person who was uh, who actually signed on to the stipulated order. So we appreciate your continued presence on this and focus on this. Um, so I, I guess a couple of quick uh, thoughts to try to keep us on time here. One is to really commend the, the state uh, on its uh, outreach around the annual report. It's held a number of workshops, which I think have helped reduce uh, focus on this particular, on uh, the State Water Board's workshop, uh, provide a lot of good information and overview of the annual report. So that's been very helpful. Um, encourage, I guess I would encourage uh, the state team to increase the public outreach budget uh, to help improve the transparency of their website, to provide a little additional uh, budgeting, perhaps even additional staff uh, to the outreach team so that they can provide additional information on their website um, to increase transparency and, and make that a more viable um, source for, for information. Um, on those lines, I guess we're, we're still a little unclear on uh, really the, the target elevations for some of the state projects that hasn't really been mentioned uh, or the vision uh, that the state has moving forward. I'm looking back at this, this stipulated order, there's clear information there about undertaking the restoration of the Salton Sea and what we really see in the annual report, which again is directed toward, towards this board, um, is really just a focus on uh, acreage targets, just the milestones. And I think that's missing the bigger picture. So to try to broaden the reach and provide a better vision, which will help, I think, uh, inform the public uh, and stakeholders generally and as to where the state's going. Um, maybe just as, a, as an aside, uh, I see a lot of, um, the state's efforts riding on the Army Corps, uh, which has been delayed repeatedly, and I'm uh, more than a little disappointed uh, that the Army Corps uh, hasn't shown up yet. I'm hopeful that uh, Mr. Dahl will show up later during uh, today's workshop to provide some information on what the Corps is doing. Um, and perhaps we can work with uh, other federal agencies to provide some pressure on the Army Corps to, to, to note how important this particular document is in getting that out. Uh, I would, I guess, um, in terms of it adding additional staff and resources that maybe the Regional Water Quality Control Board could add staff and whether that comes out of this, the Salton Sea Restoration Fund or other funding sources provide additional support because we are well behind the curve in understanding water quality at the Salton Sea. We still don't have a good handle of what the current salinity of the Salton Sea is uh, or the water quality inputs into these major $100 million, multi-hundred million dollar projects. So getting additional uh, support for the regional water board, uh, water board to increase their capacity uh, to help support the state's efforts and be a, a more integrated part of the state's efforts, uh, I think is a, is a useful ask. And perhaps um, this board can, can help push that forward uh, and work with uh, the resources agency to find funding either uh, in existing sources or, or additional funding that's coming down the pike from uh, the forthcoming budget. Uh, I would also point out in the, in the stipulated order uh, that number four on that stipulated order uh, says that, that the division of water rights will work with the supporting parties to propose as part of an early milestone an appropriate monitoring framework to assess success in implementing the Salton Sea Management Program. So an, 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 another ask, and maybe I shouldn't be making so many asks here, but uh, another ask uh, for the board uh, is to direct staff, the division of water rights, uh, to come up with a schedule uh, in the near term so we can develop this additional uh, monitoring framework. So we heard from Mr. O'Dowd and others that uh, that perhaps this, the state's focus 
on specific acreage milestones is mi missing some functional metrics. So developing uh, this appropriate monitoring framework could be a way to, to help refocus the state on meeting functional goals, not just acreage targets getting projects in the ground. Um, so I, I think I'll stop there and um, move on to the next project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Lowe. Hey, thank you for uh, letting me speak. Um, I'm going to share a few slides. Um, no, no data, no tests at the end. Um, so uh, thanks for getting this opportunity to speak. I was asked by Alianza to um, present a perspective based on discussions we've been having, especially in conversations with the communities living near the Salton Sea. Uh, the Salton Sea Management Program is a good step in identifying a lot of critical issues. Um, and uh, there are other agencies beginning to pay more attention to these issues. We've begun working with the uh, California Air Resources Board to help work with communities to identify priorities in future work. The critical issue for us that I want to discuss is uh, one of the more important species living in the area, and that is the human beings and the health impacts. So while there's a lot of attention to the dust production and mitigation strategies at the exposed playa, there's really been very little attention to the issue of the impact of dust on the health of the communities living near the Salton Sea. One of the most severe effects is on childhood asthma. And it is commonly believed that the dust from the exposed playa is causing the lung inflammation associated with the uh, asthma-like symptoms. So the research that we've been doing um, at the Salton Sea has been focusing on aerosols generated um, at the uh, exposed playa, as well as comparing to other aerosols collected from sites more distant from the uh, Salton Sea. And our data so far suggests that there's some significant toxicity in the aerosols collected from dust uh, the aerosols collected near the uh, Salton Sea. And I wanted to be clear that the way we've approached this is not just simply treat dust as dust as particulates, but actually looking at the materials that are carried on the particles themselves. And the toxic components that we are identifying are actually not associated with the inert particulates like sand and so on, but actually components that are carried on the particles themselves. And they appear to be um, brought onto these particles during the process of dust production at the exposed playa as it's carried into the air. And we believe those components are from the ecosystem, from the microbiome of the Salton Sea and the microbial components that are released and then entrained into the dust. So the relevant um, question for the communities in the region is that playa exposure at the Salton Sea, as we've already seen, is not the same everywhere. And the dust is also not being produced in the same way everywhere around the Salton Sea. Okay. And so some communities are more severely affected than others. So um, previous studies um, have not spent that much time discussing the health impacts near the Salton Sea, and partly because the approach that people have been using is that they've been missing the um, identifying the impacts on communities that are likely to be underrepresented in, in various kind of health assessment data, especially the immigrant agriculture worker families who are largely undocumented, lack health insurance, and are often um, self-treating with inhalers and may go pick up from family members over in, in, in Mexico. So the issue is that we really need much more detailed information on where the toxic dust are produced and which communities are more severely impacted by the exposed exposure to dust. So the argument we're making is that to really address the critical issues at the uh, Salton Sea and the treat, retreating sea and uh, exposed playa, we're looking at the impact on residents. And we need the data on the health impacts, not just on dust levels. And so we would argue that 
to really be an effective uh, monitor of what's going on, we need to have much more data on health assessment and epidemiology, studies on the ecosystem and its contribution to the toxicity that we've observed, and the actual process of toxicity that's generated in the dust that's generated at the exposed playa. And so therefore, um, any assessment uh, and accountability for projects at the Salton Sea need to take the health impacts in the communities into account. And so that is the conclusion of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. And please submit that to um, our staff so that we can um, have it with the other presentations. Yes. Uh, Ms. Figueroa, sorry I skipped over you. I didn't realize you were no in the problem. room. I didn't see you on the platform. No problem. Oh, give me one second now. Guess my computer didn't like being skipped over. <laughs> so good evening. Uh, my name is Janira Figueroa. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I am here on behalf of Comité Civico del Valle, a community-based organization from the Imperial County. Uh, next slide, please. I would like to take this time to highlight the partnership between Comité Civico that we have with SSMP, specifically with the Department of Water Resources, um, which is the COE program that we have here. Next slide, please. COE, which stands for Community Outreach, Education and Engagement, is a program where our team members provide outreach and education on Salton Sea to our community through community events such as health fairs. Through outreach events, our team is able to inform and educate underserved communities that are directly impacted by the sea every day. And specifically, the health concerns that our air quality poses. Comité Civico is committed to not only, sorry, com Comité Civico is committed to not only educating, but also creating awareness and promoting advocacy among our community members. Comité Civico has hosted members of the community to attend virtual workshops and meetings like the New River Community Forum that we recently held last month, which took place, which took place last month in collaboration with Cali PA and the Department of Water Resources. And so here we have some examples of our COE program in action, helping community members. Next slide, please. Comité Civico has also continued our school flag program, which is a program that promotes air quality education in over 20 local schools that are directly affected by air quality every day. We strongly believe that a vital, a vital part of commu community engagement is educating our youth on topics such as air quality, considering that one in four children in the Imperial County will develop asthma. Next slide, please. Comité Civico recognizes and we commend the strides that SSMP has made towards the restoration of the Salton Sea. And we also remain committed to ensuring that the health risks our community face are being addressed directly. Additionally, I would like to thank the Water Resources Board for their inclusion of our Spanish speaking communities, which is a vital part of our communities that may oftentimes be left out. And so the live translation of Spanish in our meetings is very helpful. We are thankful for the progress being made at the Salton Sea, and we remain optimistic that the promises will be delivered at the Salton Sea and delivered to our communities directly. Thank you. Thank you. So oh, I had called out Mariela Loreda, but it looks like uh, Ms. Ruiz. Oh, there you are. Okay, Ms. Loretta. Yes, thank you. Okay, good evening. I'm Mariela Lora. I'm a policy advocate at Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability. Over the past several years, we have been advocating alongside community members from the Eastern Cochabamba Valley for the centralization of local voices in the Salton Sea restoration efforts and project development. The Salton Sea is one of the major community concerns due to, as described by Dr. Lowe, its impacts to the local public health, as well as unclarity on how current and future project development will impact how community will be able to interact with the sea. 
Given the increased climate change impacts that community in the region are experiencing, like increased heat waves and public health crisis, local residents have identified the need to enhance the suppression and habitat conservation projects by including components and amenities that provide multiple benefits on top of habitat and dust suppression. And also include amenities that promote community building, recreation, access to the outdoors, local economic development, and other mental and public health benefits to enjoy a better quality of life. We are grateful that the Natural Resource Agency has made an initial commitment to include multi-benefit infrastructure and amenities into the Salton Sea projects. We continue to enc encourage the addition of specific language of this commitment into the Salton Sea Management Program that describes the process and timeline in which community-led multi-benefit components will be incorporated into existing and future projects, as well as a direct funding for the planning and development of these. Some examples of the components residents have expressed interest for include things like walking trails, shade structure for thermal comfort, picnic areas, educational signage with information about the Salton Sea, including information on its history and wildlife, air monitoring stations, remote hotspot, and community gardening and greening. This infrastructure will give communities better access to the Salton Sea and the outdoors, provide additional recreational opportunities and amenities, allowing them to be more equipped and be more resilient as well as suited for an improved quality of life. As the Salton Sea is restored, it is important to ensure that the end result fulfills expectations and needs of the local community. Therefore, as a natural resource agency begins to support the implementation of multi-benefit infrastructure, we encourage there to be an inclusive and particip participatory budgeting, planning, and design process, as well as specific allocation of funding to go towards community-based projects. As we address the receding Salton Sea and its subsequent impacts on community and the environment, it is vital to ensure that there is no future harm to the Salton Sea region. There's an increased concern for the potential impacts that the proposed lithium extraction and processing will have on their health and environment across the Salton Sea region. Given the uncertainty and potential impacts, it is necessary for both the water boards and CNRA to actively engage in these processes in the interest of salt and sea restoration and public health. In the past year, we have seen increased progress in community engagement in the SSMP and look forward to seeing these efforts continue to grow. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Ruiz, um, I'm sorry I didn't call you after Dr. Lowe. Go ahead. Who are you referring to? Uh, Ms. Ruiz. Uh, not on this list, no, on the panel. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Yes, okay. I, I just saw that she's also with the uh, Alonzia Coachella Valley, so I thought that she was supposed to be part. All right. Um, any questions of this panel? Board Member Firestone. Thank you. Um, thanks to the panelists and thanks to for all the work you all have put in to help make um, this whole effort possible. I think um, I heard a lot of uh, appreciation for the progress being made and and also really great input um, and flags. I think I, I'm interested to hear. Um, you know, we heard earlier from CNRA that they. Um, that they felt like, you know, their their hope and intention is that um, the NEPA document could um, would enable much more of the specifics in terms of project specifications and water budgets and some of those things that were that you all highlighted. Um, and I'm wondering if you all are um, optimistic that 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 that. Um, will be able to address your concerns or if there's um, something else that is needed or, or concerns that, um, that that doesn't address. And I, this is probably to the first couple speakers maybe on this panel. I think we're the ones that brought it up more specifically. Yeah. And while they are assembling themselves to answer this question, we do note that uh, Ms. Ruiz has raised her hand. So once this question's answered, we'll give her a chance to unmute and speak. 
Uh, Mike Cohen may have a good answer for this too, but I know, you know, these are things I think we've asked for before and um, we still haven't seen it. And so, you know, we are, we like to be optimistic and say, yes, hopefully we do see it, but um, we remain vigilant and, and in, in our requests for it, for it to actually happen. Mr. Cohen. Uh, and I guess I would add that um, we've been asking for a lot of these items for, for many years and, and working, uh, striving to work collaboratively on identifying some of these projects in ways that we can implement the projects, uh, identify water sources and meeting the functional needs of the habitat, not just the specific acreage needs. Uh, and a lot of it has been resting on the release of this draft environmental assessment from the core. Um, I guess part of my thinking there is that, that it's been a, a little backwards, that the alternatives should be developed first, and then the uh, EA uh, come out around them, but that's not the way this particular process has moved forward. So at this point, we're looking forward to seeing the, the EA released um, and hoping to have real input into the development of the alternatives moving forward. It's not clear how much of that's going to happen, but I think uh, in many ways, the EA will provide a broad coverage and then there'll be room moving forward after that to help specify specific projects. That's helpful. Thank you. Anything else, board member Firestone? Um, I had one other question, but I don't know if, if we want to go to the hand raised or wait. Yeah, let's go ahead and um, Ms. Ruiz, we're uh, inviting you to unmute yourself at this point in time. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes, uh, the reason why I am on the uh, call is because I am here um, for the community panel. I have the community panelists here. Uh, you can see them on the screen um, and ready to start the panel if uh, we're able to do that. Yes, we'll go to the panel just as soon as Ms. Firestone is uh, finished with her question. She had one more question. That's fine. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. I don't want to hold it up. Um, I, I guess I'll just flag. Um, I am really interested in this point or the point really resonated with me on the idea of needing to um, think about how our staff could work with CNRA um, to support um, thinking about framework for metrics of success or um, these more functional, broader goals um, beyond just the specific acreages. So I think it'd be great to just um, follow up on that a bit and see if that's something we could support. Thank you. All right, so now we'll move on to the uh, community members. The panelists are the panelists that I have, and we may have had some change, but Ed Luna, Elizabeth uh, Jamie, and Lupita Molina. Yes, that is correct. Oh, almost. Uh, we were able to unite at the Alianza office so that we could hold um, the we could, have, we could have the community panelists together. Um, I will be acting as moderator for the Q and A okay. session we're going to be having. All them. right, thank you. Thank you. Proceed. Great. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to hold this panel. I will just start with some very brief introductions. Um, my name is Nilda Ruiz. I am with Alianza Coachella Valley as program coordinator. Uh, and I'll pass it on. I am a longtime resident of Coachella, uh, and I'll pass it on to Elizabeth Jaime. Hola, mi nombre es Elizabeth Jaime. Vengo de la ciudad de North Shore. Thank you. Hi, thank you for allowing me to Yeah, we're having some difficulty hearing uh, you in the room. Yeah, just one moment, um, Mr. Mr. Luna. We're not able. We're not. They can't hear you well. Ed. So hopefully, if people can move a little closer to the microphone while they speak, that should help uh, the Zoom platform pick it up. Apologize. Let me talk a little louder. Ed Luna from the community of Mecca, and uh, very familiar with the desert salt and sea region historically, and continue to be interested in it. Thank you very much. Were you able to hear Ed? I'm trying to get the um, mic closer to him. Yes, we were able to hear Mr. Luna pretty well. All right, sounds good, thank you. Um, I do want to know, unfortunately, uh, Lupita Molina was is not able to join us today due to an emergency. 
Um, but we will go ahead and continue with the panel as it is. I will start by, I will ask several questions that we'll provide in both English and Spanish. And each of our um, panelists will be able to have um, uh, at most three minutes to answer each question. Uh, so let's start with the first question. Um, the SSMP 10 year plan started in 2018. And while there has been progress, there is a sentiment that residents of the Salton Sea have not been adequately engaged and updated on progress in the SSMP. What needs to improve in salt and sea plans to adequately involve the community? Ahora le voy a decir la pregunta en español. El plan de 10 años del SSMP comenzó en 2018. Y mientras el estado ha avanzado, existe la sensación de que los residentes de salt and sea no se han involucrado adecuadamente ni actualizado sobre el progreso del SSMP. ¿Qué necesita mejorar en los planes del salt and sea para efectivamente actualizar e involucrar a la comunidad? Tengo esta empezar. Yeah, um, hace falta que se haga más alcance en persona. Hace falta... No, Mr. We're going to we're gonna need to get you closer to the microphone, please. Como televisión, uh, radio, este, hablando español e informando todo lo, lo relacionado a, a la comunidad. Uh, pienso que si se mantiene informada la, la comunidad va a ser más fácil de que se involucre. I think uh, it's a good question and I think that Elizabeth addressed uh, it uh, very well in answering. We're, we're still having difficulty hearing you. I apologize for interrupting. Can you get closer to the microphone? Obligations. That's uh, plan to and be imposed. If I can interrupt you one moment. Can you give me one second, please? Oh. You want and to I'm start a, over with Elizabeth then? Yeah. Yeah, let's do that. There you go. Uh, so we'll, we'll go ahead and um, just because I think that I'm not sure if you were able to hear Elizabeth well, uh, I will have uh, Elizabeth um, start again and uh, repeat her answer to the question. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Elizabeth? Um, Pienso que la, la comunidad se va más involucrar cuando haya más alcance de persona a persona. También este, si se hace um, con medios de comunicación como televisión en español, este, radio, este, pues toda la comunicación también necesitan que sea en español. No sé, es y la gente cuando está informada pues va, va a tener como que más opción de, de acercarse a, a conocer los planes que hay para la comunidad. I agree with Elizabeth. I think she addressed it pretty well in terms of the lack of sufficient outreach towards the communities. And I think uh, mainly in the matter of financial obligation that appears to be planning uh, that our leaders are planning to impose upon the local residents which uh, live at or near the Salton Sea. Uh, so I think that that's very important to be a part of the discussion and any outreach uh, that that uh, you guys, we guys, everybody makes uh, towards the uh, residents and landowners around the Salton Sea because it appears to me that the focus is forming special districts or utilizing another existing district, which by the way, hasn't been named in, as a lifetime resident. I'd like to know what we're talking about, who we're talking about, where my rates are gonna go up. Uh, so I'd appreciate a little bit more outreach in that regard, yes. Uh, thank you. Ms. Ruiz. Yes. Uh, before we, uh, before you ask the next, next question of Elizabeth, I wanna talk to one of our interpreters uh, because the, Simultaneous English translation is not coming properly into the room here. Um, Erlanda, are you able to hear me? And uh, in order for me to hear you, you're going to have to switch back over uh, and take off your Spanish feed. And Erlanda, um, actually, because of the problem in the room, you if you can switch not from Spanish to English, but just turn off all translation services so that you're going into the main room. 
Looks like you're back on Spanish now. <sighs> and again, um, you're on Spanish. Maybe I can ask Ms. Townsend to see if we can disable you from interpreting for a minute. Just with Orlando, let's go ahead and. Okay. I don't know if someone would like to add about having an engagement strategy to keep to involve community in the decision making spaces. Not as good as. So, Orlando, can you try speaking again? Let's see if we've, Janine has updated you so that you should not be identified as an interpreter. Go ahead and try that. Ms. Ruiz, I hate to ask, but would you be able to provide uh, translations of um, Elizabeth while she speaks? Uh, and not I simultaneous, can... but um, pauses afterwards, because we, we'd like to ensure that the board members and uh, English only speakers are able to understand what she's communicating. I'm not going to claim that I'm a professional translator like our interpreters here, but I can uh, I can make the attempt. Yes. No, I appreciate that. And we apologize that uh, we have been able to do the simultaneous translation before, but the equipment in the, the room is having a little bit of a problem with it. So. OK, yeah, no, I, I can. I, I don't think I'm a bad interpreter as it is, but yeah, I can make the effort. No problem. Can I resume? Just one moment. We're, we're okay. Yes. Can you go ahead and do the best you can to interpret um, Elizabeth's um, statement for the answer to her last question? All right. No worries. Um, wait. Do you, well, you say you want me to repeat her answer to the the first question I asked? Yes. About um, community engagement. All right. So. Uh, Elizabeth's answer to the first question was that um, she would like to see more person-to-person uh, -person outreach, door-to-door um, -door outreach. Um, she also talked about being able to use um, um, media uh, that is in Spanish, not just in English, and that can include uh, media such as radio stations and um, uh, television news channel. Um, some examples, for for example, for a radio station would be 96.7, which is a um, very popular um, radio station in Spanish in the Southern Sea region, or at the very least, from my understanding, uh, within the um, Coachella Valley. 
Uh, she also mentioned using some various publications, um, which can include um, uh, newspaper, uh, newspapers and publications such as Desert Sun. And um, one specific example that was given by Lupita Molina uh, was the um, Stockton City News uh, newspaper. Uh, so they would like to be able to see more outreach um, that is more direct and expands on um, existing outreach that is usually done in, in English and some non-existing outreach so such, such as announcements through um, radio stations. But um, that was her overall response. Um, Elizabeth, no sé si me faltó mencionar algo. No. So, okay. yeah. That was her answer. That was helpful. Thank you so much. Sorry to impose upon you. No worries. Uh, just let me know if I can move on to the next question. All right. Yeah, just one moment, though. Um, are we going to continue with uh, that format with um, Ms. Ruse's assistance, or did we have some luck with the interpreter? We might have some luck, but we'd need to take about 30 seconds for um, Erlanda to try it again. Um, so let's try to do that just so that we don't burden uh, Ms. Ruiz and we get a, an accurate interpretation. All right. So Thank you all for your patience. So, it, um, Ms. Reese, if you can have Elizabeth hold for a second, and what we're going to do one quick, uh, we're going to try to do what we did a minute ago. So, bear with me. And, Erlanda, what we're going to do is have you um, translate out into the main feed again by dropping your interpreter. So, hold on one moment. Are you said you would like for Elizabeth to speak for a moment in Spanish so we can test check if the interpreter is able to be heard? If you can hold just a moment um, until we can verify that we can get the interpreter in the main feed. So, Orlando, um, you should be back in the main feed right now. Um, and so, uh, first of all, if you could speak, Orlando, just so we can make sure we will be able to hear you in English. Yeah, can you guys hear me? Hello. Hi, Orlando. Hi, hi. This is Orlando. <laughs> okay. So, what we're going to do is um, we're going to have uh, Ms. Ruiz ask Elizabeth her questions in Spanish. And if you could just translate them into English, the answers into English on this feed. And then we'll get you back into the interpretation services after uh, Elizabeth has had a chance to speak in Spanish. Is that okay? Okay. Is it possible um, during that time, can we make sure that the other interpreter is providing uh, the Spanish feed for any uh, English spoken during the session? Yes, hold on, just give me a moment. Uh, let me send her a message. Great, thanks. Okay, we're good to go now. Excellent, thank you. I appreciate your patience. And Ms. Ruiz, Ms. Ruiz, we appreciate your patience as well. We should be able to provide the simultaneous translation again and the Spanish will be going out on the Spanish feed as well. So if you would like to resume your questioning. All right, thank you. Um, I'll start saying the questions in Spanish. Um, así que la siguiente pregunta es, and the next ¿por qué es importante is, involucrar important a la comunidad local en los espacios de toma de decisiones? ¿Cuál as es el impacto? Making the decisions, what is the impact? Uh, yeah. 
pues principalmente sería la transparencia con el Estado. First of all, the transparency. Este, y sería, brindaría confianza um, a cada uno. More, y ya ellos serían responsables de, de involucrarse. And people will be responsible, or they will be responsible to get more involved with us. Um, también sería... Um, que estaría la comunidad actualizada, ese sería un, este, un impacto, oh, que estaría so actualizada con todos lo, los proyectos events, que tengan sobre uh, la laguna. Especially y about the pues, eh, el, el proceso es como mantener, este, y a, mantener a, a, pues a los residentes actualizados con la toma de, de, to de decisiones. As far as y, making decisions. Y pues, la comunidad se involucraría pues más, más efectivamente haciéndose responsable ellos mismos more effective in being responsible as well thank you yeah. and um miss ruiz if you could relate to elizabeth oh, um, since we can't quite do the the feeds are going on the same channel so if there can be a pause after each sentence so the interpreter can go ahead and read it out um it won't quite be true simultaneous translation but at least we'll Everybody will be able to hear Elizabeth's answers. Okay. Um, están pidiendo que cuando esté platicando, si puede um, pausar entre cada oración para que el intérprete le pueda, um, pueda traducir lo que está diciendo para el canal en inglés. Okay. Right. Thank you. I communicate that with Elizabeth. Um, maybe move on to Ed Luna so you can provide his answer. Ed, I'll just repeat the question for you in English. Uh, why is it important? to engage the local community in decision-making spaces. What is the impact? Well, I, again, I want to give uh, Elizabeth a lot of credit for the important point of transparency by the agencies, all of them that are involved in development of uh, any plans uh, in, in the making for uh, correction of the situation that we refer to as the Sultan Sea. And I agree with her that we have a tremendous responsibility not over not only to the project success and or uh determination whether to move forward on something else but i think fully informed today's generation uh who will be making those uh decisions those approvals let's just say and i'm talking about today's generation of of residents landowners around the salton sea uh they're heads of household they have children that are going to grow up and maybe raise their own families around the salton sea and i think what i understand by transparency responsibility in this regard i think it's important to engage the local community in these decision making uh, uh situations that if they were fully informed, uh, they might think twice, uh, take it seriously before they mortgage their children's and or other generations of families' uh, lives uh, for the next 100 years. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Move on to the next question. Vamos a ir la siguiente pregunta. Next question. Basada sus observaciones y experiencias, if your answer is yes. Okay. I'm going to um, si se está haciendo, como ya hablaron este, los otros compañeros sobre yes, este, like las universidades colleagues como just mentioned. UCR, Davis, que eh, ellos son los uh, que han, está, han estado haciendo uh, los proyectos como monitoreando la calidad del aire. Monitoring the quality of the air. Pero también del agua, pero so lo que water. nos gustaría más es que el, el estado what we like you to do for us as far as the state más acción, is to take eh, more action. No sé, este, no hay recursos para las universidades. There's not a lot of resources for the university. Y, y siento como residente, you know, as a resident, que con el apoyo del Estado, donde se les brindara un poco support, más de, de fondos. If you give us your support a little more, especially in the mismos, monetary este, area. Universidades que han estado ya investigando. There's a, universities already. Pudieran tener más oportunidades de, de hacerlo a, pues a una escala mucho mayor. 
they will have the opportunity porque, to do it at a greater scale. Porque tienen limitados sus recursos. Since our resources are limited now. Yo personalmente, I personally, he estado um, ayudando a, con el proyecto. Been helping with the project. Uh, ya que mi hijo tiene asma. My son suffers from asthma. Y, y ahorita la Universidad de UCR. In the University of UCR at the moment. Uh, hay en mi casa un para, es, no sé cómo se puede decir, un monitor. Un monitor. We have a monitor. De, de polvo para ver qué le puede estar afectando a mi hijo. To see what's affecting his health. Pero eso, eso es lo que principalmente es lo que se le pediría al Estado que pudiera apoyar este, este tipo de universidades para que sigan con sus investigaciones y así podamos este, que nos puedan ayudar a la comunidad. From your observations and experiences, do you think that public health is being prioritized in saltancy plans? If not, what do you think can be done to prioritize public health more in saltancy plans? Well, I can answer the first part of that question as honestly as I can. I'm not too sure if I even can, can come close to answering the second part, but I strongly believe right now that the energy, the interest and in the political information and funds allocated to the plans that are geared towards some projects in the Salton Sea, um, they distract any, if not all, attention uh, to the point that concentration funding, alleviating health concerns is diluted, diluted to the point that the project's overall economic interests and those investment returns override public health issues. And uh, I think that that's, that sh should be this panel and everybody else that's involved in the pursuit of some remedial thing for the salt and sea priority, prioritize health over everything else. And recreation how can you have a great time if you're dying? <laughs> I mean, it's hard for me to kind of put those two together. If you're, you're, you're being, you know, you're suffering asthma attacks and you're, you know, being blinded by the dust and you're being poisoned by the water. I mean, how can I, how can I even imagine that we'd be having a great time? It's just, there's an oxymoron there, you know, and uh, in those two thoughts, I, I, I don't see how that can work. And I, I think that, these panels that were uh, that are all engaged in this are intelligent enough to recognize that, and I, I think that they are uh, they have an uh, empathetic concern towards communities and communities health. Thank you so much for asking. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth, would you like to add anything else? Anything else? Um, aparte de que si el gobierno estatal estuviera ofreciendo este tipo de apoyo para estas organizaciones que están haciendo estas investigaciones. También me gustaría que se demostrara y, y se reportara. I would like them to... Cómo utilizar los datos de salud pública para, inform para informar los proyectos de salto en sí y la eficacia de los proyectos para mejorar la, la salud. You provide to get involved this way. Um, también este, sabemos, pues estamos informadas que también mind, están planeando um, extraer litio. That they're planning on extracting y, some y litio. Y la preocupación de, de, de la comunidad. Oh, the community's concern. Cómo nos afectaría, how that will affect uh, en la salud. Si tenemos our, ya este, batallando o, o teniendo estos problemas de sangrado nasal en los niños. With issues of el asma en, en bastante población. So bleeding in our eh, children. Y esa es la pregunta. Cómo nos afectaría question, directamente affect us directly, pues, con la extracción de litio. With the extraction sería como of más litio. problemas. Um, they would Pero be more si se llegara a, a hacer, 
pero if that is también la comunidad cómo done, beneficiaría a nosotros I would like to know how that ya sea uh, en todo no la infraestructura los as parques as as um, parks. por decir a, algunas cosas este no sé más estudios de cómo no sería el impacto en la salud more studies and how uh, that will impact our life sería como que más um, zonas verdes hay muchísimas cosas que, que uh, um, hace mucha falta aquí en, en, en North Shore y Many things that are needed pues, here este valle de Coachella, yeah. ¿no? La the, parte sureste. The Coachella Valley. Pero muchas gracias. In the south area. Thank you so much. Gracias, Elizabeth. Uh, ya vamos a concluir el panel. Uh, solamente una uh, pregunta final y si, lo puede, si pueden hacer sus respuestas um, uh, 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 más, uh, más breve posible. You can please, uh, ¿Hay algo más que les gustaría compartir uh, con quienes uh, acompañan hoy que no, like que no compartieron um, um, antes? Ed, I'll translate it for you, Ed. Thank you. Uh, it's just the last question to conclude the panel. Is there anything else you would like to share with those joining us today that you previously did not share? And thank you very much for asking. And I, you know, I, I want to bring it back to my tendency is to place always the horse uh, before the cart that's been enlisted to, to, to pull. So, I mean, I'm going to just kind of summarize what I've said in the previous uh, answers. And my immediate concern is the use of language suggesting the formation of special districts that would assure sustainable financing uh, for any vehicle that would be uh, designed or utilized for continued management of the salt and sea projects now and in the future. And also, of course, we, we missed out on uh, panel members mention of any existing special uh, district to achieve the same goal. <clears throat> it's always nice to have a for example. I mean, when I'm listening, that's how I always look for that. Uh, and so uh, I guess my main thing here is that the magnitude of these suggested restoration projects emphasize the, the statewide benefits of in the pursuit in any or all of uh, these projects, statewide benefits, but yeah, and I asked myself, okay, so why, if these ideas promoting any of these costly projects, both in the studies, design, construction, and implementation of the same, why should the assessment district just be among the existing residents around or near the Salton Sea? It's just, I, I can't put that together for some reason. It does. So I'm gonna to have to need some help. I'm gonna to have to do a little more research on this. I, I can only rely on statements that are made by our local supervisors just chomping at the bit. There goes that horse in front of the car again. Uh, chomping at the bit to form a special district around the Salton, around the Salton Sea. And I'm, I'm very concerned about that, that, that we're gonna pay for the benefit of the entire state of California. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, with that, uh, I just wanna apologize for the little difficulty in being able to hear us at the start of the panel, um, but thank you for your patience. And uh, with that, we can conclude the community panel. Thank you, Ms. Ruiz, Mr. Luna, and uh, Ms. Jaime. Um, it, it, we really appreciate you sticking with us despite all the technical okay. difficulties. And um, I, I think we were able to understand uh, most, of, um, uh, most of what you had to say. And it's just very important uh, for us uh, to be able to hear this, these concerns directly from you. So thank you. Um, any questions? Thank you, and I hope you'll be able to continue to participate. All right, um, this concludes the prepared presentations for the workshop. We'll now take a 30 minute break. And when we come back, we will open the workshop to public comments. As a reminder, if you're attending virtually and want to provide comments, you either needed to have completed the virtual speaker card online, or you can send an email during the break to comment letters at waterboards.ca.gov. I'll repeat that, comment letters at waterboards.ca.gov requesting to speak. If you're attending in person in Sacramento and intend to speak, please fill out a blue speaker card or at the front of the room, you can fill out the speaker card online. So we will break now and uh, resume at seven o'clock.
Very loud is that okay? Uh, I know. I was trying to. Um, It's me, I'm testing. Oh, I'm, like, I'm, I'm testing for me to give them a one minute warning. I can tell you that I'm all going to end here today.
Oh, I can't. Yeah, I Is can't it? <laughs> I think my ears are plugged some too, so. Uh...
Okay, we are back. All right, um, we have approximately 29 uh, public commenters and we will start off with Kim Floyd and um, each speaker will be given three minutes and there'll be a one minute warning. Kim Floyd. Kim Floyd. And hold yes. on one second, Janine, can you? Can you hear me? One moment. Yes, Mr. Sir. Floyd, if you can hold for a second. Ready? <laughs> okay, one moment, sorry. Just one moment. And Erlanda, uh, Janine is about to put you back into interpreter mode. For some reason, you came out of it. Um, I thought we'd put you back in. So you'll probably need to set yourself to the Spanish feed when she finishes that. Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting. Thank you. All right, Mr. Floyd, good evening. Good evening. My name is Kim Floyd. I live in the Coachella Valley, and I am very concerned about the long, our long-term ability to stay focused on improving conditions at the sea. My concerns center around the history of action and inaction at the sea. We need to bake in solutions that will not backslide when the budgets get tight. The greater Salton Sea area has long been left with unacceptably low levels of investment in community level infrastructure. We can do better. Also, I think that there's a great opportunity here to engage the local communities in the ongoing efforts at the sea. We need to, a plan that provides specifics about how and when college community knowledge can influence the state's plans, a plan with clear outcomes and goals for engagement, and a plan with specific points in the project design and planning process where community input would be the most influential and beneficial. We have a long history of community members feeling quote, not listened to, end quote. We have an opportunity to change that. My final comment tonight that may not fit directly into the current SSMP discussion, but we know that community lead, county leadership and industry leaders will be fully informed and the decision at the decision-making table with lawyers and financial experts when it comes to negotiating how to share the financial benefits from lithium mining and geothermal expansion. I am concerned that local communities will be left out of these negotiations. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Lauren Elachi. Um, I hear she is not on the platform. All right. Joan, Joan Taylor. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good evening. Thank you. Um, I'm a resident of Palm Springs. Um, wear various conservation hats, but I'm speaking for myself tonight as an individual. I joined the voices thanking this administration for putting its shoulder to the wheel after many years of inaction in the past. But I have the following comments and suggestions for improvement. The annual report speaks to restoration goals, but the goals that are articulated are really more like objectives, such as 30,000 acres of dust suppression and habitat management. But to properly guide the SSMP, it's important to articulate the end conditions expected to be reached against which we can measure success. For example, what are the desired end conditions for habitat, both in terms of function and quality 
in addition to just those acreage goals. Same for local health, air, and water pollution. While not strictly a state responsibility under QSA, it would be good to scope out what are they hoped for economic societal goals for the underserved communities around the Salton Sea and how the SSMP might play into this. With regard to air quality, so far the state's focus has been almost exclusively on playa dust suppression. But the annual report should look into the issue of air contaminants that may be emanating from the salt and sea water itself. Finally, I am not sure this is within the jurisdiction of the Water Board, but it seems important also to quantify dust and airborne toxins from the surrounding ag in both counties. Is that it? Thank you. No, no you may continue. You have one minute left. That's just a one minute warning. Okay, thank Go you. Go ahead. One final sentence. Um, <clears throat> IOD's report would suggest there is little to no dust generated from the several hundred thousand acres of fields, some of them fallow. But that would be good to quantify, entering ag into the state and the air resource district's calculation of air pollution sources that may need attention. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I wanna check with um, Carrie Morrison who had, uh, you had your hand up earlier. Just wanna check with you. Thank you. Yes, I'd just like to suggest to please, if you're not speaking, mute your mic because there's a lot of feedback going through the room. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next is uh, Nathan White. Hi, good afternoon. Um, Thank you so much for the board and all the great comments that we've heard all day long. Um, wanted to um, just congratulate all of the team that's been working on this, the SSMP and, and the water board for all the continued direct kind of um, collaboration effort. Um, Patrick O'Dowd and Ryan Kelly and all the people that have been working on it so long. And a special thanks to Bruce Wilcox for all of his work. Um, we met him about nine years ago and he's been supportive from the point at which he was uh, at the IID all the way through working at the state. Um, and it's based on his pioneer and leadership that we're here today. So um, just wanted to start with that. Uh, my name is Nathan White with Ages Inc. And we've been working on some long range planning efforts as well as water importation. I just wanted to say I, I met with several of the um, you know board members um, today and over the last few months, as well as many of the stakeholders. And I just wanted to say that the urgency of the issue is, I, I would say, of utmost importance when it comes to climate change and things that are going on at the, the global level, but all the way down to our state level. This is one of those emergencies that is also an opportunity. Um, you know, it kind of goes unsaid sometimes that some of the emergencies and, and um change happens when there is an emergency. But I, I think that um, the current governorship, as well as um, what's happening with the whole um, California Natural Resources Agency has saw that and are acting accordingly. And I think there's been a lot of progress over the last um, two years with the Long Range Planning Committee, but also with the water importation. And um, I think that level of urgency, if we can get smaller projects implemented, as well as these bigger projects, and have them all kind of firing on the same pistons. That's that's the goal. Um, but I guess my comment that I'll say today is that level of urgency. I think Imperial County uh, asked for an emergency declaration. I I would say that we're at that level with uh, Lake Mead and Lake Powell. That Salton Sea could be an opportunity for uh, restoration. That can also have a positive impact when we refill the Salton Sea. Um, I wanna just kind of say that that I supported when they talked about uh, emergency declaration, but we can still do projects that are um, locally, um, I guess, um, started and locally implemented like Desert Shores Restoration. And hopefully that project gets done as well as all these other efforts. So I just wanna thank everybody for their time and the great feedback. Um, also wanted to say that 
maybe part of our environmental studies should be some regional climate modeling for real-time data uh, of possible water importation, but also non-water importation as that relates to the um, California water budget. Thanks everybody for your time. Have a great day. Thank you, Mr. White. Next is Jenny Binstock with Sierra Club. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, okay, good evening. Great, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Jenny Binstock. I work as a senior campaigner with Sierra Club National uh, on many issues around public lands and waters and wildlife, but specifically on the Salton Sea. Uh, like like uh, the speaker before me just said, really wanna commend the CNRA and state partners for meaningful advancements around the SSMP uh, over the last year. There's, there's definitely been a lot of notable progress in terms of increased staffing capacity, uh, more engagement touch points, uh, plans to catch up on acreage targets, and so many more things that we've talked about tonight. So really appreciate the state's hard work and commitment to addressing these complex challenges. But we really need to address the critical points that Dr. Lowe raised in his presentation. What are we doing to understand and mitigate for public health impacts to residents living around the sea and throughout the region? There is data available on water and air quality at the Salton Sea, but it's not comprehensive long-term, nor pulled together in a coherent strategy that can help us monitor, assess, measure, and plan for improvements in public health. And it's so critical to do this, as we all know, in a region where people are experiencing disproportionate health impacts from the sea and where we know there is inadequate, consistent public health surveillance. So with the state driving full speed ahead to catch up on acreage targets, it really should be a top and an urgent priority to ensure that the SSMP is working to meaningfully improve public health outcomes. So we, we hope that there will be clear public health strategies um, that will be better incorporated into next year's annual report. And some recommendations uh, potentially for doing this could include creating an action plan within the SSMP that centers regular epidemiological surveillance and comprehensive air and water quality monitoring um, such a plan should really support increased capacity coordination across agencies to ensure efforts are strategic and cohesive and applied across projects. There should definitely be strong transparency around public health data by working directly with communities to establish something that would resemble a public facing dashboard that communicates in a way that's relevant to local residents what the state is doing to monitor and plan for improving public health. And lastly, we just need a clear plan for addressing water quality at the sea, given the high concentration of nutrients resulting from inflows of agricultural runoff. So we hope to see that a lot of these things can be addressed in next year's report. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak. And thanks again to everyone for their hard work um, to advance the SSMP over the last year. Thank you, Ms. Binstock. Next is Jenny Ross. Hi, I am not going to comment in the interests of time to give members of the community uh, more time to do that. However, I did submit written comments and I direct the board's attention to those detailed written comments and the appended scientific I included relating to significant emissions of greenhouse gases from proposed plans as well as from the program activities that are currently ongoing and thanks very much. Thank you, Ms. Ross, and thanks for flagging that issue. Next is Carly Creeley. Hi. Hi, I'm Good Carly evening. Creeley. Um, I'm from Los Angeles. And I just wanna let you know that I'm extremely happy to find out that work on the new river to cover it through Calexico is going to begin this summer. Uh, that work is really vital for a safe, healthy and fulfilling life for the people that live and work in the area. Um, but I also urge you to find funding provided from a state and a federal level 
to get the project done and to make sure that the work in the region continues. It's all of our responsibility as state residents and as national residents, and really from an international, um, you know, there's international influence on these issues. So additionally, I'd really like to see green belts that are made along the river and usable inviting recreation areas along the Salton Sea. Um, we need to work with Mexico and find some agreements that will allow us to have cleaner water coming into the new river from the new river into the Salton Sea. And we need to secure water to maintain the habitat and reduce the dust that is going through the area. Uh, if we don't have a clear water budget, then there's no reason to assume that that's going to continue into the future and that we're going to be able to save the lives that will be saved with the work that's been started. Uh, the area has a vibrant multi-generational community. It's full of active citizens who are trying to improve the air and water quality and to make sound decisions for their lives, but they can't do that unless they have clear information available. Um, I've just completed a long-term project looking at some of the issues that are happening here, and it's really impossible to find any up-to-date data on water quality. So I'd like to see a dashboard that includes air quality, such as that provided by CCV right now, but it needs to have nutrient loads, dissolved oxygen, pesticides, metals, um, and the air quality along the waterways from the Salton Sea itself, as well as the inflows, such as the New River, the Whitewater River, the Alamo River, and the canals in the area, so that people can understand it in an easily translatable, understandable way for the general public, so that they can make appropriate decisions for their lives, and so that people in the Imperial Valley and in the rest of the state and country know what needs to be done and what we can do to make everything better. Um, it's a, you know, the Imperial Valley and the Salton Sea region are a beautiful place with vital habitat for wildlife and incredible tight knit communities that really want to help and do the right thing. But it's up to all of us statewide and nationwide. So I really urge you to find that money at all levels to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next is Chuck Parker with the Salton Sea Coalition. Thank you. Um, before I start, I, I just want to let uh, the people running the meeting know that um, Felice Nunez is here on my computer with me, so you don't see her name, but she also submitted a blue card. Um, today for my comments, I want to read um, an article that her and I wrote for the local newspaper. It's entitled, Reduce Greenhouse Gas Emissions at the Salton Sea. A recent report titled Potential Major Greenhouse Gas Emissions from Proposed Salton Sea Long-Range Plans by scientist Jenny Ross warns that many of the current proposed long-range plans to restore the Salton Sea will cause large emissions of greenhouse gases in the form of carbon dioxide and methane. Studies of drying lakes around the world have proven that these atmosphere warming gases come from large deposits of carbon-rich organic matter that were trapped and secured under deep water and are later released from the exposed dry lake bed. These unhealthy gases increase with shallow water habitats and exposed lake beds that are further disturbed by furrowing used as a dust control measure. The potential greenhouse gas emissions that will be coming from the large areas of the Salton Sea's dry exposed lake bed are immense, over 26 million metric tons of CO2 every year. This means one and a half times the emissions put out by all of California's 14 petroleum refineries or 7.2% of all of the state's CO2 emissions. And that estimate does not include methane emissions from highly saline brine sinks, such as will remain within the perimeter lake, another non-water import plan. Methane causes up to 80 times more warming than carbon dioxide. Scientific knowledge and practices must be incorporated immediate by, immediately by the Salton Sea Management Plan, the California Natural Resources Agency, and the State Water Resource Control Board. <clears throat> the projects of the SSMP 10-year plan must minimize carbon emissions. Our public health demands that greenhouse gases be evaluated by a panel of qualified scientists. If California implements plans at the Salton Sea that cause major increases in greenhouse gases, such plans will make the drought worse and put public health in greater danger from hotter temperatures and blowing dust. 
Public health requires that a long range plan be carbon neutral or carbon negative. The Salton Sea Coalition is asking Coachella Valley City Councils to continue their support of ocean water import to refill the Salton Sea. This is the long range plan most likely to restore the ecosystem, to protect public health, contribute to a vigorous regional economy and avoid ongoing releases of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. Thank you. Thank you. And then um, Feliz Nunez. Yes. yes uh, <clears throat> thank you for, for allowing me to speak. I wanted to bring up um, that in September of 2019, a group of mothers from Salton City organized to uh, approach uh, Raul Ruiz's office. And we got to speak to his representative, which was Jackie Lopez at that time. And then soon after, we also went to the region for water uh, the, uh, district to, to point out you know, what was happening to the children with nosebleed, skin irritations, uh, eye infections, and um, headaches from the stench coming from the, the sea that's losing water. And, and, and also the, uh, the plumbing in the school at Seaview Elementary, the plumbing is really bad. It's, it's always breaking down. The children cannot drink water from the faucets. I don't understand how, why that's been going on for all this time without public health interfering in this matter because it's, it's hazardous to the health of these children and all the community. The whole community is, is in need of, of, of good water and yet, uh, no one has stepped up to help these people and they're still paying for the water. Also the, the water bugs, uh, they call them boat water bugs, have, uh, they, they fill the windshields with um, you know, the, the swimming pools, anywhere there's water, they just go, go there and just fill up those, those water holes and they get on the windshields and they get in people's eyes and they're really a nuisance. Um, Costco, who's a, that's a big, uh, company refuses to put filters because they do not work. It's so, the water is so dense with uh, chemicals and, and nutrients that there's no way that filters work. The border patrol has reported clusters of cancer. They have had deaths because they work around the Alamo and New Rivers. And, and the, we also have the Calipatria prison very close to there where the guards and the, and the inmates will also be affected. Um, we have allowed up to this time the serial killing of fish and wildlife. How long are we going to stand to watch children being affected and, and chronic diseases happening and with the pandemics on top of us, uh, we, there is a great need to bring water because immediately you can take care of the air quality problem. And, and then start cleaning up the water with wastewater plants. That's what we need. Wastewater plants that will clean up the, the raw sewage that is escaping from the rivers and the, the munitions that are still underneath the, the seawater and the multitude of pesticides that are also concentrated there. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Paula Martin. Sorry, can I just oh, ask one moment? I'm sorry for the last speaker, and I don't know if you want to do this now or it's follow up. But if there are a school, if there's a school or specific community that doesn't have water, um, or if, if you can just follow up and provide information so our staff can follow up if there's um, trouble accessing drinking water in a school or um, community. Seaview Elementary School. Seaview? Yes, at Salton City. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, board member Firestone. All right, next is Paula Marvin. And Marvin does not appear to be on the platform with us. All right, then uh, Cynthia Wooten. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I am a, um, I'm on very, on various um, um, environmental groups, members of various envir environmental groups. And I wanted to thank the SSMP for developing a master form for permits in order to speed things up. 
Uh, the IID said that their lawyers have been reviewing issues before signing permits, most particularly those issues involving liabilities and responsibilities for maintaining projects in the future. Uh, many people have grown somewhat impatient and would like to know whether there would be some kind of a joint powers agreement to manage and fund the future program, uh, programs. And if so, who are the parties that would participate and how can the process be of permitting be sped up? Also on another subject, the subject of water, in May 2021, there was a binational agreement to release water from the Mexicali Dam into the Colorado River Delta. It's been successful to fill up groundwater lagoons and create habitat for residents and wildlife. In the past centuries, the limited water from the Colorado River created lagoons for old habitats. This might require California to manage water intensive crop production as the water district is starting to do in Central Valley. They're subsidizing farms to change crop choices and buying some farms as well. So um, those are the po two points I wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this evening. Next is, I think I lost track here. I'm <laughs> Jensen, Jensen Fiskin. Hello. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Um, I want to start by commending the state, all agencies, groups, and districts present today for working to catch up on proposed projects, fostering community engagement, and developing long-term goals. The momentum we have gained recently in advancing the SSMP is very impressive and is opening, opening opportunities for greater action. That being said, it is necessary to stay vigilant in this process. As you all know, the C is a timely issue, and being a young student at the local Palm Desert High School, I can tell you one of the biggest strifes we have with local and state government agencies is just the timeliness of their operations. That said, I applaud all those here today representing their respective agencies, districts, and authorities for their urgency as it, it does go a long way. One of the key aspects critical to progress at the sea that has been um, discussed today a lot is community engagement. I'm sure that more will come to care about the sea and be more involved should they be given illustrative data. With that in mind, I hope the state will work to to um, produce real data-driven public health benchmarks for, the, for their success. This enables the CNRA to show how current and future projects create real improvements in public health besides acreage goals, as previously touched on by Mr. Cohen and others. Acreage data is great, but what really catches eyes for funding and overall involvement is things like species and biomass restored. Along that same line, the state has done a great job in launching the SSMP Air Quality Monitoring Program the only problem is that this data is not available to the general public. If it was, progress achieved and future goals can be clearly demonstrated. Overall, I think a greater sense of transparency and clarity is key for members of the public, such as myself, fostering engagement. Given my role as a young high school student in Coachella Valley, the one thing I really wish to leave you with today is the general perspective of my peers. One thing that keeps us from caring about or engaging in a project is convoluted or a lack of information. Young people such as myself often get overwhelmed and discouraged when information is either lacking or choppy. With that in mind, it is worrisome that in the entire SSMP annual report, there's no mention of growing lithium industry around the sea and how the SSMP team plans to explore opportunities for the new industry to aid the sea. From a holistic perspective, lithium mining at the sea offers a shining example of environmental infrastructure benefiting multi multiple parties if done right. Michael McKibben is a UCR geochemist working with the Department of Energy and the Berkeley lab over at the sea and mapping the concentrations of lithium. He notes, we need to get students to understand they can have very lucrative careers involving green energy. This is one opportunity to do that. So given the benefits of lithium extraction, if done right, the CNRA should work with local energy companies such as the Berkshire Hathaway um, Renewables Company there to promote the safest, most environmental friendly lithium extraction. That's all I have today, thank you. I just have a question for you. Where do you attend school? Yeah, you got muted. You did a really good presentation. Good presentation. So just want to compliment uh, you and find West. out a little bit more about you and your and your of your background. Um, yeah, so I go to Palm Desert High School. I I'm originally from Orange County. I moved out here about two years ago now. And um, I learned about the sea uh, almost instantly upon moving out here. And I was just really interested about it. So I did some research and then just came up with a little comment. So that's about it. Wonderful. Well, we hope you stay engaged. Thank you for your leadership and advocacy. Yeah, thank you for all you've done too. Appreciate it. 
Thank you. All right, next is uh, Jasmine Phillips with Ecomedia Compass. My name is Jasmine Phillips. I'm a Salton Sea resident. Oops. I'm a Salton Sea resident and I'm a board member of Ecomedia Compass. It's encouraging to see progress on the ground with short-term SSMP projects. I'm pleased with the, sorry, my screen keeps cutting out on me. I'm pleased with the progression of the species conservation habitat project at the south end of the sea. Yet I worry that the project will not have a reliable supply of water or water quality like the other wetland projects at the Salton Sea currently managed by Ducks Unlimited and the US Fish and Wildlife Service that use grade A irrigation water from the Colorado River. I have reviewed the rediversion water supply agreement between Department of Water Resources and Imperial Irrigation that authorizes up to 60,000 acre feet from the New River and up to 20,000 acre feet of salt and sea water for the SCH project. The agreement does not create a water right. It does not guarantee a volume of water, flow rate, or water quality. Furthermore, the New River is contaminated with selenium and other pollutants that could jeopardize wildlife in the long term. I firmly believe it would be better to have a superior source of water to supplement and sustain the SSMP aquatic habitat projects. While I support short-term projects that are necessary to keep the ecosystem on life support, I believe ocean water importation is absolutely critical to provide a new source of life-sustaining water to restore the Salton Sea, since we know the Colorado River is oversubscribed. Projects such as the Desert Shores Channel Restoration, the North Lake and North Lake Pilot Project would all benefit from ocean water import as a supplemental water supply. It would stabilize, it would stabilize the shoreline, cover exposed lake bed, prevent harmful airborne dust and greenhouse gas emissions from the playa, help manage salinity and provide water sustainability to the Southwestern United States and Mexico. This makes a strong case for ocean water import. I want to commend the state for taking steps to review water importation proposals and strongly urge the board to ensure it is evaluated in a serious and unbiased process so it can become an asset to support the SSMP long-term goals for restoration of the Salton Sea ecosystem. I firmly believe when the sea is healthy, our communities will also thrive. Thank you for this opportunity to comment. Thank you, Ms. Phillips. Next is Carrie Morrison with Ecomedia Compass. Good evening. Good to see you all. I'm so happy that this conversation is, is ongoing. Uh, my name is Carrie Morrison. I'm the founder and executive director of the Ecomedia Compass and former West Shores mayor. Um, I'm here this week mostly focusing on an Earth Day event we're having on Saturday. Um, it's at the end of the road in Capri behind me, as you can see. And uh, this is going to be, I believe, the largest volunteer-led event for salt and sea restoration ever. We've held many over the years, and this is just topping them all. This is also Volunteer Appreciation Day. So I wanted to thank the many people that are working on this and that are here as volunteers because volunteers um, don't have financial interests in the salt and sea. Agencies and organizations getting paid contracts to do mitigation work may fight against larger scale, more comprehensive solutions that emit them from contract. So personally, I take a volunteer's opinion in special regard. I, I wanted to bring up something that echoes what Jasmine said, SCH, our biggest wetland under construction, doesn't have a defined water right. According to Tina Shields, it gets what it gets. We saw uh, Red Hill Bay fail because of challenges in finding water and land access issues and uh, a number of other reasons, but we needed to find water right if we're gonna be spending millions of dollars of taxpayer money to try to keep something alive here. Um, Mr. Newcomb said that uh, the best way to choose a project is basically the least remaining exposed playa. It's kind of one of the things he said, the most effective method. 
And I'd like to encourage us to hold in highest regard the type of long-term support that gives the water board a tool, the only tool you're tasked to work with, water, water import. Um, we see Arizona's working on potential water import from the Sea of Cortez. We see the Colorado River waning. We see Lake Powell, Lake Mead waning. We don't have enough water for future generations, not even counting the Salton Sea. So I believe that the Salton Sea is a symptom of not enough water for what we happen to be working with in the Southwest. And if we have enough water to work with, there will be no emiss of dust from the playa. We can desalinate however much we want and ease ourselves off of drought concerns in the Southwest. It gives IID a tool, another resource to work with. We don't have to worry about land rights issues because the water just comes back up and you can save years and years of negotiations. So I encourage us to support the concept that will make all of these projects better, uh, which is water import. I'll also invite you all to Earth Day. It's this Saturday from 10 to 10. We have scientific speakers, uh, community and political leaders, um, bands, art, music, food, and it's at the site of the Desert Shores Channel Restoration Project to ensure that this does not fall off the map. Uh, thank you all so much. Uh, we really appreciate the work. I'm very grateful for the organization of the CNRA and the the committees that have been organized recently, I think they're doing a really good job, but we definitely need to ramp it up. And Federal's been printing billions and billions of dollars. Why don't we ask them for some more money? Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Good to see you. Next is Tom Sefton with Eco Media Compass. All right. Thank you for all you've done. Everybody who's on this call. I'm an Imperial County resident. I work by the Salton Sea and I'm going to miss Bruce Wilcox personally, as many of you do already. A critical issue was raised today. What is the water budget for the 10 year plan projects? Beyond that, what is the water budget for Salton Sea projects in the long term? We know the Colorado River is in long-term drought, a 25% probability of shortage conditions in the next few years forecast by Bureau of Reclamation. We know the Colorado River is oversubscribed, locking in a long-term water supply under water undersupply to the whole region. Yet the Colorado River as a grain water is the only major source of water for the projects now identified by the SSMP 10-year plan. Why not? make a plan to have a new source of water for the Salton Sea and for the region more broadly. Two oceans are 120 miles away, the Pacific Ocean and the Sea of Cortez. Half a million acre feet a year from either of these sources would make up the losses to the Salton Sea resulting from the QSA. Salt removed from seawater can actually be a commercial product. We know how to do these things. Seawater can be separated from salts with the renewable energy resources right at the Salton Sea geothermal, solar. California already moves millions of acre feet of water across much of the state every year. Bringing water to where it's needed is something people know how to engineer cost effectively and sustainably. In past years, public agency officials have opposed these concepts, calling them a distraction. A distraction from what? From partial mitigation strategies with insufficient water supply to sustain them? Spurred by local public demand, an independent review panel is now reviewing several proposals to import water to restore and sustain the Salton Sea. We hope that this year, state officials will take these whole Salton Sea restorations concepts seriously. They are long-term solutions that can really solve the main problems, ecosystem damage, community economic impacts, and the public health of residents. We saw today the huge area of Salton Sea Playa likely to be exposed in Imperial County over the next 20 years. And we saw photos of the dust, of the dust blowing off some of the 28,000 acres of Playa already exposed. We heard about the health impact concerns for people exposed to Playa dust. We know that water provides 100% dust elimination, not just mitigation, elimination. A Salton Sea refilled with imported water will achieve zero emissions of playa dust. 
So dust mitigation is a partial solution. Why not take a complete solution seriously? Why not cover all the dust with imported water and sustain the ecosystem and revitalize the economy of the region? Thanks for your time. Thank you for joining us. Next is Aaron Woolley with the Sierra Club. Hello, um, can you hear me? Hopefully. Yes. Okay, excellent. Good evening, Vice Chair, members of the board. My name is Aaron Woolley and I'm a policy advocate with Sierra Club California. Thank you for the opportunity to comment today on the update of the Salton Sea Management Plan. I wanna start by saying that we really appreciate the work that the SSMP team has put in towards catching up on projects and increasing planning and efforts to reconvene community stakeholder meetings and outreach in the last year. However, we do have a few concerns um, that have I wanna to touch on today. Um, CNRA is making a commendable effort to pursue projects that if their plan is achieved will help catch up on project construction goals over the next two years. We're concerned that CNRA has not detailed or outlined specific projects for beyond 2024, which puts the SSMP at risk of falling behind schedule again. It's been really reassuring in this meeting to hear the SSMP team discuss plans to identify future projects through the NEPA process and that they expect this to be produced within the next year. We must see these details in next year's annual report to ensure that the momentum that's been achieved over the past two years is not lost. Second, we urge CNRA and the SSMP team to include in future project planning and accounting of water demands for each project and a plan to secure the water that's required. Water supply and availability is fundamental to the construction and maintenance of habitat and dust suppression projects. Without a clear water budget accounting for project demands or supply actually secured, the sustainability of these projects is really unclear. Again, we appreciate the state's acknowledgement today for the need to create a water budget, and we look forward to seeing one produced through the NEPA process within the next year and included in next year's report. Thank you so much for the opportunity to comment. Good night. Pam Eckert. Hi, my name is Pam Eckert and I'm a resident of Salton City. First, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. As a resident, I have great concern. The focus seems to be on mitigation and not restoration. My understanding is the QSA required the state of California to restore, not mitigate. These projects for the habitat and dust control are okay, but insufficient. Only about 10 to 20% of the exposed playa is being mitigated. Yesterday, we had a terrible wind sandstorm and the hay bales were ineffective. I live by the beach and it was a complete whiteout of sand. Within a year or two, these bales will be buried like the vege vegetation is now and we'll be back to square one. We, the residents, want a real, not temporary solution and that is water import. Whether it be from the Pacific or the Gulf of Mexico, we need a permanent water source. The current projects are going to need a solid water source as well. As we know, we are in a major ongoing drought. So where is the water going to come from to sustain these projects? There are proposals out there that, have, that can bring water to California and these companies have the expertise needed and can desal. And best of all, end the water shortage. This is the real fix we need and want. Many of the residents have lung issues and it's getting worse. We need to cover the playa to end the health crisis in the desert so our children have a future and clean air to breathe. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Next is Sandra Ramirez. So Vice Chair Diadamo, Ms. Ramirez is not on the uh, platform with us, but I will note quickly before we see if uh, Evan Willoff has any comments and he was an as if necessary. I will note that uh, Nelda Ruiz does have her hand up and while she had hosted the interactive, I don't know if she had her own comments. So I was going to invite her to unmute. Certainly. 
Yes, thank you. I did have a comment to share myself um, on that. I will be highlighting some of the things our community panelists did share uh, because I know it was a little difficult to hear them at times. Uh, but thank you everyone for hosting um, this meeting and for uh, all the progress that has happened out there. Um, I wanted to start off with uh, uh, stating a need for a more uh, clear engagement strategy for how the um, uh, state, how the SSMP team is incorporating community amenities and needs to projects and how you're com keeping community involved in these projects um, and in this um, in the decision making process. Um, community members are also partners in this work. They don't need to uh, belong to an agency or organization to be rightfully seen as such. Um, so I didn't realize to turn on my camera, I'll turn on my camera. Um, I also did want to highlight a um, comment that Lubita Molina had given me, um, who was not able to join us here today, unfortunately. She did share with me that she feels that Salton City is um, often um, excluded from outreach efforts. Um, she often finds, finds out late. Um, she and other community members in Salton City often find out late about um, state meetings happening, about committee meetings. And so I just want to highlight some of the suggestions given by our community panelists to do more um, uh, person to person outreach, door to door outreach, um, to keep uh, not just uh, an exultancy community members, but all um, uh, residents of the salt and sea because it's not just them that share these concerns right but to keep them updated and informed about what is happening at the salt and sea about meetings about projects um and uh lastly i did want to share as well um highlight a couple of things that have previously been mentioned uh for uh, more water and water and air quality monitoring I know the SMP team has launched an air quality monitoring and have expanded um, those monitors to the northern end of the Salton Sea. And I'm really glad to see that, but I think there needs to be more um, efforts being done for water quality monitoring and reporting on the effectiveness of, um, of projects through this data that, is, that um, is to be collected. And I wanted to lastly highlight um, the suggestion the, given by our community panelists here today um, and by um, not just community panelists, but, but by other panelists as well about the need for studies in regards to what could be in the dust, what could be in the water of the Salton Sea that leads to the public health concerns that are happening out there. Um, Elizabeth shared that, you know, her own son suffers from asthma and unexplained nosebleeds. And I know she is not the only one. I know various other community members that um, experience these, um, you know, these really awful um, illnesses. So I do want to highlight an uplift or need for studies that look into what it is that could be possibly causing um, the um, these public health concerns and whether that is done by the state or by providing a grant funding to an institution like UCR, similar to something that they're doing now. Um, it is, this is a necessity. This is a need for community members. Um, and with that, I'll um, wrap up my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Evan Wilhoff. Good evening, everyone. I don't have comments prepared. I work for the California Department of Water Resources, and I'm, I'm participating to hear all of the comments. And I'm grateful to everyone who has stuck with this um, workshop to the end. And we are grateful for all the feedback that's being shared. So thank you. Thank you for sticking with us to the end. <laughs> Appreciate you following. Next is Rob Simpson. Yes, hi. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking everyone for this great forum. And I must admit, I didn't have any comments uh, prepared prior to hearing everyone's wide diversity of views, which is a wonderful thing. I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Newcomb and actually, well, ask Mr. Newcomb about systems integration management and really highlight the work of uh, Michael Cohen in the Bay Delta up by San Francisco as how these issues can affect what we do. Um, Mr. Newcomb is looking to hire new people Right now we have two different 
parallel programs. One is the 10 year plan. One is the seawater importation plan. If you build some of the proposed 10 year plan things, they end up interfering or making the cost of importing seawater much greater. Systems integration would say that, well, you build that 10 year plan stuff that you can build today in conjunction with the ability to make that work with saltwater importation. Kind of an example of this is Mr. Uh, Cohen's work on uh, the Yolo bypass and the Yolo weir in the Bay Delta up close to San Francisco. Now, back in the day, they had a number of different plans. One was the peripheral canals, uh, the twin tunnels, the Bay Delta Conservation Program, the California Water Fix. All these are programs that never got built. Um, Mr. Cohen, dealing in the construction industry, we have an old saying, uh, he took a, a bucket of poop and turned it into a bowl of ice cream by taking floodwaters from the Sacramento, Sacramento River, spreading them out over a large delta-like area and making a better rookery for juvenile salmon, a additional pathway for salmon migration, um, as well as environment for a lot of other things. He engineered a way to do more with less. What I'm saying to Mr. Newcomb is, hey, if you're going to hire people, look for systems integration people that can reach out to all different aspects of the 10-year plan and the um, seawater importation plan and integrate them so you can do work on the first thing, get some projects in the ground, but don't interfere with the ability to import seawater. That's all I got to say. Thank you much. Mr. Newcomb, I see you've joined. Um, we're uh, about to wrap up uh, the uh, public comment, but uh, before we close out, um, we'll give you an opportunity, okay? Next is uh, Melinda Dorin. She's not on the platform, Vice Chair. Okay, then Vivian Masan Nueve. John Armstrong. Well, I guess I should wait. Is she on the platform? Okay. I just asked her to unmute herself. <laughs> One moment, Mr. Armstrong. She's not unmuting. So we could go to Mr. Armstrong. Okay. We'll go to Mr. Armstrong and then come back to. Um, Vivian or anyone else that um, missed an opportunity. Mr. Armstrong. Uh, this is John Armstrong representing yes. myself. <clears throat> um, there are some causes for optimism at the Salt and Sea Imperial Valley. I'd like to list them. This stats coming from the uh, Salt and Sea Summit a couple of weeks ago, uh, sponsored by UC Riverside. <clears throat> uh, modern lithium extraction with Ion exchange resins has 10 times less freshwater impact than traditional evaporative pond extraction as done in China and South America. Number two, geothermal lithium extraction operates mostly at the 6,000 to 9,000 foot depth, which is way below drinking water aquifers, so there seems to be no direct conflict this way. Number three, from the IIJA Investment Infrastructure Jobs Act, Build Back Better, Previous and current fiscal year CA state funding projects like SM, SSMP are very heavily funded now. Number four, although some extraction companies at Salt and Sea are producing lithium and then shipping it elsewhere to make it battery ready, as with lithium, as with Lilac Solutions or Bill Gates shipping it to Vancouver, Canada, others like ESME, I know, excuse me, ESM are making it battery ready in the U.S. at least. So there's much pressure to make lithium battery ready in the SSIV area to keep jobs local. Lastly, there's enough lithium 
at SSIV to keep the U.S. in a dominant market position for a long time. Um, all those estimates are ranging around 3 trillion metric tons of lithium. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's go back to... Um, we do have one speaker. Um, Mary Ellen had not yet had a chance to be called on, and she is on the platform with us. Or pardon me, Marianne Ruiz. Ruiz, okay. Ms. Ruiz? Yes. Hello? Hi there. Yes, this is Marianne Ruiz. I'm here. Go ahead. Yes, yes. go ahead. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, hanging in here till the end, and I appreciate the opportunity to to comment tonight. Um, some other speakers ahead of me have brought this uh, subject forward, and especially listening to um, the speaker about the problems with water in the schools. You know, for years, the communities around the Salton Sea have asked that SSMP projects invest in community infrastructure and amenities. Communities want projects that not only advance public health outcomes and restore the health of the environment, but they also want the SSMP projects to address historic areas of neglect in the region. Yeah, I'm encouraged by the growing conversations in the last year and what I've heard here on this call this evening about leveraging the SSMP projects for greater investments in communities and incorporating community input into project design process. Mm -hmm. However, we still need more specific action plans wow. to achieve community amenities if the state's gonna stay true to its commitments to environmental justice, outdoor access for all, and supporting local economies, which are all baked into our state's um, commitments. I look forward to seeing an official process led by the state for integrating community infrastructures and amenities into SSMP projects and planning. The process must support economic development, recreational opportunities, and basic infrastructure investment. The process should clearly demonstrate how community input, which has been a little bit difficult tonight uh, in a process like this, local community input should be actively incorporated into project design and planning. And I, again, want to thank you for the opportunity to speak and for the work you're all doing. Thank you. All right, lastly, Vivian Mesan Nueve. Uh, so, oh wait, yes, yes. Good afternoon, I mean, good evening now. Um, thank you so much. Uh, for this opportunity. I'd like to thank the uh, Vice Chairman of the Board and the whole Board, of course, um, for allowing us to talk about the SSMP. Um, it's, I just wanna report also on the progress. I've been on with this uh, program for about 10 years. And to tell you that the engagement is just getting better and better and allowing us also to have a, a much stronger program and listening to people today um, really reinvigorate and motivate the team to do even a better job and try to um, respond to all the, the questions and worries that everyone has. Uh, so again, I just wanted to, to thank you uh, for the opportunity and for talking about uh, the Sultan Sea tonight. Thank you for sticking with us to the end. All right, um, Mr. Newsom, Newcomb, I'm sorry, Mr. Newcomb, you had um, some additional um, comments you wanted to make? Um, I'll hold comment and just uh, say thank you to the board and I'll, and I'll follow up with uh, Mr. Simpson directly. And I also wanted to thank everybody for their feedback today. As a person that's relatively new to this program, I, I did learn a lot today. And, uh, and, and this being my first Salton Sea workshop uh, was a great experience for me and I look forward to attending next year's as well. Thank you. Great, thank you. We're glad you stayed throughout. All right, let's go back to um, our staff to see if, did you have any further clarifications or comments that you'd like to make? I don't think we do at this point. It's been very helpful uh, hearing uh, the progress of CNRA. Um, and uh, it. I've been along the ride since the order was adopted in 2017 and even before that. And it's really amazing to see how far things have come um, and really exciting to see the, the projects out there in the ground, um, but also to see you know, there's still work to do 
with the stakeholders and with the number of issues that have come up today. But we're here if you have any direction for us or anything we can answer for you. All right. Thank you. I'd like to turn to my colleagues. Anything else? No? Okay. It's been a long day. I'll, I'll go. McGuire. Yeah, I... I've really appreciated all the input today. I mean, it really, every time we have one of these workshops, it really is uh, just almost mind boggling to think about how complex this problem is, about the the challenges that everyone's facing at, at the sea uh, and just really no easy solutions. I think you look at any of these um, impacts the community members are facing from you know, air quality, you know, health related impacts, um, Challenges with uh, you know recreation and access to the facilities while all these projects are underway, uh, the monitoring and data and water quality challenges. It, it's a long list, and you know I think some of the public commenters did did a a good job of expressing the concerns about urgency, uh, about thinking about climate change, and you know making sure that we're being holistic in how we're trying to uh, best address these issues. So I, I really um, just thinking about. CNRA's uh, report and update today, I think that this year really is an inflection point and really is a key decision-making point uh, when we think about the 10-year the plan, uh, environmental assessment being completed, when we think about the, uh, the water importation study, which we heard a number of commenters reflect on today, uh, that work being completed, and then the long-range plan as well. And so, um, the fact that all these documents are going to be completed, there's going to be a lot of information coming out. And so I do think this is, um, I'm, I look forward to hearing updates from CNRA and others, um, but really thinking about those high level objectives uh, for the C, you know, what are the ultimate goals? I think really could be helpful as we move here into this next year and, and continue to implement the projects, which are accelerating. And I'm really happy to hear that as well but also having that long-term vision for, you know, where do we go from here and what are we really trying to accomplish? So that for me was a, a takeaway message and I just wanted to make sure to share that with everybody. But uh, otherwise, thank you. I really appreciate that and would like to chime in. Um, it is a um, um, an important year. And so uh, rather than wait uh, for, not this time next year, but a month before, you know, to do updated briefings. I think that um, I would appreciate another um, opportunity for a check-in. Um, also, I have some thoughts about um, the structure of these discussions because um, they can get, as we've seen, uh, rather lengthy. And I just get concerned that um, the community that uh, really wants to be engaged and they're thanking us for additional opportunities for engagement, but also continuing to express concerns. And so I'm, I would just appreciate some thoughts about how things could be maybe structured a little differently, whether it's uh, breaking it up into two days, um, is nighttime, uh, are these evening meetings the best? Is that really what the community wants? And if so, great. But uh, you know, just checking in to see if we're really um, meeting those needs, and then also maybe some targeted um, questions. And I do appreciate that um, uh, you all have put together some suggested questions. But I'm just thinking that rather than the open-ended panels, if we want to um, zero in on some of these issues in particular, for example. Um, uh, the, the not not just the dust issue and the PM10 issue, but you know these other issues that have been raised regarding contaminants and maybe more of a targeted discussion, um, so that um, it, it, it we can always receive um, written comments on general updates, but then maybe shortening the presentations, having them be more targeted to. Um, some outstanding questions that we would like to, you know, have a little bit more of a deeper dive on. Definitely, we'll take that into consideration. Next year will be a, a bigger workshop because we will be getting in that long-range plan, and then the EA should be done. So, um, we will need to plan carefully for next year because it's going to have even more content. Right, we appreciate that, and of course, want to hear your recommendations on it. I'm, I'm not proposing anything, you know, at this point, but just want to look at what would be, the, um, you know, the best way to get information out there. Right. And I just want to take this opportunity to thank you all and all the panelists, those that are still 
around and the community. Uh, it was a really good discussion. I think we all paid a, a good attention and took notes and look forward to future updates. Thank you. Yes, we're adjourned. <laughs>